Section 14 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 6. Guy Fox, Man. I'm in the crockery line, going about with a basket and changing jugs and glass and things, for clothes and that. But for the last eight years I have, every 5th of November, gone out with a guy. It's a good job for the time, for what little we lay out on the guy we don't miss, and the money comes in all of a lump at the last. While it lasts, there's money to be made by it. I used always to take the guy about for two days, but this last year I took him about for three. I was nineteen year old when I first went out with a guy. It was seeing others about with him, and being out of work at the time, and having nothing to sell. I and another chap, we knocked up one between us, and we found it go on pretty well, so we kept on at it. The first one I took out was a very first rater, for we'd got it up as well as we could to draw people's attention. I said, it ain't no good doing as the others do, we must have a tip-topper. It represented Guy Fox in black velvet. It was about nine feet high, and he was standing upright, with matches in one hand and lantern in the other. I showed this one round Clerkenwell and Islington. It was the first big un as was ever brought out. There had been paper ones as big, but ne'er a one dressed up in the style mine was. I had a donkey and cart, and we placed it against some cross rails, and some bits of wood to keep him steady. He stood firm because he had two poles up his legs and being lashed round the body, holding him firm to the posts, like a rock. We done better the first time we went out than we do lately. The guy must have cost a sovereign. He had a trunk, hose, and white legs, which we made out of a pair of white drawers, for fleshings and yellow boots, which I bought in Petticoat Lane. We took over three pounds with him, which was pretty fair, and just put us on again, for November is a bad time for most street trades, and getting a few shillings all at once makes it all right till Christmas. A pal of mine, of the name of Smith, was the first as ever brought out a big one. His wasn't a regular dressed-up one, but only with a paper apron to hang down the front, and bows and such like. He put it on a chair, and had four boys to carry it on their shoulders. He was the first, too, as introduced clowns to dance about. I see him do well, and that's why I took mine in hand. The year there was chalking no popery all about the walls, I had one dressed up in a long black garment with a red cross on his bosom. I'm sure I don't know what it meant, but they told me it would be popular. I had only one figure with nine bows, and that situated all about him. As we went along, everybody shouted out, No popery! Everybody did. He had a large brimmed hat with a low crown in, and a wax mask. I always had wax ones. I've got one at home now I've had for five year. It cost two and sixpence. It's a very good-looking face, but rather sly, with a great horsehair beard. Most of the boys make their devils, and as ugly as they can. But that wouldn't do for Christians like, as I represent mine to be. One year I had Nicholas and his adviser. That was the Emperor of Russia, in big top boots and white breeches, and a green coat on. I gave him a good bit of mustachios, a little extra. He had a Russian helmet hat on, with a pair of eagles on the top. It was one I bought. I bought it cheap, for I only gave a shilling for it. I was offered five or six for it afterwards, but I found it answer my purpose to keep. I had it dressed up this year. The other figure was a devil. I made him of green tinsel paper cut out like scale armour, and pasted on to his legs to make it stick tight. He had a devil's mask on, and I made him a pair of horns out of his head. Over them was a banner. I was told what to do to make the banner, for I had the letters writ out first, and then I cut them out of tinsel paper and stuck them on to glazed calico. On this banner was these words. What shall I do next? Why, blow your brains out. That took immensely, for the people said, That is very well. It was the time the war was on. I dare say I took between three pounds and four pounds that time. There was three of us rode in with it, so we got a few shillings apiece. The best one I ever had was the trial of Guy Fox. There was four figures, and they was drawn about in a horse and cart. There was Guy Fox, and two soldiers had hold of him, and there was the king sitting in a chair in front. 
the king was in a scarlet velvet cloak, sitting in an old armchair, papered over to make it look decent. There was green and blue paper hanging over the arms to hide the ragged parts of it. The king's cloak cost sevenpence a yard, and there was seven of these yards. He had a gilt paper crown and a long black wig made out of some rope. His trunks was black and crimson, and he had blue stockings and red boots. I made him up out of my own head, and not from pictures. It was just as I thought would be the best way to get it up out of my own head. I've seed the picture of Guy Fox because I've got the book of it at home. I never was no scholar, not in the least. The soldiers had a breastplate of white steel paper and baggy knee breeches and top boots. They had a big pipe each with a top cut out of tin. Their helmets was the same as in the pictures of steel paper and a kind of dish cover shape with a peak in front and behind. Guy was dressed the same kind as he was this year with a black velvet dress and red cloak and red boots turning over at top with lace sewed on. I never made any of the figures frightful. I get em as near as I can to the lifelike. I reckon that show was the best as I ever had about. I done very well with it. They said it was a very good sight and well got up. I dare say it cost me, with one thing and another, pretty nigh four pounds to get up. There was two of us to shove, me and my brother. I know I had a sovereign to myself when it was over, besides a little bit of merrymaking. This year I had the apprehension of Guy Fox by Lord Suffolk and Monteagle. I followed up the history as close as I can. Next year I shall have him being burnt with a lot of faggots and things about him. This year the figures cost about three pounds getting up. Fox was dressed in his old costume of black velvet and red boots. I bought some black velvet breeches in Petticoat Lane and I gave one shilling ninepence for the two pair. They was old theatrical breeches. Their lordships was dressed in gold scale armour like, of cut out paper pasted on, and their legs imitated steel. They had three corner cocked hats with white feathers in. I always buy fierce looking masks with frowns, but one of them this year was a smiling, Lord Monteagle I think. I took the figures as near as I can form from a picture I saw of Guy Fox being apprehended. I placed them figures in a horse and cart and piled them up on apple chests to the level of the cart so they showed all, their feet and all. I bind the chests with a piece of table cover cloth. The first day we went out we took two pounds seven shillings, and the second we took one pound seventeen shillings, and the last day we took two pounds one shilling. We did so well the third day because we went into the country, about Tottenham and Edmonton. They never witnessed such a thing down them parts. The drummer what I had with me was a blind man, and well known down there. They call him Friday because he goes there every Friday. So what they usually gave him, we had. Our horse was blind, so he was obliged to have one to lead him in front and another to lead the blind drummer behind. We paid the drummer 16 shillings for the three days. We paid for two days 10 shillings. And the third one, most of it came in. And we all went shares. It was a pony more than a horse. I think we got about a pound a piece clear when we was done on the Friday night. It took me six weeks getting up in my leisure time. There was the Russian bear in front. He wore a monkey dress, the same as in the pantomimes, and that did just as well for a bear. I painted his face as near as I could get it to make it look frightful. When I'm building up a guy, we first get some bags and things and cut them to the shape of the legs and things and then sew it up. We sew the body and arms and all round together in one. We put two poles down for the legs and then a cross piece at the belly and another cross piece at the shoulder and that holds them firm. We fill the legs with sawdust and stuff it down with our hands to make it tight. It takes two sacks of sawdust for three figures but I generally have it give to me for I know a young feller as works at the wood chopping. We stand them up in the room against the wall while we are dressing them. We have lots of chaps come to see us working at the guys. Some will sit there for many hours looking at us. We stuff the body with shavings and paper and any sort of rubbish. I sew whatever is wanted myself, and in fact my fingers is sore now with the thimble, for I don't know how to use a thimble, and I feel awkward with it. I design everything and cut out all the clothes and the painting and all. They allow me five shillings for the building. This last group took me six weeks. Not constant, you know, but only lazy time of a night. 
I lost one or two days over it, that's all. I think there was more Guy Foxes out this year than ever was out before. There was one had Guy Fox and Punch and a Clown in a cart, and another was Miss Nightingale and two soldiers. It was meant to be complimentary to that lady, but for myself I think it insulting to bring out a lady like that as a guy, when she's done good to all. They always reckon me to be about the first hand in London at building a guy. I never see none like them, nor no one else, I don't think. It took us two choir of gold paper and one choir of silver paper to do the armour and the banner and other things. The gold paper is sixpence a sheet and the silver is a penny a sheet. It wouldn't look so noble if we didn't use the gold paper. This year we had three clowns with us and we paid them three shillings a day each. I was dressed up as a clown too. We had to dance about and joke and say what we thought would be funny to the people. I had a child in my arms made of a doll stuffed with shavings and made to represent a little boy. It was just to make a laugh. Everyone I went up to, I told the doll to ask their uncle or their aunt for a copper. I had another move, too, of calling for Bill Bowers in the crowd, and if I got into any row or anything, I used to call to him to protect me. We had no time to say much, for we kept on moving, and it loses time to talk. We took the guy round Goswell Road and Pentonville the first day, and on the second we was round Bethnal Greenway, among the weavers. We went that way for safety the second day, for the police won't interrupt you there. The private houses give the most. They very seldom give more than a penny. I don't suppose we got more than three shillings or four shillings in silver all the three days. Sometimes we have rough work with the Irish going about with guys. The no popery year there was several rows. I was up at Islington Gate there in the lower road, and there's loads of Irish live up there, and a rough lot they are. They came out with sticks and bricks, and cut after us. We bolted with the guy. If our guy hadn't been very firm, it would have been jolted to bits. We always nailed straps round the feet, and supported on rails at the waist, and lashed to the sides. We bolted from this Irish mob over Islington Green and down John Street into Clerkenwell. My mate got a nick with a stone just on the head. It just gave him a slight hurt and drawed the blood from him. We jumped up in the donkey cart and drove off. There was one guy was pulled out of the cart this year down by Old Gravel Lane in Ratcliffe Highway. They pulled Miss Nightingale out of the cart and ran away with her and regular destroyed the two soldiers that was on each side of her. Sometimes the cabmen lash at the guys with their whips. We never say anything to them for fear we might get stopped by the police for making a row. You stand a chance of having a feather knocked off or such like as is attached to them. There's a lot of boys goes about on the 5th with sticks and make a regular business of knocking guys to pieces. They're called guy smashers. They don't come to us, we're too strong for that, but they only manage the little ones as they can take advantage of. They do this, some of them, to take the money the boys have collected. I have had regular prigs following my show to pick the pockets of those looking on, but as sure as I see them, I start them off by putting a policeman onto them. When we're showing, I don't take no trouble to invent new rhymes, but stick to the old poetry. There's some do new songs. I usually sing out, Gentlefolks, pray, remember this day, tis with kind notice we bring, the figure of sly and villainous guy who wanted to murder the king. By powder and store he bitterly swore, as he skulked on the walls to repair, the parliament too, by him and his crew, should all be blowed up in the air. But James, very wise, did the papists surprise as they plotted the cruelty great. They know their intent, so Suffolk he sent to save both kingdom and state. Guy Fox he was found with a lantern underground, and soon was the traitor bound fast. And they swore he should die, so they hung him up high and burnt him to ashes at last. So we once a year come round without fear to keep up remembrance of this day, while assistance from you may bring a review of Guy Fox a blazing away. So hollow boys, hollow boys, shout and huzzah. So hollow boys, hollow boys, keep up this day. So hollow boys, hollow boys, and make the bells ring. Down with the Pope, and God save the Queen. It used to be King, but we say Queen now, and though it don't rhyme, it's more correct. It's very seldom that the police say anything to us, so long as we don't stop too long in the gangway, not to create any mob. They join in the fun and laugh like the rest. Wherever we go, there is a great crowd from morning to night. We have dinner on Guy Fawkes' days between one and two. 
we go to any place where it's convenient for us to stop at, generally at some public house. We go inside and leave some of the lads to look after the guy outside. We always keep near the window where we can look out into the street, and we keep ourselves ready to pop out in a minute if anybody should attack the guy. We generally go into some byway where there ain't much traffic. We never was interrupted much whilst we was at dinner, only by boys chucking stones and flinging things at it, and they run off as soon as we come out. There's one party that goes out with a guy that sells it afterwards. They stop in London for the first two days, and then they work their way into the country as far as Sheerness, and then they sell the guy to form part of the procession on Lord Mayor's Day. It's the watermen and ferrymen mostly buy it, and they carry it about in a kind of merriment among themselves, and at night they burn it and let off fireworks. They don't make no charge for coming to see it burnt, but it's open to the air and free to the public. None of the good guys taken about on the 5th are burnt at night, unless some gentlemen buy them. I used to sell mine at one time to the Albert Saloon. Sometimes they'd give me 15 shillings for it, and sometimes less, according to what kind of a one I had. Three years, I think, I sold it to them. They used to burn it at first in the gardens at the back, but after they found the gardens full very well without it, so they wouldn't have any more. I always take the sawdust and shavings out of my guise and save the clothes for another year. The clothes are left in my possession to be taken care of. I make a kind of private bonfire in our yard with the sawdust and shavings, and the neighbours come there and have a kind of a spree, and shove one another into the fire and kick it about the yard and one thing and another. When I am building the guy, I begin about six weeks before 5th of November comes, and then we subscribe a shilling or two each, and buy such things as we want. Then, when we want more, I goes to my pals who live close by, and we subscribe another shilling or sixpence each, according to how we gets on in the day. Nearly all those that take out guys are mostly street traders. The heaviest expense for any guy I've built was four pounds for one of four figures. Guy Fox, Boy I always go out with a Guy Fox every year. I'm 17 years old and I've been out with a guy ever since I can remember, except last year. I didn't then because I was in Middlesex Hospital with an abscess brought on by the rheumatic fever. I was in the hospital a month. My father was an undertaker. He's been dead four months. Mother carries on the trade. He didn't like my going out with guys, but I always would. He didn't like it at all. He used to say it was a disgrace. Mother didn't much fancy my doing it this year. When I was a very little un, I was carried about for a guy. I couldn't have been more than seven years old when I first begun. They put paper hangings round my legs. They got it from Baldwin's in the Tottenham Court Road. Sometimes they bought and sometimes got it give them, but they give a rare lot for a penny or tuppence. After that, they put me on an apron made of the same sort of paper, showy, you know. Then they put a lot of tinsel bows, and at the corners they cut a sort of tail like there is to farrier's aprons, and it looks stunning. Then they put on my chest a tinsel heart and rosettes. They was green and red because it shows off. All up my arms I had bows and things to make a show off. Then I put on a black mask with a little red on the cheek to make me look like a devil. It had horns too. Always pick out a devil's mask with horns. It looks fine and frightens the people almost. The boy that dressed me was a very clever chap and made a guy to rights. Why, he made me a little guy about a foot high to carry in my lap. It was piecings of quilting like, a sort of patchwork all sewn together. And then he filled it with sawdust and made a head of shavings. He picked the shavings small and then sewed them up in a little bag. And then he painted a face and it looked very well. And he made it a little tinsel bobtail coat and a tinsel cap with two feathers on the top. It was made to sit in a chair, and there was a piece of string tied to each of the legs and the arms, and a string come behind, and I used to pull it, and the legs and arms jumped up. I was put in a chair, and two old broom handles was put through the rails, and then a boy got in front, and another behind, and carried me off round Holborn Way in the streets and squares. Every now and then they put me down before a window. Then one of them used to say the speech, and I used all the time to keep pulling the string of my little guy. And it amused the children at the windows. 
After they'd said the speech, we all shouted, Hooray! And then some of them went and knocked at the door and asked, Please to remember the guy. And the little children brought us halfpence and pence. And sometimes the ladies and gentlemen chucked us some money out of the window. At last they carried me into Russell Square. They put me down before a gentleman's house and began saying the speech. While they was saying it, up comes a lot of boys with sticks in their hands. One of our chaps knowed what they was after and took the little guy out of my hand and went on saying the speech. I kept all on sitting still. After a bit, one of these here boys says, Oh, it's a dead guy. Let's have a lark with it. But then one of them gives me a punch in the eye with his fist and then snatched the mask off my face. And when he'd pulled it off, he says, Oh, Bill, it's a live un. We was afraid we should get the worst of it, so we run away round the square. The biggest one of our lot carried the chair. After we'd run a little way, they caught us again and says, Now then, give us all your money. With that, some ladies and gentlemen that see it all came up to them and says, If you don't go, we'll lock you up. And so they let us go away. And so we went to another place where they sold masks and we bought another. Then they asked me to be the guy again, but I wouldn't, for I got a black eye through it already. So they got another to finish out the day. When we got home at night, we shared two shillings apiece. There was five of us all together, but I think they chiselled me. I know they got a deal more than that, for they'd had a good many sixpences and shillings. People usen't to think much of a shilling that time of day, because there wasn't any but little guys about then. But I don't know but what the people now encourage little guys most, because they say that the chaps with the big ones ought to go to work. Next year, I was out with the stuffed guy. They wanted me to be guy again, because I wasn't frightened easy, and I was lightish. But I told them, no, I've had enough of being guy. I don't be guy any more. Besides, I had such fine money for getting a whack in the eye. We got on pretty well that year, but it gets worse and worse every year. We got hardly anything this year, and next I don't suppose we shall get anything at all. These chaps that go about pitching into guys, we call guy smashers. But they don't do it only for the lark of smashing the guys. They do it for the purpose of taking the boys' money away, and sometimes the clothes. If one of them has a hole in his boots and he sees a guy with a good pair on, he pretty soon pulls them off the guy and tooks it off with him. After I'd been out with guys for three or four years, I got big enough to go to work, and I used to go along with my brother and help him at a coal shed, carrying out coals. I was there ten months, and then one night, a bitter cold night, it was freezing hard, we had a naphtha lamp to light in the shop, and as me and my brother was doing it, either a piece of the match dropped in, or else he poured it over, I can't say which, but all at once it exploded, and blowed me across the road, and knocked him in the shop, all afire. And I was all afire too. See how it's burnt my face, and the hand I held the lucifer in? A woman ran out of the next shop with some wet sacks, and throwed them upon me, but it flared up higher then. Water don't put it out, unless it's a mass of water like an engine. Then a milkman ran up, and pulled off his cape, and throwed it over me, and that put it out. Then he set me up, and I run home, though I don't know how I got there, and for two days after I didn't know anybody. Another man ran into the shop and pulled out my brother, and we was both taken to the university hospital. Two or three people touched me, and the skin came off on their hands, and at nine o'clock the next morning my brother died. When they took me to the hospital, they had no bed for me, and so they sent me home again, and I was seven months before I got well but I've never been to say well since, and I shall never be fit for hard work any more. The next year I went out with a guy again, and I got on pretty well, and so I've done every year since, except last. I've had several little places since I got burnt, but they haven't lasted long. This year I made a stunning guy. First of all, I got a pair of my own breeches, blackens, and stuffed them full of shavings. I tied the bottoms with a bit of string. Then I got a black coat that belonged to another boy and sewed it all round to the trousers. Then we filled that with shavings and give him a good corporation. Then we got a block, such as the milliners have, and shoved that right in the neck of the coat and then we shoved some more shavings all round to make it stick in tight. 
and when that was done, it looked just like a dead man. I know something about dead men, because my father was always in that line. Then we got some horse hair and some glue, and plastered the head all round with glue, and stuck the horse hair on to imitate the hair of a man. Then we put the mask on. It was a tuppenny one. They're a great deal cheaper than they used to be. You can get a very good one now for a penny. It had a great big nose, and it had two red horns, black eyebrows, and red cheeks. I like devils. They're so ugly. I bought a good-looking un two or three years ago, and we didn't get hardly anything. The people said, Ah, it's too good-looking. It don't frighten us at all. Well then, after we put on his mask, we got two gloves. One was a woolen un, and the other a kitten and stuffed them full of shavings, and tied them down to the chair. We didn't have no lantern, cause it keeps on falling out of his hands. After that we put on an old pair of lace-up boots. We tied them on to the legs of the breeches. The feet mostly twists round, but we stopped that. We shoved a stick up the leg of his breeches, and the other end into the boot, and tied it, and then it couldn't twist round very easy. After that we put a paper hanging cap on his head. It was silk velvet kind of paper, and decorated all over with tinsel bows. His coat we pasted all over with blue and green tinsel bows and pictures. They was painted theatrical characters, what we buy at the shop, a halfpenny a sheet plain, and penny a sheet coloured. We bought them plain and coloured them ourselves. Atop of his hat we put a hornament. We got some red paper and cut it into narrow strips, and curled it with the blade of the scissors, and stuck it on like a feather. We made him a fine apron of hanging paper, and cut that in slips up to his knees, and curled it with the scissors, the same as his feather, and decorated it with stars and bows and things, made out of paper, all manner of colours, and pieces of tinsel. After we'd finished the guy, we made ourselves cocked hats, all alike, and then we tied him in a chair, and wrote on his breast, Villainous Guy. Then we put two broomsticks under the chair, and carried him out. There was four of us, and the two that wasn't carrying, they had a long bough of a tree each, with a knob at the end, to protect the guy. We started off at once, and got into the squares, and put him in front of the gentlemen's houses, and said this speech. Pray, gentlefolks, pray, remember this day, at which kind notice we bring. This figure of sly, old villainous guy, he wanted to murder the king. With powder in store, he bitterly swore, by him in the vaults to compare. By him and his crew, and Parliament too, should all be blowed up in the air. So please to remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I see no reason why gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. So hello boys, hello boys, shout out the day. Hello boys, hello boys, hello, hooray! After we'd finished our speech in one of the squares, and hollowed hooray, the beetle come out and said he'd give us the stick about our backs, and the guy too, if we didn't go away. So we went away, and got into Russell Square and Bedford Square, but there was such a lot of small guys out, that we did worse than ever we'd done before. When we was in Southampton Street, Holborn, I finished the speech with, Down with the Pope, and God save the Queen. So four shoe-black boys come up and says, says they, What do you say, Down with the Pope, and God save the Queen, for? And I says, I didn't mean no harm of it. With that, they makes use of some bad language, and told me they'd smash my head, and the guys too. And they was going to do it, when up comes a boy that I knew. And I says to him, they're going to knock me about. So he says, no they won't. So then the boys made their reply, and said they would. So I told them they was very fast about fighting. I'd fight one of them. So with that, they all got ready to pitch upon me. But when they see this other boy stuck to me, they went off, and never struck a blow. When we got home, I opened the money box and shared the money. One had five pence, and two had four pence halfpenny each, and I had seven pence, because I said the speech. At night we pulled him all to pieces, and burnt his stuffing, and let off some squibs and crackers. I always used to spend the money I got, gying, on myself. I used to buy sometimes fowls, because I could sell the eggs. There is some boys that takes out guys as do it for the sake of getting a bit of bread and butter, but not many as I knows of. It don't cost much to make a guy. The clothes we never burns, they're generally too good. They're our own clothes, what we wears at other times. 
and when people burn a guy, they always pull off any of the things that's of use first. But mostly the guy gets pulled all to pieces, and only the shavings get burnt. End of section 14 Section 15 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 7. An Old Street Showman. A short, thick-set man, with small, puckered-up eyes, and dressed in an old brown velveteen shooting jacket, gave me an account of some bygone exhibitions of the Galantee show. "'My father was a soldier,' he said, "'and was away in foreign parts, "'and I and a sister lived with my mother "'in St. Martin's workhouse. "'I was fifty-five last New Year's Day. "'My uncle, a bootmaker in St. Martin's Lane, "'took my mother out of the workhouse "'that she might do a little washing "'and pick up a living for herself.' and we children went to live with my grandfather, a tailor. After his death, and after many changes, we had a lodging in the Dials, and there, blank, the sweep, coaxed me with pudding one day, and encouraged me so well that I didn't like to go back to my mother, and at last I was prenticed to him from Hatton Garden on a month's trial, and I liked chimney sweeping for that month. But it was quite different when I was regularly indentured, I was cruelly treated then, and poorly fed, and had to turn out barefooted between three and four many a morning in frost and snow. In first climbing the chimneys, a man stood beneath me and pushed me up, telling me how to use my elbows and knees, and if I slipped, he was beneath me and catched me and shoved me up again. The skin came off my knees and elbows. Here's the marks now, you see. I suffered a great deal, as well as Dan Duff, a fellow sweep, a boy that died. I've been to Mrs. Montague's dinner in the square on the 1st of May when I was a boy sweep. It was a dinner in honour of her son having been stolen away by a sweep. Note the man's own words. End note. I suppose there were more than 300 of us sweeps there in a large green at the back of her house. I run away from my master once but was carried back and was rather better used. My master then got me knee and ankle pads and bathed my limbs in salt and water and I managed to drag on seven sorrowful years with him. I was glad to be my own man at last, and I cut the sweep trade, bought Pandean pipes, and started with an organ man as his mate. I saved money with the organ man, and then bought a drum. He gave me five shillings a week, and my whittles and drink, washing and lodging. But there wasn't so much music afloat then. I left the music man and went out with Michael, the Italy bear, Michael was the man's name that brought over the bear from somewhere abroad. He was a Italy man, and he used to beat the bear and manage her. They called her Jenny, but Michael was not to say roughish to her, unless she was obstreperous. If she were, he showed her the large mop stick and beat her with it, hard sometimes, especially when she wouldn't let the monkey get a top on her head, for that was a part of the performance. The monkey was dressed the same as a soldier, but the bear had no dress but her muzzle and chain. The monkey, a clever fellow he was, and could jump over sticks like a Christian, was called Billy. He jumped up and down the bear too, and on his master's shoulders, where he sat as Michael walked up and down the streets. The bear had been taught to roll and tumble. She rolled right over her head, all round a stick, and then she danced round about it. She did it at the word of command. Michael said to her, Round and round again. We fed her on bread, a quartern loaf every night after her work, in half a pail of water, the same every morning, never any meat, nothing but bread, boiled potatoes, or raw carrots. Meat would have made her savage. The monkey was fed upon nuts, apples, gingerbread, or anything. Besides them, we had two dancing dogs. The bear didn't like them, and they were kept on one side in performing. The dogs jumped through hoops and danced on their hind legs. They're easyish enough trained. Sometimes the butchers set bulldogs, two or three at a time, at Jenny, and Michael and me had to beat them off, as well as the two other men that we had with us. Those two men collected the money, and I played the pipes and drum, and Michael minded the bear and the dogs and monkey. 
In London we did very well. The West End was the best. Whitechapel was crowded for us, but only with halfpence. I don't know what Michael made, but I had seven shillings a week with my whittles and lodging. Michael done well. We generally had twenty to thirty shillings every night in halfpence, and used to give twenty-one shillings of it for a one-pound note, for they was in then. When we've travelled in the country, we've sometimes had trouble to get lodgings for the bear. We've had to sleep in outhouses with her, and have sometimes frightened people that didn't know as we was there, but nothing serious. Bears is well behaved enough, if they ain't aggravated. Perhaps no one but me is left in England now what properly understands a dancing bear. Jenny wasn't ever baited, but offers was made for it by sporting characters. The country was better than London, when the weather allowed, but in Gloucester, Cheltenham, and a good many places, we weren't let in the high streets. The gentlefolk in the balconies, both in town and country, where they had a good sight, were our best friends. It's more than thirty years ago, yes, a good bit more now. At Chester races one year, we were all taken and put into prison. Bear and dogs and musicianer and all, everyone because we played a day after the races. That was Saturday. We were all in quad until Monday morning. I don't know how the authorities fed the bear. We were each in a separate cell, and I had bread and cheese and gruel. On Monday morning we were discharged, and the bear was shot by the magistrate's orders. They wanted to hang poor Jenny at first, but she was shot and sold to the hairdressers. I couldn't stay to see her shot, and had to go into an alehouse on the road. I don't know what her carcass sold for. It wasn't very fat. Michael and me then parted at Chester, and he went home rich to Italy, taking his monkey and dogs with him, I believe. He lived very careful, chiefly on rice and cabbage, and a very little meat with it, which he called Manesta. He was a very old man. I had Manesta sometimes, but I didn't like it much. I drummed and piped my way from Chester to London, and there took up with another foreigner named Green, in the clockwork figure line. The figures were a Turk called Bluebeard, a sailor, a lady called Lady Katerina, and Neptune's car, which we called Nelson's car as well, but it was Neptune's car by rights. The figures danced on a table when taken out of a box. Each had its own dance when wound up. First came my Lady Katerina. She and the others of them were full two feet high. She had a cork body and a very handsome silk dress, or muslin, according to the fashion or the season, black in Lent, according to what the nobility wore. Lady Katerina, when wound up, danced a reel for seven minutes, the sailor a hornpipe, and Bluebeard shook his head, rolled his eyes, and moved his sword, just as natural as life. Neptune's car went either straight or round the table, as it was set. We often showed our performances in the houses of the nobility, and would get ten or twelve shillings at a good house, when there were children. I had a third share, and in town and country we cleared fifty shillings a week, at least, every week, among the three of us, after all our keep and expenses were paid. At Doncaster races we have taken three pounds in a day, and four pounds at Lincoln races. Country in summer is better than town. There's now no such exhibition, barring the one I have, but that's pledged. It cost £20 at Mr. Blank's for the four figures without dress. I saved money, which went in an illness of rheumatic gout. There's no bears at all allowed now. Times are changed, and all for the worser. I stuck to the clockwork concern 16 years and knows all parts of the country, Ireland, Scotland, Guernsey, Jersey, and the Isle of Wight. A month before Christmas, we used to put the figures by, for the weather didn't suit, and then we went with a guarantee show of a magic lantern. We showed it on a white sheet, or on the ceiling, big or little, in the houses of the gentlefolk, and the schools where there was a breaking up. It was shown by way of a treat to the scholars. There was Harlequin and Billy Button and such like. We had ten and sixpence and fifteen shillings for each performance and did very well indeed. I have that guarantee show now, but it brings in very little. Green's dead and all in the line's dead but me. The guarantee show don't answer because magic lanterns are so cheap in the shops. When we started, magic lanterns wasn't so common. 
but we can't keep hold of a good thing in these times. It was a regular thing for Christmas once, the guarantee shows. I can make, in a holiday time, twenty shillings a week, but that's only at holiday times, and is just a mere casualty a few times a year. I do other jobs when I can get em. At other times I delivers bills, carries boards, and helps at funerals. The Chinese Shades The proper name of my exhibition, said a showman of this class to me, is Les Hombres, or The Shades. That's the proper name for it, for Baron Rothschild told me so when I performed before him. We calls it the Chinese Galantee Show. It was invented over there with the Chinese, and some travellers went over there and see them doing it, and they come over here and tell us about it. They didn't do it as we do, you know. As for doing pieces, we lick them out of the field. Them only did the shadows. We do a piece with them. I should say, sir, let me calculate. It is about twenty-six years since the hombres first came out. Reduce it if you like, but that's the time. Thomas Paris was the first as come out with them. Then Jim Macklin and Paul Herring, the celebrated clown, and the best showman of punch in the world for pantomime tricks. Comic business, you know, but not for showing in a gentleman's house, was the next that ever came out in the streets with the Chinese guarantee show. I think it was his own ingenuity that first gave him the notion. It was thoughts of mind, you know. You form the opinion in your own mind, you know, by taking it from the Chinese. They met a friend of theirs who had come from China, and he told them of the shadows. One word is as good as fifty, if it's a little grammatical. Sound judgment. When it first come out, he began with the scene called Mr. Jobson the Cobbler, and that scene has continued to be popular to the present day, and the best scene out. He did it just equally the same as they do it now, in a punch and judy frame, with a piece of calico stretched in front, and a light behind, to throw the shadows on the sheet. Paul Herring did excellent with it, nothing less than thirty shillings or two pounds a night. He didn't stop long at it, because he is a stage clown, and had other business to attend to. I saw him the first time he performed. It was in the Waterloo Road, and the next night I were out with one of my own. I only require to see a thing once to be able to do it. But you must have ingenuity, or it's no use what's on diver. Every one who had a punch and judy frame took to it, doing the regular business in the day and at night turning to the shadows. In less than a week there were two others out, and then Paul Herring cut it. He only done it for a lark. He was hard up for money and got it. I was the first that ever had a regular piece acted in his show. I believe there's nobody else as did, but only them that's copied me. They come and follow me, you understand, and copied me. I am the author of Cobbler Jobson and Kitty Biling the Pot, or The Woodchopper's Frolic. There's Billy Button's journey to Brentford on horseback, and his favourite servant, Jeremiah Stitchum, in want of a situation. I'm the author of that, too. It's adapted from the equestrian piece brought out at Astley's. I don't know who composed The Broken Bridge. It's too far gone by to trace who the first author is. But it was adapted from the piece brought out formerly at Drury Lane Theatre. Old ancient gentleman has told me so who saw it when it was first brought out, and they're old enough to be my grandfather. I've new revised it. We in general goes out about seven o'clock, because we gets away from the noisy children. They place them to bed, and we gets respectable audiences. We choose our places for pitching. Leicester Square is a very good place, and so is Islington, but Regent Street is about the principal. There's only two of us about now, for it's dying away. When I've a mind to show, I can show, and no mistake, for I'm better now than I was twenty years ago. Kitty Biling the Pot, or the Woodchopper's Frolic, is this. The shadow of the fireplace is seen with the fire alight, and the smoke is made to go up by mechanism. The woodchopper comes in very hungry and wants his supper. 
He calls his wife to ask if the leg of mutton is done. He speaks in a gruff voice. He says, My wife is very lazy, and I don't think my supper's done. I've been chopping wood all the days of my life, and I want a bullock's head and a sack of potatoes. The wife comes to him and speaks in a squeaking voice, and she tells him to go and chop some more wood, and in half an hour it will be ready. Excellent. Then the wife calls the daughter Kitty and tells her to see that the pot don't boil over, and above all, to be sure and see that the cat don't steal the mutton out of the pot. Kitty says, Yes, mother, I'll take particular care that the mutton don't steal the cat out of the pot. Cross questions, you see. Comic business. Then mother says, Kitty, bring up the broom and sweep up the room. And Kitty replies, Yes, mummy, I'll bring up the room to sweep up the broom. Excellent again. It's a regular stage business and cross questions. She brings up the broom and the cat's introduced whilst she is sweeping. The cat goes, meow, 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 and Kitty gives it a crack with the broom. Then Kitty gets the bellows and blows up the fire. It's a beautiful representation, for you see her working the bellows, and the fire get up, and the sparks fly up the chimney. She says, if I don't make haste, the mutton will be sure to steal the cat out of the pot. She blows the fire right out and says, Why, the fire's blowed the bellows out, but I don't mind. I shall go and play at shuttlecock. Childlike, you see. Then the cat comes in again and says, Meow, meow, and then gets up and steals the mutton. You see her drag it out by the claw, and she burns herself and goes, Spit, spit. Then the mother comes in and sees the fire out and says, Where's my daughter? Here's the fire out and my husband's coming home, and there isn't a bit of mutton to eat. She calls, Kitty, Kitty, and when she comes, asks where she's been. I've been playing at shuttlecock. The mother asks, Are you sure the cat hasn't stolen the mutton? Oh, no, no, mother, and excellent again. Then the mother goes to the pot. She's represented with a squint, so she has one eye up the chimney and another in the pot. She calls out, Where's the mutton? It must be down at the bottom, or it has boiled away. Then the child comes in and says, Oh, mother, mother, here's a great he-she tomcat, been and gone off with the mutton. Then the mother falls down and calls out, I shall faint, I shall faint. Oh, bring me a pail of gin. Then she revives and goes and looks in the pot again. It's regular stage business and if it was only done on a large scale, would be wonderful. Then comes the correction scene. Kitty comes to her, and her mother says, Where have you been? And Kitty says, Playing at shuttlecock, mummy. And then the mother says, I'll give you some shuttlecock with the gridiron, and excellent, and comes back with the gridiron. And then you see her with the child on her knee, correcting of her. Then the woodchopper comes in and wants his supper, after chopping wood all the days of his life. Where's supper? Oh, a nasty big he-she tomcat has been and stole the mutton out of the pot. What? Passionate directly, you see. Then she says, You must put up with bread and cheese. He answers, That don't suit some people. And then comes a fight. Then spring Jack is introduced, and he carries off the fireplace and pot and all. Excellent. That's the end of the piece, and a very good one it was. I took it from Paris and improved on it. Paris had no workable figures. It was very inferior. He had no fire. It's a dangerous concern, the fire is, for it's done with a little bit of the snuff of a candle, and if you don't mind, you go alight. It's a beautiful performance. Our exhibition generally begins with a sailor doing a hornpipe, and then the tightrope dancing, and after that the Scotch hornpipe dancing. The little figures regularly move their legs as if dancing, the same as on the stage, only it's more cleverer, for they're made to do it by ingenuity. Then comes the piece called Cobbler Jobson. We call it The Laughable, Comic and Interesting Scene of Old Father Jobson, the London Cobbler. 
or the old lady disappointed of her slipper. I am in front doing the speaking and playing the music on the Pandanian pipe. That's the real word for the pipe from the Romans when they first invaded England. That's the first music ever introduced into England when the Romans first invaded it. I have to do the dialogue in four different voices. There is the child, the woman, the countryman, and myself. And there's not many as can do it besides me and another. The piece called Cobbler Jobson is this. It opens with the shadow of a cottage on one side of the sheet and a cobbler's stall on the other. There are boots and shoes hanging up in the windows of the cobbler's stall. Cobbler Jobson is supposed at work inside and heard singing. An old cobbler I am, and live in my stall. It serves me for our house, parlour, kitchen, and all. No coin in my pocket, no care in my pate. I sit down at my ease and get drunk when I please. Hi down, hi dairy down. Then he sings again. Last night I took a wife, and when I first did woo her, I vowed I'd stick through life like cobbler's wax unto her. Hi down, dairy down, down, down. Then the figure of a little girl comes in and raps at the door. Mr. Jobson, is my mamma's slipper done? No, miss, it's not done, but if you'll call in half an hour, it shall be well done for I've taken the soles off and put the upper leathers in a pail to soak. What? In a pail? Yes, my dear, without fail. Then you won't disappoint. No, my dear, I'd sooner a pot than a pint. Then I may depend? Yes, and you won't have it. He says this aside, so the girl don't hear him. Then Jobson begins to sing again. He comes in front and works. You see his lapstone and the hammer going. He begins to sing. To the morning for breakfast, a bacon and spinach. Says I to my wife, I'm going to Greenwich. Says she, Dicky Hall, then I'll go too. Says I, Mrs Hall, I'll be dished if you do. I down, I dirty down. Then the little girl comes in again to know if the slipper is done. And as it isn't, it's, my dear, you must go without it. Then she gets impertinent and says, I shan't go with it. You nasty old waxy, 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 waxy. Oh, you nasty old ball of bristles and bunch of wax. Then he tries to hit her and she runs into the house. And as soon as he's at work, she comes out again. Ah, you nasty cobbler. Who's got a lump of wax on his breeches? Who sold his wife's shirt to buy a haperth of gin? Then the cobbler is regularly vexed, and he tries to coax her into the stall to larrup her. Here, my dear, here's a lump of puddin and a farden. Oh yes, you nasty old cobbler, you only want to give me a lump of puddin on my back. Here's a penny, my dear, if you'll fetch it. Chuck it here and I'll fetch it. At last she goes into the stall, and she gets a hiding with the hammer. She cries out, you nasty old cobbler, waxy, waxy, waxy. I'll go and tell my mother all about it. That's what we call the aggravating scene. And next comes the passionate scene. He begins singing one of his songs. He thinks he's all right now he's got rid of the girl. Then comes in the old lady, shaking with rage. How dare you strike my child in this here kind of a manner? Come out of the stall or I'll pull you out, neck and crop. Then Jobson is in a funk and expects a hiding. Oh, Mum, I'm very sorry. But your child said I skinned a cat for ninepence and called me Cobbler Waxy Waxy Waxy. I won't believe a word of it, Mr Jobson. Yes, Mum, your child's very insulting. How dare you strike the chick, you nasty old villain. I'll tear the eyes out of you. A fight then commences between them, and the old lady gets the worst of it. Then they make it up, and they'll have some gin. I'll be a penny to your threepence, says the cobbler, and the old lady says, Oh, I can always treat myself. Then there's another fight, for there's two fights in it. 
the old lady gets the worst of it and runs into the cottage, and then old Jobson cries, I'd better be off, stall and all, for fear she should come back with the kitchen poker. That finishes up the scene, don't you see, for he carries off the stall with him. Cobbler Jobson is up to the door, I think. It's first rate. It only wants elaborating. Billy Button is a very laughable thing, and equally up to the door. There's another piece called Billy Waters, the celebrated London beggar, and that's a great hit. There's the bull baiting. That's all the scenes I know of. I believe I am the only man that knows the words all through. Kitty Biling the Pot is one of the most beautifulest scenes in the world. It wants expounding, you know, for you could open it the whole length of the theatre. I wanted to take Ramsgate Theatre and do it there, but they wanted two pounds a night, and that was too much for me. I should have put a sheet up and acted it with real figures as large as life. When I was down at Brighton, acting with the Chinese Guarantee Show, I was forced to drop performing of them. Oh dear, oh dear, don't mention it. You'd have thought the town was on fire. You never saw such an uproar as it made. Put the town in such an agitation that the town authorities forced me to desist. I filled the whole of North Street, and the people was pressing upon me so that I was obliged to run away. I was lodging at the Clarence Hotel in North Street at the time. I ran off down a side street. The next day the police come up to me and tell me that I mustn't exhibit that performance again. I shall calculate it at five shillings a night when I exhibit with the ombres. We don't go out every night, for it's according to the weather, but when we do the calculation is five shillings every night. Sometimes it is ten shillings, or it may be only two shillings sixpence, but five shillings is a fair balance. Take it all the year round, it would come to nine shillings a week, taking the good weather in the bad. It's no use to exaggerate, for the shoe is sure to pinch somewhere if you do. We go out two men together, one to play the pipes and speak the parts, and the other to work the figures. I always do the speaking and the music, for that's what is the most particular. When we do a full performance, such as at juvenile parties, it takes one about one hour and a quarter. For attending parties, we generally get a pound, and perhaps we may get three or four during the Christmas holiday time, or perhaps a dozen. For it's according to the recommendation from one to another. If you goes to a gentleman's house, it's according to whether you behave yourself in a superior sort of a manner. But if you have any vulgarity about you, you must exunt. And there's no recommendation. Tom Paris, the first man that brought out the ombres in the street, was a short, stout man, and very old. He kept at it for four or five years, I believe, and he made a very comfortable living at it, but he died poor. What became of him I do not know. Jim Macklin, I am very little knowledge of. He was a stage performer, but I am not aware what he did do. I don't know when he died, but he's dead and gone. All the old school is dead and gone all the old ancient performers. Paul Herring is the only one that's alive now, and he does the clown. He's a capital clown for tricks. He works his own tricks, that's the beauty of him. When we are performing of an evening, the boys and children will annoy us awful. They follow us so that we are obliged to go miles to get away from them. They will have the best places. They give each other raps on the head if they don't get out of each other's way. I'm obliged to get fighting myself, and give it them, with the drumsticks. They'll throw a stone or two, and then you have to run after them, and swear you're going to kill them. There's the most boys down at Spitalfields, and St Luke's, and at Islington. That's where there's the worst boys, and the most audaciousest. I dare not go into St Luke's. They spile their own amusement by making a noise and disturbance. Quietness is everything. They haven't the sense to know that. If they give us any money, it's very trifling, only perhaps a farden or a halfpenny, and then it's only one out of a fifty or a hundred. The great business is to keep them quiet. No, girls ain't better behaved than boys. They was much wuss. I'd sooner have fifty boys round me than four girls. The impertinence of them is above bearing. They come carrying babies and pushing and crowding and tearing one another to pieces. You're for me. I was fast. 
No, you wasn't. Yes, I was. And that's the way they go on. If a big man comes in front, I'm obliged to ask him to go backwards, to let the little children to see. If they're drunk, perhaps they won't. And then there's a row. And all the children will join in. Oh, it's dreadful irksome. I was once performing on Islington Green, and some drunken people, whilst I was collecting my money, knocked over the concern from wanton mischief. They said to me, We haven't seen nothing, master. I said, I can see you, and haven't you got a brown? Then they began laughing, and I turned round, and there was the show in a blaze, and my mate inside a kicking. I think it was two or three drunken men did it, to injure a poor man from gaining his livelihood from the sweat of his brow. That's eighteen years ago. I was up at Islington last week, and I was really obliged to give over on account of the children. The moment I put it down, there was thousands round me. They were sarsy and impertinent. There was a good collection of people too, but on account of the theatrical business, we want quiet, and they're so noisy, there's no being heard. It's morals is everything, it's shameful how parents lets their children run about the streets. As soon as they fill their bellies, off they are, till they are hungry again. The higher class of society is those who gives us the most money. The working man is good for his penny or halfpenny, but the higher class supports the exhibition. The swells in Regent Street ain't very good. They comes and looks on for a moment and then goes on, or sometimes they exempt themselves with... I'm sorry, but I've got no pence. The best is the gentleman. I can tell them in a minute by their appearance. When we are out performing, we in generally burn three candles at once behind the curtain. One is of no utility, for it wants expansion, don't you see? I don't like naphtha or oil lamps, because we are confined there, and it's very unhealthy. It's very warm as it is, and you must have an eye like a hawk to watch it, or it won't throw the shadows. A brilliant light and a clean sheet is a great attraction, and it's the attraction is everything. In the course of the evening, we'll burn six penny candles. We generally use the patent one, because it throws a clear light. We cut them in half. When we use the others, I have to keep a lookout and tell my mate to snuff the candles when the shadows get dim. I usually say, snuff the candles, out loud, because that's a word for the outside and the inside too, cause it let the company know it isn't all over, and leads them to expect another scene or two. End of section 15。section 16 of London Labour and the London Poor, volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry Street Exhibitors Part 8 Exhibitor of Mechanical Figures I am the only man in London, and in England, I think, who is exhibiting the vigour of mechanique, that is to say, little figures that move their limbs by wheels and springs as if they were the living creatures. I am a native of Parma, in Italy, where I was born. That is, you understand, I was born in the Duchy of Parma, not in the town of Parma, in the Campagna, where my father is a farmer, not a large farmer, but a little farmer, with just enough land for living. I used to work for my father in his fields. I was married when I have twenty years of age, and I have a child aged ten years. I have only thirty years of age, though I have the air of forty. Pardon, monsieur, all my friends say I have the air of forty, and you say that to make me pleasure. When I am with my father, I save up all the money that I can, for there is very little business to be done in the campagna of Parma, and I determine myself to come to Londres, where there is a fair to be done. I like Londres much better than the campagna of Parma, because there is so much affairs to be done. I save up all my money. I become very economic. I live of very little, and when I have a little money, I say adieu to my father, and I commence my voyages. At Paris, I buy a box of music. They are made of Genève, 
this box of music. When I come to Londres, I go to the public house, the Palais de Gin, you understand, and there I show my box of music. Yes, musical box, you call it. And when I get some money, I live very economic. And then, when it becomes more money, I buy another machine, which I buy in Paris. It was a box of music, and on the top it had little figures, which do move their eyes and their limbs when I mount the spring with the key. And then there is music inside the box at the same time. I have three little figures to this box. One was Judith cutting the head of the infidel chief, what do you call him, Holiferones. She lifts her arm with the sword, and she rolls her eyes, and then the other hand is on his head, which it lifts. It does this all the time the music play, until I put on another figure of the soldat, which mounts the guard, yes, which is on duty. The soldat goes to sleep, and his head falls on his bosom. Then he wake again, and lift his lance, and roll his eyes. Then he goes to sleep again. So long until I put on the other figure of the lady with the plate in the hand, and she make salutation to the company for to ask some money. And she continue to do this so long as anybody give her money. All the time the music in the box continues to play. I take a great quantity of money with these figures, three shillings a day, and I live very economic until I put aside a sum large enough to buy the figures which I exhibit now. My most aged child is at Parma, with my father in the Campagna, but my wife and my other child, which has only eighteen months of age, are with me in Londres. It is two months since I have my new figures. I did have them sent from Germany to me. They have cost a great deal of money to me, as much as thirty-five pounds without duty. They have been made in Germany and are very clever figures. I will show them to you. They perform on the round table, which must be level, or they will not turn round. This is the Imperatrice of the French, Eugenie. At least I call her so, for it is not like her, because her chevalure is not arranged in the style of the Imperatrice. The infants like better to say the Imperatrice than a common lady. That is why I call her the Imperatrice. She holds one arm in the air, and you will see she turns round like a person waltzing. The noise you hear is from the wheels of the mechanique, which is under her petticoats. You shall notice her eyes do move as she waltz. The next figure is the carriage of the Emperor of the French, with the Queen and Prince Albert and the King de Sardin inside. It will run round the table, and the horses will move as if they gallop. It is a very clever mechanic. I attach this wire from the front wheel to the centre of the table, or it would not make the round of the table, but it would run off the side and break itself. My most clever mechanic is the elephant. It does move its trunk and its tail and its leg as if walking, and all the time it rolls its eyes from side to side like a real elephant. It is the cleverest elephant of mechanic in the world. The little Indian on the neck, who is the driver, lift his arm, and in the pavilion on the back, the chieftain of the Indians lift his bow and arrow to take aim and put it down again. That mechanic cost me very much money. The elephant is worth much more than the Imperatrice of the French. I could buy two, three Imperatrices for my elephant. I would like sooner lose the Imperatrice than any malheur arrive to my elephant. There are plenty more Imperatrices, but the elephant is very rare. I have also a figure of Tyrolese peasant. She go round the table a short distance and then turn like a dancer. I must get her repaired. She is so weak in her wheels and springs, which wind up under her petticoats, like the Imperatrice. She has been cleaned twice, and yet her mechanic is very bad. Oh, I have oiled her, but it is no good. She must be taken to pieces. When I sent to Germany to get these mechanic made for me, I told the mechanician what I desired, 
and he made them for me. I invented the figures out of my own head, and he did the mechanique. I have voyaged in Holland, and there I see some mechanique, and I notice them, and then I gave the order to do so and so. My elephant is the best of my little figures. There is more complication. I first come to England eighteen years ago, before I was married, and I stop here seven years. Then I go back again to Parma, and then I come back again to England four years ago, and here I stop ever since. I exhibit my little figures in the street. The little children like to see my figures mechanique dance around the table, and the carriage with the horses which gallop. But overall, they like my elephant, with the trunk which curls up in front, like those in the Jardin des Plantes, or what you call it, uh, zoological gardens. When I am in the street, I have two men beside myself. One plays the organ, and the other carry the box with the mechanique figures inside, and I carry the table. The box with the mechanique is in weight about 80 pounds English, and there are straps at the back for the arms to go through. It is as large as a chest of drawers, for the little figures are 18 inches high, and each has a compartment to itself. I pay my men one pound a month, besides lodge, clean, and grub him. The organ for the music is mine. I have another organ with a horse to draw it, which I want to sell, for the horse and the two men to play it destroy all my profits. When I make my figures to play in the street, I must make the table level, for they will not mount up a hill, because the mechanique is not sufficiently strong for that. I go to the West End to show my little figures to the gentlemen and ladies and their families, and I go to the East End to the families of the work people. I also go to Brixton and Hoxton, where they are severe for religion. They like my figures because they are moral, and their children can see them without sinning. But everywhere my figures have much success. Of all the places, I prefer rather Regent Street, and there I go to the little streets in the corners close by the big street. If I calcule how much money I receive for all the year, but I have only had them two months, it is six shillings by day regularly. Sometimes I take ten shillings, and sometimes four shillings, but it settles itself to six shillings a day. After paying for my men and to clean, lodge, and grub them, I have three shillings for myself. In wet weather, when it may rain, or where there is fog, I cannot quit my house to show my figures, for the humidity attack the springs and wheels of the mechanique. Besides, when it falls rain, the dresses of my figures are spoiled, and the robes of the Imperatrice and the Tyrolese peasant are of silk and velvet bodies, with spangles, and they soon spoil. They cost me much money to repair their springs, never less than eight shillings for each time. My peasant has been arranged twice in her springs. It was a watchmaker who arranged her, and he had to take all her inside out and you know what those kind of people charge for their time. Sometimes, when I am out with my figures, the ladies ask me to perform my figures before their windows to show them to their families. The little children look through the window, and then they cannot hear the movement of the mechanique, and the figures look like living. When the organ player vaults to the imperatrice, he has to turn the handle quick at the commencement when the spring is strong in the mechanic, and she turn quick, and to make the music slow, when she turn less often, when the springs get weak at the end. This makes it have the look of being true to one living, as if she danced to the music, although the organ play to her dancing. I always mount the figures with the key myself. I have never performed to a school of young scholars, but I have visited evening parties of children with my mechanic. For that they give me sometimes eight shillings, sometimes ten shillings, just as they are generous. My mechanic require nearly one hour to see them to perfection. The imperatrice of the French 
is what they admire more than the paysan of Tyrol. The dress of the Imperatrice has a long white veil behind her hairs, but her costume is not so soigné as the peasants, for she has no spangles. But they like to see the Imperatrice of the French, and they excuse her toilet because she is noble. My elephant is the greatest delight for them, because it is more complicated in its mechanique. I have always to mount with the key the springs in its inside at least three times before they are fatigued with admiring it. I never perform in the streets during the night, because the air is damp, and it causes injuries to my mechanique. Besides, I must have lights to show off the costume of my figures, and my table is not large enough. It is not only the little children that admire my mechanique, but persons of a ripe age. I often have gentlemen and ladies stand round my table and they say, very clever, to see the lady figures waltz. But above all, when my elephant lift his trunk, the little children will follow me a long way to see my figures, for they know we cannot carry the box far without exhibiting on account of its weight. But my table is too high for them, unless they are at a distance to see the figures perform. If my table was not high, the little children would want to take hold of my figures. I always carry a small stick with me, and when the little children, who are being carried by other little children, put their hand to my figures, I touch them with stick. Not for to hurt them, but to make them take their hand away and prevent them from doing hurt to my mechanic. When the costume of my imperatrice is destroyed by time and wear, my wife makes new clothes for her. Yes, as you say, she is the dressmaker of the imperatrice of the French. But it is not the emperor who pays the bill, but myself. The imperatrice, the one I have, not that of the emperor, does not want more than half a yard of silk for a petticoat. In the present style of fashion, I make her petticoat very large and full, not for the style, but to hide the mechanique in her inside. The Telescope Exhibitor It must be about eight years since I first exhibited the telescope. I have three telescopes now, and their powers vary from about 36 to 300. The instruments of the higher power are seldom used in the streets, because the velocity of the planets is so great that they almost escape the eye before it can fix it. The opening is so very small that, though I can pass my eye on a star in a minute, an ordinary observer would have the orb pass away before he could accustom his eye to the instrument. High power is all very well for separating stars and so forth, but I'm like Dr. Kitchener. I prefer a low power for street purposes. A street passer likes to see plenty of margin round a star. If it fills up the opening, he don't like it. My business is a tailor. I follow that business now. The exhibiting don't interfere with my trade. I work by day at tailoring, and then at this time of the year, note 26th of October 1856, end note, I go out with the instrument about six o'clock. You see, I can, with a low power, see Jupiter rise. It is visible at about half past five, but it gets above the horizon, out of the smoke, about a quarter past six. Saturn rises about ten. From a boy, I was fond of philosophical instruments. I was left an orphan when I was ten years of age. Indeed, I haven't a relation in the world that I'm aware of only excepting my wife's family. My mother died the same year as the Princess Charlotte. Note, 1818, end note. For I can remember her being in mourning for her. My name is a very peculiar one. It is Tregent. This will show you that it is. I some time ago advertised an instrument for sale, and I had a letter from a gentleman living in Liverpool. He said that he was sitting down to lunch, and he took up the paper and cried out, Good God, here's my name! He sent for paper and pens and wrote off at once. He asked whether I was a relation of Tregent, the great chronometer maker. He said he always thought he was the only Tregent in England. He said he was a bachelor and hoped I was too. 
Perhaps he wanted the name to die out. His father, he told me, kept a paper mill. We corresponded a long time till I was tired, and then one day a friend of mine said, Let me write to him, and I'll tell him that if he wants any more information, he must pay your expenses down to Liverpool, and you'll pay him a visit. This letter was sent, and by and by comes an answer, telling me that I was no gentleman to make such a proposition, and then the matter dropped. When I was six years old, I was brought up to tailoring. I was kept very close to work, always on the board working. I even took my meals there. I don't consider it was hard, for it was done for my own benefit. If there was no work going on, I used to be made to learn verses out of the Bible. I highly respected my master, for I consider this was done for my benefit. He died in the country, and I was sorry for it, for if I had known it, I would have gone anywhere to see him buried, aye, even if it had been a hundred miles off. I stopped with this party till I was ten years old. The next party I was with, I was apprenticed to, but he failed when I had been with him three or four years, and then I had more the keeping of him than he of me. I had that resolve in me even at that young age. After I finished my apprentice articles, I went with my society card on the tramp. I went all through Yorkshire, going to the tailors' houses of call, where the clubs are held, and a certain sum of money subscribed weekly to relieve what are called tramps. In some towns I worked for months, such as Leeds. What is called a tramp by tailors means a man searching for work about the country. After I got back to London, I went to my trade again, and I was particularly fortunate in getting good situations. Whenever I was out of work, I'd start off to the country again. I was three years in Brighton doing well, and I had six men under me. It's about eight years ago that I first exhibited in the streets. It was through a friend of mine that I did this. Me and my wife was at Greenwich Hill one Sunday. I was looking through a pocket telescope of mine, and he says, look through mine. I did so, and it was a very good one. And then he says, ah, you should see one I've got at home. It's an astronomical one, and this is terrestrial. I did so, and went and saw it. The first planet I saw was Venus. She was in her horns then, like the moon. She exhibits the same phases as the moon, as does also Mercury. Sometimes horns, sometimes half a sphere, and so on. But they're the only two planets that's known that does so. When I saw this, I said, well, I must have something of this sort. I went to a telescope maker up at Islington, and I made a bargain with him, and he was to make me a day and night telescope for five suits of clothes. Well, I bought the cloth and raised all the money to complete my part of the contract, and then when the telescope was finished, it wasn't worth a D blank. You might as well have looked through a blacking bottle. When I told him of it, he said he couldn't help it. It was worth something to look at, but not to look through. I pawned it for fifteen pounds and sold the ticket for five pounds. The gentleman who bought it was highly satisfied with it, till he found it out. I took this one out in the streets to exhibit with, but it was quite useless and showed nothing. You could see the planetary bodies, but it defined nothing. The stars was all manner of colours and forks. The bodies looked just like a drawing in chalk smudged out. The people who looked through complained, and wouldn't come and look again, and that's why I got rid of it. The next telescope I had made was by the manufacturer who made the one my friend first showed me. That maker has taken some hundred of pounds off me since then. Indeed, I've had eleven, five or six feet telescopes of him, and his name is Mr. Mull, of 13 Albion Place, Clerkenwell, and the value of each of the object glasses was, on the average, £30, though he charged me only trade price, so I got them for less. The first telescope that was of any good that I exhibited with in the streets was worth to me £25. If he was to go to Dolland, he would have charged £105 on a common tripod stand. I had it done under my own direction, and by working myself at it, I got it very cheap. It wasn't good enough for me, so I got rid of it. I've got so nice about object glasses and their distinct vision, and the power they bear, 
that I have never rested content until I have a telescope that would suit the first astronomer. I've got one now that will bear a magnifying power three hundred times, and has an object glass four and a quarter inches diameter, with a focal length of five feet six inches. The stand is made of about two hundred and fifty pieces of brasswork, and has ratchet action, with vertical and horizontal movement. It cost me eighty pounds, and Ross Featherstone Buildings would charge two hundred and fifty pounds for it. I am so initiated into the sort of thing that I generally get all my patterns made, and then I get the castings made, and then have them polished. The price of the object glass is thirty pounds. I am going to take that one out next week. It will weigh about one and a half hundred weight. My present one is a very fine instrument indeed. I have nothing but what is excellent. You can see Jupiter and his satellites, and Saturn and his belt. This is a test for it. Supposing I want to see Polaris, that's the small star that revolves once in 180 years round the pole. It isn't the pole star. It isn't visible to the naked eye. It's one of the tests for a telescope. My instrument gives it as small as a pin's point. There's no magnifying power with a telescope upon stars. Of course, they make them more brilliant and give some that are not visible to the naked eye, for hundreds and thousands will pass through the field in about an hour. They also separate double stars and penetrate into space, nebula, and so on. But they don't increase the size of stars, for the distance is too great. I've worked about five years with this last one that I've now. It weighs with the stand about a hundredweight, and I have to get somebody to help me along with it. One of my boys in general goes along with me. It depends greatly upon the weather as to what business I do. I've known the moon for a month not to be visible for twenty days out of the lunation. I've known that for three moons together. The atmosphere is so bad in London. When I do get a good night, I have taken thirty-five shillings. But then I've taken out two instruments, and my boy has minded one. I only charge a penny a peep. Saturdays and Mondays and Sundays are the best nights in my neighbourhood, and then I can mostly reckon on taking twenty shillings. The other nights it may be seven shillings or eight shillings, or even only two shillings and sixpence. Sometimes I put up the instrument when it's very fine, and then it'll come cloudy, and I have to take it down again and go home. Taking the year round, I should think I make a hundred and twenty-five pounds a year by the telescope. You see, my business as a tailor keeps me in of a day, or I might go out in the day and show the sun. Now today the sun was very fine, and the spots showed remarkably well. And if I'd been out, I might have done well. I sold an instrument of mine once to a fireman who had nothing to do in the day and thought he could make some money exhibiting the telescope. He made eight shillings or ten shillings of an afternoon on Blackfriars Bridge, showing the dome of St Paul's at the time they were repairing it. When the instrument is equatorially mounted and set to time, you can pick out the stars in the daytime, and they look like black specks. I could show them. People can't stop looking through the telescope for long at a time, because the object is soon out of the field, because of the velocity of the Earth's motion and the rapidity at which the planets travel round the sun. Jupiter, for instance, 26,000 miles an hour, and Saturn, 29,000, soon removes them from the field of the telescope. I have to adjust the telescope before each person looks through. It has, I fancy, hurt my eyes very much. My eyesight has got very weak through looking at the moon, for on a brilliant night it's like a plate of silver and dazzles. It makes a great impression on the retina of the eye. I've seen, when looking through the telescope, a black speck, just as if you had dropped a blot of ink on a piece of paper. I've often had dancing lights before my eyes too, very often. I find a homeopathic globule of belladonna very excellent for that. When I exhibit, I in general give a short lecture whilst they are looking through. When I am not busy, I make them give me a description. For this reason, others are listening, and they would sooner take the word of the observer than mine. Suppose I'm exhibiting Jupiter, and I want to draw customers, 
I'll say, how many moons do you see? They'll answer, three on the right and one on the left, as they may be at that time. Perhaps a rough standing by will say, three moons, that's a lie. There's only one, everybody knows. Then, when they hear the observer state what he sees, they'll want to have a peep. When I'm busy, I do a lecture like this. We'll suppose I'm exhibiting Saturn. Perhaps we had better begin with Jupiter, for the orbit of Saturn satellites is so extensive that you can never see them all without shifting the glass. Indeed, it's only in very fine climates, such as Cincinnati, where the eight might be observed, and indeed up to a late period it was believed there were only seven. When the observer sees Jupiter, I begin, Do you see the planet, sir? Yes. I introduce to you Jupiter with all his four satellites. It is distant six hundred millions of miles from the sun, and its diameter is about seven thousand nine hundred miles. It travels round the sun at about twenty-seven thousand miles an hour, and its orbit is over four years, and of course its seasons are four times the length of ours, the summer lasting for a year instead of three months. One night, an Irishman, who was quite the gentleman, came to me rather groggy, and he says, Old boy, what are you looking at? Jupiter, says I. What's that? says he. A planet, you may call it, sir, says I, and the price is one penny. He paid me and had a look, and then he cries out, What a deception this is! By J blank! It's a moon, and you call it a star. There are four moons, said I. You're another, said he. There's a moon and four stars. You ought to be took up for deception. After a time, he had another look, and then he was very pleased, and would bring out gin from a neighbouring public house, and if he brought one, he brought seven. Another time a man was looking through, and I had a tripod stand then, and one of the legs was out, and he pushed the tube, and down it came, right in his eye. He gave a scream and shouted out, My God, there's a star hit me slap in the eye. Another night, an old woman came up to me and she says, God bless you, sir. I'm so glad to see you. I've been looking for you ever such a time. You charge a penny, don't you? I'm a charwoman, sir, and would you believe it? I've never had a penny to spare. What are you looking at? The moon? Well, I must see it. I told her she should see it for nothing and up she mounted the steps. She was a heavy, lusty woman, and I had to shove her up with my shoulder to get up the steps. When she saw the moon, she kept on saying, Oh, that's beautiful! Well, it is beautiful! And that's the moon, is it? Now do tell me all about it. I told her all about Mount Tycho, and about the light of the sun being seen on the mountain tops, and so on. When she'd looked for a time, she said, well, your instrument is a finer one than my master's, but it don't show so much as his, for he says he can see the men fighting in it. This made me laugh so I very nearly let her tumble by taking my shoulder away from under her. But when she came down the steps, she said something quite moved me. She threw her hands up and cried, If this moon is so beautiful and wonderful, what must that God be like who made it? And off she went. It was very fine, wasn't it? Sometimes when I'm exhibiting, there is quite a crowd collects. I've seen them sitting down on the curb, smoking and drinking, whilst they are waiting for their turns to have a peep. They'll send to the public house for beer, and then they'll stop for hours. Indeed, I've had my business quite interfered with by the mob for they don't go away after having their look. I seldom stop out after twelve o'clock at night. Sometimes when I have been exhibiting, the parties have said it was all nonsense and a deception, for the stars was painted on the glass. If the party has been anything agreeable, I have taken the trouble to persuade him. I, for instance, placed the star on the very edge of the glass, and then they've seen it travel right across the field, and as I've told them, if it was painted, it couldn't move and disappear from the lens. Most of the spectators go away quite surprised and impressed with what they have seen. Some will thank me a dozen times over. Some will say, 
while my penny is well laid out, I shouldn't have credited it with my own eyes. Others, but there are very few of them, won't believe when they have looked. Some, when I can see the moon on their eye as they look in, swear they don't see it. Those I let go on and don't take their money, for the penny is no object. When I tell the people what the wonders of the heavens are and how each of the planets is a world, they go away wonderfully grateful and impressed. I went down to Portsmouth with my telescope at the time the fleet sailed under St. Charles Napier and the Queen led them out in her yacht. I took a great deal of money there. I didn't exhibit in the daytime. I didn't trouble myself. I took two guineas showing the yacht the day she sailed and at night with the moon. The other nights, with the moon and planets only, I took from twelve shillings to fourteen shillings. I refused fifteen shillings for one hour for this reason. A lady sent her servant to ask me to go to her house, and my price is one guinea for to go out, whether for an hour or two or three. But she first offered me ten shillings, and then the next night fifteen shillings. Then I found I should have to carry my instrument, weighing one hundred weight, two miles into the country, and uphill all the way. So, as I was sure of taking more than ten shillings where I was, I wouldn't, for an extra shilling, give myself the labour. I took twelve shillings sixpence as it was. At Portsmouth, a couple of sailors came up, and one had a look, and the other said, What is there to see? I told him the moon, and he asked the price. When I said, one penny, he says, I ain't got a penny, but here's three halfpence, if that's the same to you. And he gives it, and when I expected he was about to peep, he turns round and says, I'll be smothered if I'm going to look down that gallows long chimney. You've got your money, and that's all your business. So you see, there are some people who are quite indifferent to scientific exhibitions. There are, to the best of my knowledge, about four men besides myself go about with telescopes. I don't know of any more. Of these, there are only one of any account. I've seen through them all, so I may safely say it. I consider mine the best in London exhibiting. Mine is a very expensive instrument. Everything depends upon the object glass. There's glasses on some which have been thrown aside as valueless and may have been bought for two or three pounds. The capital required to start a telescope in the streets all depends upon the quantity of the object glass, from three pounds to fifty pounds for the object glass alone. Nobody who is not acquainted with telescopes knows the value of object glasses. I've known this offer to be made, that the object glass should be placed in one scale and gold in the other to weigh it down and then they wouldn't. The rough glass from Birmingham, before it is worked, only 12 inches in diameter, will cost £96. Chance at Birmingham is the principal maker of the crown and flint for optical purposes. The Swiss used formerly to be the only makers of optical metal of any account, and now Birmingham has knocked them out of the field. Indeed, they have got the Swiss working for them at chances. You may take a couple of plates of rough glass to persons ignorant of their value, and they are only 12 inches in diameter, and he would think one shilling dear for them, for they only look like the bits you see in the streets to let light through the pavement. These glasses are half flint and half crown, the flint for the concave and the crown for the convex side. Their beauty consists in their being pure metal and quite transparent and not stringy. Under the high magnifying power we use, you see this directly, and it makes the object smudgy and distorts the vision. After getting the rough metal, it takes years to finish the object glass. They polish it with satin and putty. The convex has to be done so correctly that if the lens is the one hundredth part of an inch out, its value is destroyed. The well-known object glass which was shown in the Great Exhibition of 1851 was in Mr. Rossi's hands, note, of Featherstone Buildings, Holborn, end note, for four years before it was finished. It was very good and done him great credit. 
he is supposed to have lost by the job, for the price is all eat up by wages pretty near. The observatory on Wandsworth Common is a complete failure, owing to the object glass being a bad one. It belongs to the Reverend Mr. Cragg. The tube is 72 feet long, I believe, and shaped like a cigar, bulging at the sides. He wanted to have a new object glass put in, and what do you think they asked him at Birmingham for the rough metal alone? Two thousand pounds. It is twenty-four inches in diameter. Mr. Ross asks six thousand pounds, I was told, to make a new one finished for him. The making of object glasses is dreadful and tedious labour. Men have been known to go and throw their heads under wagon wheels and have them smashed from being regularly worn out with working an object glass and not being able to get the convex right. I was told by a party that one object glass was in hand for 14 years. The night of the eclipse of the moon, note, the 13th of October, 1856, end note, when it was so well seen in London, I took one pound and a penny, at a penny each. I might as well have took two pounds by charging tuppence, but being so well known then, I didn't make no extra charge. They were forty deep, for everybody wished to see. I had to put two lads under the stand to prevent their being trod to death. They had to stay there for two hours before they could get a peep, and so indeed had many others to do the same. A friend of mine didn't look at all, for I couldn't get him near. They kept calling to the one looking through the tube, Now then, make haste, you there! They nearly fought for their turns. They got pushing and fighting, one crying, I was first, and now it's my turn. I was glad when it was over, I can assure you. The buttons to my braces were dragged off my back by the pressure behind, and I had to hold up my breeches with my hand. The eclipse lasted from 21 minutes past 9 to 25 minutes past 12, and in that time 247 persons had a peep. The police were there to keep order, but they didn't interfere with me. They are generally very good to me, and they seem to think that my exhibition improves the minds of the public, and so protect me. When I went to Portsmouth, I applied to Mr. Myers the goldsmith, a very opulent and rich man there, and chairman of the Esplanade Committee at South Sea, and he instantly gave me permission to place my stand there. Likewise the mayor and magistrates of Portsmouth to exhibit in the streets. End of section 16section 17 of london labor and the london poor volume 3 by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part 9 exhibitor of the microscope i exhibit with a microscope that i wouldn't take 50 guineas for because it suits my purpose and it is of the finest quality I earn my living with it. If I were to sell it, I wouldn't fetch more than fifteen pounds. It was presented to me by my dear sister who went to America and died there. I'll show you that it is a valuable instrument. I'll tell you that one of the best lens makers in the trade looked through it, and so he said, I think I can improve it for you. And he made me a present of a lens of extreme high power and the largest aperture of magnifying power that has ever been exhibited. I didn't know him at the time. He did it by kindness. He said, after looking through, It's very good for what it professes, but I'll make you a present of a lens made out of the best Swiss metal. And he did so from the interest he felt in seeing such kinds of exhibitions in the streets. With the glass he gave me, I can see cheese mites as distinctly as possible, with their eight legs and transparent bodies, and heads shaped like a hedgehog's. I see their jaw moving as they eat their food, and can see them lay their eggs, which are as perfect as any fowl's, but of a bright blue colour, and I can also see them perform the duties of nature. I can also see them carry their young on their back, showing that they have affection for their offspring. They lay their eggs through their ribs, 
and you can tell when they are going to lay, for there is a bulging out just by the hips. They don't sit on their eggs, but they roll them about in action till they bring forth their object. A million of these mites can walk across a flea's back, for, by Lardner's micrometer, the surface of a flea's back measures 24 inches from the proboscis to the posterior. The micrometer is an instrument used for determining microscopic power, and it is all graduated to a scale. By Lardner's micrometer, the mite looks about the size of a large black beetle, and then it is magnified 100,000 times. This will give you some idea of the power and value of my instrument. Three hundred gentlemen have viewed through it in one week, and each one delighted, so much so that many have given double the money I have asked, which was a penny. Such was the satisfaction my instrument gave. My father was a minister and local preacher in the Wesleyan Methodists. He died, poor fellow, at twenty-seven years of age, therefore I never had an opportunity of knowing him. He was a boot and shoemaker. Such was the talent which he possessed that, had it not been for his being lamed of one foot, from a fall of a horse, he would have been made a travelling minister. He was a wonderful clever man, and begun preaching when he was twenty-one. He was the minister who preached on the occasion of laying the foundation stone of Hoxton Chapel, and he drew thousands of people. I was only two years old when he died, and my mother was left with five of us to bring up. She was a visitor of the sick and the dying for the Strangers' Benevolent Fund, and much respected for her labours. After my father's death, she was enabled to support her family of one son and four daughters by shoe-binding. She was married twice after my father's death, but she married persons of quite opposite principles and opinions to her own, and she was not comfortable with them, but left them, and always found shelter under her son's roof where she died triumphantly happy. I was apprenticed when I was thirteen years of age to a shoemaker, who was a profound philosopher and very fond of making experiments and of lecturing on various branches of science. I could produce bills, I have them at home, such as that at the Friars Mount Sunday School some six or seven years ago, where it states that William Nock, minister and lecturer, will lecture on zoology and natural history. He's about 70 now. Electricity is his favourite science. When I was his apprentice, he had an observatory built at the top of his house in Underwood Street, Spitalfields, for the purpose of taking astronomical observations. My being in his house and seeing him so busy with his instruments gave me a great taste for science. I was his assistant when he went lecturing. I was apprenticed with him for five years. He was a kind and good master, and very affectionate. He encouraged me in my scientific studies, and gave me access to his library, which was immense, and consisted of three thousand volumes. Amongst other employment, I used to copy out sermons for him, and he gave me a penny each, which by saving up enabled me to buy a watch of him for five pounds five shillings. He was a shoemaker and manufacturer of ladies' and children's boots and shoes, so that he might have made from his two pounds to three pounds a week, for he was not a journeyman but an employer. After I was out of my time, I went to Mr. Children, a bootmaker of Bethnal Green Road, well known in that locality. My master had not sufficient employment for me. One night this Mr. Children went to hear a lecture on astronomy by Dr. Bird, and when he came home, he was so delighted with what he had seen that he began telling his wife all about it. He said, I cannot better explain to you the solar system than with a mop. And he took the mop and dipped it into a pail of water and began to twirl it round in the air till the wet flew off it. Then he said, This mop is the sun, and the spiral motion of the water gives the revolutions of the planets in their orbits. Then, after a time, he cried out, If this Dr. Bird can do this, why shouldn't I? He threw over his business directly to carry out the grand object of his mind. He was making from three pounds to four pounds a week, and his wife said, Robert, you are mad! He asked me if I knew anything of astronomy, and I said, 
sir my old master was an astronomer and philosopher then i got books for him and i taught him all i knew of the science of astronomy then he got a magic lantern with astronomical slides the bull's eye was six inches in diameter so they were very large so that they gave a figure of twelve feet for the signs of the zodiac he had twelve separate small lanterns with the large one in the centre to show the diverging rays of the sun's light he began with many difficulties in his way for he was a very illiterate man and had a vast deal to contend with but he succeeded through all he wrote to his father and got five hundred pounds which was his share of the property which would have been left him on his parents death at his first lecture he made many mistakes such as now gentlemen i shall present to your notice the consternations at which expression the company cried hear hear and one said we are all in a consternation here for your lamp wants oil yet he faced all this out i was his assistant i taught him everything when i told him of his mistake he'd say never mind i'll overcome all that he accumulated the vast sum of six thousand pounds by lecturing and became a most popular man he educated himself and became qualified when he went into the country he had archbishops and bishops and the highest of the clergy to give their sanction and become patrons of his lectures he's now in america and become a great farmer after i left mr children i connected myself with a young men's improvement meeting previous to that i had founded a sunday school in the new kent road deverill street sabbath schools were founded by me and i was for fourteen years manager of it as well as performer of the funeral service in that place for there was a chapel and burying ground and vaults attached to the schools and i became the officiating minister for the funeral service three thousand children have been educated at these schools and for fourteen years i lecture to them every sunday on religious subjects with the tutors and the eldest scholars i formed a young men's improvement meeting i became the president of that meeting and their lecturer i lectured on the following subjects natural history electricity astronomy and phrenology at this time i was a master shoemaker and doing a business of fifty guineas a week of which ten were profit i built large workshops at the back of my house which cost me three hundred pounds unfortunately i lent my name to a friend for a very large amount and became involved in his difficulties and then necessity compelled me to have recourse to street exhibitions for a living when i was in affluent circumstances i had a library of three hundred volumes on scientific subjects mostly and from them i have gleaned sufficient information to qualify me for street exhibition and thereby enable me to earn more money than most individuals in such circumstances i began my street life with exhibiting a telescope and here is the origin of my doing so i had a sister living at the west end of the town who was a professed cook and i used to visit her three times a week one night i saw a man in the regent circus exhibiting a telescope i went up to him and i said sir what is the object tonight and he told me it was jupiter i was very much interested with looking at jupiter and i stopped with that man for two hours conversing with him and i saw exactly how much he took then i thought why shouldn't i do this so i wrote to my brother-in-law and i told him this man was taking at the rate of a penny per minute and i offered if he would provide me with a telescope that i should be very happy and contented to take half of the receipts as my share and give him the other for the use of his instrument he did so and bought a telescope which cost him fourteen pounds i took up my stand on london bridge and did very well taking on the average six shillings a night i gave up the telescope for this reason my brother-in-law was going to america and was anxious to call in all his money the telescope was sold and my sister the professed cook fearing that i should be left without a means of living bought for me a microscope out of her own earnings which cost her five pounds she said to me the microscope is better than the telescope for the nights are so uncertain she was quite right for when the telescopes have been idle for three months at a time 
I can exhibit my microscope day and night. She gave it to me as a mark of her respect. She died in America just after she arrived. That instrument has enabled me to support an afflicted and aged mother and to bury her comfortably when she died. My microscope contains six objects, which are placed on a wheel at the back, which I turn round in succession. The objects are in cell boxes of glass. The objects are all of them familiar to the public and are as follows. 1. The flea. 2. The human hair, or the hair of the head. 3. A section of the old oak tree. 4. The animalculae in water. 5. Cheese mites. And 6. The transverse section of cane used by schoolmasters for the correction of boys. I always take up my stand in the daytime in Whitechapel, facing the London Hospital, being a large open space and favourable for the solar rays, for I light up the instrument by the direct rays of the sun. At night time I am mostly to be found on Westminster Bridge, and then I light up with the best sperm oil there is. I am never interfered with by the police. On the contrary, they come and have a look, and admire and recommend, such is the interest excited. The first I exhibit is the flea, and I commence a short lecture as follows. Gentlemen, I says, the first object I have to present to your notice is that of a flea. I wish to direct your attention especially to the head of this object. Here you may distinctly perceive its proboscis, or dart. It is that which perforates the cuticle, or human skin, after which the blood ascends by suction from our body into that of the flea. Thousands of persons in London have seen a flea, have felt a flea, but have never yet been able, by the human eye, to discover that instrument which made them sensible of the flea about their person, although they could not catch the old gentleman. This flea, gentlemen, by Dr. Lardner's micrometer, measures accurate 24 inches in length and 11 across the back. My instrument, mark you, being of high magnifying power, will not show you the whole of the object at once. Mark you, gentlemen, this is not the flea of the dog or the cat, but the human flea, for each differ in their formation, as clearly proved by this powerful instrument, for they all differ in their form and shape, and will only feed upon the animal on which they are bred. Having shown you the head and shoulders with its dart, I shall now proceed to show you the posterior view of this object, in which you may clearly discover every artery, vein, muscle, and nerve, exact like a lobster in shape, and quite as large as one at two shillings sixpence. That pleases them, you know, and sometimes I add, to amuse them, an object of that size would make an excellent supper for half a dozen persons. That pleases them. One Irish woman, after seeing the flea, threw up her arms and screamed out, Oh, J blank, and I've had hundreds of them in my bed at once. She got me a great many customers from her exclamations. You see, my lecture entices those listening to have a look. Many listeners say, Ain't that true and philosophical and correct? I've had many give me sixpence and say, Never mind the change, your lecture is alone worth the money. I'll now proceed to number two. The next object I have to present to your notice, gentlemen, is that of the hair of the human head. You perceive that it is nearly as large as yonder scaffolding poles of the House of Lords. I say this when I am on Westminster Bridge, because it refers to the locality, and is a striking figure, and excites the listeners. But mark you, it is not, like them, solid matter, through which no ray of light can pass. That's where I please the gentlemen, you know, for they say, how philosophical. You can readily perceive, mark you, that they are all tubes, like tubes of glass, a proof of which fact you have before you, from the light of the lamp shining direct through the body of the object, and that light direct portrayed in the lens of your eye, called the retina, on which all external objects are painted. Beautiful, says a gentleman. Now, if the hair of the head be a hollow tube, as you perceive it is, 
then what caution you ought to exercise when you place your head in the hands of the hairdresser by keeping your hat on, or else you may be susceptible to catch cold. For that which we breathe, the atmosphere passing down these tubes suddenly shuts to the doors, if I may be allowed such an expression, or in other words, closes the pores of the skin and thereby checks the insensible perspiration and colds are the result. Powdering the head is quite out of date now, but if a little was used on those occasions referred to, cold in the head would not be so frequent. What do you think of that? I never had an individual complain of my lecture yet. Now comes number three. This gentleman is the brave old oak, a section of it not larger than the head of a pin. Looking at it through this powerful instrument, you may accurately perceive millions of perforations, or pores, through which the moisture of the earth rises in order to aid its growth. Of all the trees in the forest, none is so splendid as the brave old oak. This is the tree that braves the battle and the breeze, and is said to be in its perfection at one hundred years. Who that looks at it would not exclaim, in the language of the song, Woodman, spare that tree and cut it not down. Such is the analogy existing between vegetable and animal physiology that a small portion of the cuticle, or human skin, would present the same appearance, for there are millions of pores in the human skin, which a grain of sand is said to cover. And here are millions of perforations through which the moisture of the earth is said to rise to aid the growth of the tree. See the similitude between the vegetable and animal physiology. Here is the exhibition of nature. See how it surpasses that of art. See the ladies at the great exhibition admiring the shawls that came from India, yet they, though truly deserving, could not compare with this bit of bark from the brave old oak. Here is a pattern richer and more deserving than any on any shawl, however wonderful. Where is the linen draper in this locality that can produce anything so beautiful as that on this bit of bark? Such are the works of art as compared with those of nature. Number four is the animalculae in water. Gentlemen, the object now before you is a drop of water that may be suspended on a needle's point, teeming with millions of living objects. This one drop of water contains more inhabitants than the globe on which I stand. See the velocity of their motion, the action of their stomachs. The vertebrae is elegantly marked, like the boa constrictor in the zoological gardens. They are all moving with perfect ease in this one drop, like the mighty monsters of the vast deep. On one occasion, a gentleman from St. Thomas's Hospital disputed my statement about its being only one drop of water. So I said to the gent, If you will accompany me to some coffee house, the drop of water shall be removed, and perhaps what you see you may believe. Which he did, and he paid me one shilling for my experiment. He told me he was a doctor, and I told him I was surprised that he was not better acquainted with the instrument. For, said I, how can you tell the effects of inoculation on the cuticle, or the disease called the itch, unless you are acquainted with such an instrument? He was quite ashamed, as he paid me for my trouble. I tell this anecdote on the bridge, and I always conclude with, Now, gentlemen, whilst I was paid one shilling by the faculty for showing one object alone, I am only charging you a penny for the whole six. Then I address myself to the person looking into the microscope and say, What do you think of this one drop of water, sir? And he says, Splendid! Then I add, Few persons would pass and repass this instrument without having a glance into it if they knew the wonders I exhibit. And the one looking says, That's true, very true. The next object is the cheese mite, number five. I always begin in this way. Those who are unacquainted with the study of entomology declare that these mites are beetles and not mites. But could I procure a beetle with eight legs, I should present it to the British Museum as a curiosity. 
this is the way i clench up the mouths of those sceptics who would try to ridicule me by showing that i am philosophic just look at them notice for instance their head how it represents the form of a hedgehog the body presents that of the beetle shape they have eight legs and eight joints they have four legs forward and four legs back and they can move with the same velocity forwards as they can back such is their construction they are said to be moving with the velocity of five hundred steps in one minute read blair's preceptor where you may see a drawing of the might accurately given as well as read the description just given a cheesemonger in whitechapel brought me a few of these objects for me to place in my microscope he invited his friends which were taking supper with him to come out and have a glance at the same objects he gave me sixpence for exhibiting them to him and was highly gratified at the sight of them i asked him how he could have the impudence to sell them for a lady's supper at tenpence a pound the answer he gave me was what the eye cannot see the heart never grieves then i go on whilst this lady is extending her hand to the poor and doing all the relief in her power she is slaying more living creatures with her jawbone than ever samson did with his if it's a boy looking through i say now jack when you are eating bread and cheese don't let it be said that you slay the mites with the jawbone of an ass cultivate the intellectual and moral powers superior to the passions and then you will rise superior to that animal in intellect good says a gentleman good here's sixpence for you and another says here's tuppence for you and i'm blessed if i want to see anything after hearing your lecture then i continue to point out the affection of the mite for its young you see fathers looking after their daughters and mothers after their sons when they are taking their walks and such is their love for their young that when the young ones are fatigued with their journey the parents take them up on their backs do you not see it and then some will say i'll give a penny to see that and i've had four pennies put in my hand at once to see it excitement is everything in this world sir next comes the cane number six the object before you gentlemen is a transverse section of cane common cane such mark you as is used by schoolmasters for the correction of boys who neglect their tasks or play the wag i make it comic you know this i call the tree of knowledge for it has done more for to learn us the rules of arithmetic than all the vegetable kingdom combined to it we may attribute the rule of three from its influence on the mind that always causes a smile just look at it for one moment notice in the first place its perforations where the human hand has failed to construct a micrometer for microscopic or telescopic purposes the spider has lent its web in one case and the cane in the other through the instrumentality of its perforations we may accurately infer the magnifying power of other objects showing the law of analogy the perforations of this cane apart from this instrument would hardly admit a needle's point but seem now large enough for your arm to enter this cane somewhat represents a telescopic view of the moon at the full when in conjunction with the sun for instance here i could represent inverted rocks and mountains you may perceive them yourself just as they would be represented in the moon's disk through a powerful telescope of two hundred and fifty times such as i have exhibited to a thousand persons in st paul's churchyard on the right of this piece of cane if you are acquainted with the science of astronomy you may depict your very accurately mount tycho for instance representing a beautiful burning mountain like mount vesuvius or etony near the fields of naples you might discover accurately all the diverging streaks of light emanating from the crater further on to the right you may perceive mount st catherine like the blaze of a candle rushing through the atmosphere on the left you may discover mount ptolemy such is a similar appearance of the moon's mountainous aspect i ask you if the schoolboy had but an opportunity of glancing at so splendid an object as the cane 
should he ever be seen to shed a tear at its weight? This shows that I am scientific and no astronomy. The last part makes them laugh. This is the mode in which I exhibit my instrument, and such is the interest being excited in the public mind that though a penny is the small change which I make, that amount has been doubled and trebled by gentlemen who have viewed the instrument. And on one occasion a clergyman in the commercial road presented me with half a sovereign for the interest he felt at my description, as well as the objects presented to his view. It has given universal satisfaction. I don't go out every night with my instrument. I always go on the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday and Saturday, for those are the nights when I take most money, especially on the Monday and Saturday. The Monday and Saturday are generally six shillings, Tuesdays about five shillings and Wednesdays about two shillings sixpence. Then the Thursday averages one shilling eightpence and the Fridays in some localities where the men are paid on that night are equal to Saturday. Such are the benefits arising from night exhibition. In the day, it comes to rather more. I've been to Greenwich, and on the One Tree Hill, I've done more with the sunlight than the night light. Taking the changes of weather, such as rain and cold bleak nights, and such weather as isn't suitable to such an exhibition, I may say safely that my income amounts to £80 a year. The capital required for such a business amounts to from £10 to £20. My instrument only costs £5, but it was parted with to raise money, and I wouldn't take £50 for it. It was my sister's son-in-law who sold it. It was a gift more than a sale. You can buy a very good microscope for £10, but a great deal of course is required in choosing it, for you may buy a thing not worth 20 shillings. You'd have an achromatic microscope for £20. It costs me about fourpence a week for oil, the best sperm, at one shilling fourpence the pint, and a quarter of a pint will last me the week. I get my specimens in London. I prepare them all myself, and always keep a stock by me. For the sake of any gentleman who may have any microscope and wish to procure excellent living specimens of mites and animalculae in water, may do so in this way. This is a secret which I give from a desire which I feel to afford pleasure to gentlemen of a scientific mind. Get mites from a cheesemonger. Mites differ in their shape and form according to the cheese they are taken from. The Stilton cheese differs from the Dutch cheese mite, and so does that of the aristocratic Cheshire, as I call it. In order to rise them clear and transparent, Take a wooden box of two and a half inches deep and two and a half inches in diameter with a thick screw lid and let the lid take off halfway down. Place the dust in the bottom of the box, damp the thread of the screw lid to make it air tight. The mites will ascend to the lid of the box. Four or five hours afterwards, unscrew the lid gently and, removing it, let it fall gently on a piece of writing paper. The mites crawl up to the lid, and by this way you get them free from dust and clean. To make the animalculae water, I draw from the bottom of a water tub a small quantity of water, and I put about a handful of new hay in that water. I expose it to the influence of the solar light, or some gentle heat, for three or four hours. Skim off its surface... After washing your hands, take your finger and let one drop of the hay water fall on the glass, and then add to it another drop of pure water to make it more transparent. This information took me some years of experience to discover. I never read it or learnt it from anyone, but found it out myself. But all liberal scientific men like to share their information. It's impossible for me to say how many people have looked through my instrument but they must be counted by tens of thousands. I have had 160 looking through in one night, or 13 shillings fourpence worth. This was on a peculiar occasion. They average about six shillings worth. If I could get out every night, I should do well. As it is, I am obliged to work at my trade of shoemaking to keep myself, for you must take it into consideration that there are some nights when I cannot show my exhibition. 
Very often I have a shilling or sixpence given to me as a present by my admirers. Many a half crown I've had as well. One night I was showing over at the Elephant and Castle, and I saw a Quaker gentleman coming along, and he said to me, What art thee showing to-night, friend? So I told him, and he says, And what doth thee charge, friend? I answered, To the working man, sir, I am determined to charge no more than a penny, but to a gentleman I always leave it to their liberality. So he said, Well, I like that, friend. I'll give thee all I have. And he put his hand into his pocket, and he pulled out five penny pieces. You see, that is what I always do, and it meets with its reward. End of section 17section eighteen of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part ten peep shows concerning these i received the subjoined narrative from a man of considerable experience in the profession being a cripple I am obliged to exhibit a small peep show. I lost the use of this arm ever since I was three months old. My mother died when I was ten years old, and after that my father took up with an Irish woman and turned me and my youngest sister, she was two years younger than me, out into the streets. My father had originally been a dyer, but was working at the fiddle-string business then. My youngest sister got employment at my father's trade, but I couldn't get no work because of my crippled arms. I walked about till I fell down in the streets for want. At last a man who had a sweetmeat shop took pity on me. His wife made the sweetmeats and minded the shop while he went out a-juggling in the streets in the Ramosami line. He told me as how, if I would go round the country with him and sell prints while he was a-juggling in the public houses, he'd find me in Whittles and pay my lodging. I joined him and stopped with him two or three year. After that, I went to work for a very large waste paper dealer. He used to buy up all the old back numbers of the cheap periodicals and penny publications and send me out with them to sell at a farden apiece. He used to give me fourpence out of every shilling, and I done very well with that till the periodicals came so low and so many on them that they wouldn't sell at all. Sometimes I could make fifteen shillings on a Saturday night and a Sunday morning a selling the odd numbers of periodicals such as Tales of the Wars, Lives of the Pirates, Lives of the Highwaymen, and so on. I've often sold as many as two thousand numbers on a Saturday night in the new cut, and the most of them was works about thieves and highwaymen and pirates. Besides me, there was three others at the same business. Altogether, I dare say, my master alone used to get rid of 10,000 copies of such works on a Saturday night and Sunday morning. Our principal customers was young men. My master made a good bit of money at it. He had been about 18 years in the business and had begun with two shillings sixpence. I was with him 15 year on and off, and at the best time I used to earn my 30 shillings a week full at that time. But then I was foolish and didn't take care of my money. When I was at the odd number business, I bought a peep show. I gave two pounds ten shillings for it. I had it second hand. I was persuaded to buy it. A person as has got only one hand, you see, isn't like other folks. And the people said it would always bring me a meal of victuals and keep me from starving. The peep shows was a doing very well then. That's about five or six years back. When the theatres was all a shilling to go into them whole price. But now there's many at threepence or tuppence, and a good lot at a penny. Before the theatres lowered, a peep showman could make three shillings or four shillings a day at the least, in fine weather, and on a Saturday night about double that money. At a fair, he could take his fifteen shillings to a pound a day. Then there was about nine or ten peep shows in London. These were all back shows. There are two kinds of peep shows, which we call back shows and caravan shows. The caravan shows are much larger than the others and are drawn by a horse or a donkey. 
They have a green baize curtain at the back, which shuts out them as don't pay. The showmen usually lives in these caravans with their families. Often there will be a man, his wife, and three or four children living in one of these shows. These caravans mostly go into the country and very seldom are seen in town. They exhibit principally at fairs and feasts, or wakes, in country villages. They generally go out of London between March and April, because some fairs begin at that time, but many wait for the fairs at May. Then they work their way right round from village to town. They tell one another what part they are going to, and they never interfere with one another's rounds. If a new hand comes into the business, they are very civil and tells him what places to work. The caravans comes to London about October, after the fairs is over. The scenes of them caravan shows is mostly upon recent battles and murders. Anything in that way, of late occurrence, suits them. Theatrical plays ain't no good for country towns, cause they don't understand such things there. People is very fond of the battles in the country, but a murder what is well known is worth more than all the fights. There was more took with Rush's murder than there has been even by the Battle of Waterloo itself. Some of the caravan shows does very well. Their average taking is 30 shillings a week for the summer months. At some fairs they'll take five pounds in the three days. They have been about town as long as we can recollect. I should say there is full 50 of these caravan shows throughout the country. Some never comes into London at all. There is about a dozen that comes to London regular every winter. The business in general goes from family to family. The cost of a caravan show second hand is forty pounds. That's without the glasses, and them runs from ten shillings to a pound a piece because they're large. Why I've knowed the front of a peep show with the glasses cost sixty pounds. The front was mahogany and had thirty six glasses with gilt carved mouldings round each on them. The scenes will cost about six pounds if done by the best artist, and three pounds if done by a common hand. The back shows are peep shows that stand upon trussels, and are so small as to admit of being carried on the back. The scenery is about eighteen inches to two foot in length, and about fifteen inches high. They have been introduced about fifteen or sixteen years ago. The man as first brought him up was named Billy T. Blank. He was lame of one leg and used to exhibit little automaton figures in the new cut. On their first coming out, the oldest back showman as I know on told me they could take 15 shillings a day. But now we can't do more than 7 shillings a week, run Saturday and all the other days together. And that's through the theatres being so low. It's a regular starving life now. We has to put up with the insults of people so. The back shows generally exhibits plays of different kind what's been performed at the theatres lately. I've got many different plays to my show. I only exhibit one at a time. There's Halonzer the Brave and the Fair Himogen, the Dog of Montargis and the Forest of Bondi, Hyder Halley or the Lions of Mysore, the Forty Thieves, that never done no good to me, the Devil and Dr. Faustus, and at Christmas time we exhibit pantomimes. I have some other scenes as well. I've Napoleon's return from Helba, Napoleon at Waterloo, the death of Lord Nelson, and also the Queen embarking to start for Scotland from the dockyard at Woolwich. We take more from children than grown people in London, and more from grown people than children in the country. You see, grown people has such remarks made upon them when they're peeping through in London as to make it bad for us here. Lately I have been hardly able to get a living, you may say. Some days I've taken sixpence, others eightpence, and sometimes a shilling. That's what I call a good day for any of the weekdays. On a Saturday it runs from two shillings to two shillings sixpence. Of the weekdays, Monday or Tuesday is the best. If there's a fair on near London, such as Greenwich, we can go and take three shillings and four shillings, or five shillings a day, so long as it lasts. But after that, we comes back to the old business, and that's bad enough. For after you've paid one shilling sixpence a week rent, and sixpence a week stand for your peep show, and come to buy a bit of coal, why, all one can get is a bit of bread and a cup of tea to live upon. As for meat, 
we don't see it from one month's end to the other. My old woman, when she is at work, only gets five fardens a pair for making a pair of drawers to send out for the convicts, and three halfpence for a shirt, and out of that she has to find her own thread. There are from six to eight scenes in each of the plays that I shows, and if the scenes are a bit short, why, I puts in a couple of battle scenes, or I makes up a panorama for em. The children will have so much for their money now. I charge a halfpenny for the active performance. There is characters and all, and I explains what they are supposed to be a talking about. There's about six back shows in London. I don't think there's more. It don't pay now to get up a new play. We works the old ones over and over again, and sometimes we buys a fresh one off another showman, if we can rise the money. The price is two shillings and two shillings sixpence. I've been obligated to get rid on about twelve of my plays to get a bit of victuals at home. Formerly we used to give a hartist one shilling to go in the pit and sketch off the scenes and figures of any new play that was a-doing well and we thought it'd take, and after that we used to give him from one shilling sixpence to two shillings for drawing and painting each scene, and a penny and a penny halfpenny each for the figures, according to the size. Each play costs us from fifteen shillings to a pound for the inside scenes and figures, and the outside painting as well. The outside painting in general consists of the most attractive part of the performance. The new cut is no good at all now on a Saturday night. That's through the cheap penny exhibitions there. Tottenham Court Road ain't much account either. The street markets is the best of a Saturday night. I'm often obliged to take bottles instead of money, and they don't fetch more than threepence a dozen. Sometimes I take four dozen of bottles in a day. I let some see a play for a bottle, and often two want to see for one large bottle. The children is dreadful for cheatening things down. In the summer I goes out of London for a month at a stretch. In the country I works my battle pieces. They are most pleased there with my Lord Nelson's death at the Battle of Trafalgar. That there is, I tell them, a fine painting, representing Lord Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar. In the centre is Lord Nelson in his last dying moments, supported by Captain Hardy and the chaplain. On the left is the explosion of one of the enemy's ships by fire. That represents a fine painting, representing the death of Lord Nelson at the Battle of Trafalgar, what was fought on the 12th of October 1805. I've got five glasses, they cost about five shillings apiece when new, and is about three and a half inches across, with a three-foot focus. Acrobat or Street Posturer A man who, as he said, had all his life been engaged in the profession of acrobat, volunteered to give me some details of the life led and the earnings made by this class of street performer. He at the present moment belongs to a school of five, who are dressed up in fanciful and tight-fitting costumes of white calico with blue or red trimmings and who are often seen in the quiet by-streets going through their gymnastic performances, mounted on each other's shoulders, or throwing somersaults in the air. He was a short, wiry-built man with a broad chest, which somehow or another seemed unnatural, for the bones appeared to have been forced forward and dislocated. His general build did not betoken the great muscular strength which must be necessary for the various feats which he has to perform and his walk was rather slovenly and loutish than brisk and springy, as one would have expected. He wore the same brown Chesterfield coat which we have all seen him slip over his professional dress in the street when moving off after an exhibition. His yellow hair reached nearly to his shoulders, and not being confined by the ribbon he usually wears across his forehead in the public thoroughfare, it kept straggling into his eyes, and he had to toss it back with a jerk after the fashion of a horse with his nose-bag. He was a simple, good-natured fellow, and told his story in a straightforward manner, which was the more extraordinary, as he prefaced his statement with a remark that all in his school, note the professional term for a gang or troop, end note, were terribly against his coming, but that as all he was going to say was nothing but the truth, he didn't care a fig for any of them. 
it is a singular fact that this man spoke fluently both the french and german languages and as will be seen in his statement he has passed many years of his life abroad performing in several circuses or pitching note exhibiting in the streets end note in the various large towns of sweden denmark prussia switzerland and france the following is the history of his life from his earliest remembrance from two years old indeed down to his present age thirty-six i am what is known as a street posture or acrobat i belong to a school of five and we go about the streets doing pyramids bending juggling and la perche i have been at acrobatting for these thirty-five years in london and all parts of england as well as on the continent in france and germany as well as in denmark and sweden but only in the principal towns such as copenhagen and stockholm but only a little for we come back by sea almost directly my father was a tumbler and in his days very great and used to be at the theatres and in richardson's show he's acted along with joe grimaldi i don't remember the play it was in but i know he's acted along with him at sadler's wells theatre at the time there was real water there i have heard him talk about it he brought me regular up to the profession and when i first came out i wasn't above two years old and father used to dance me on my hands in risley's style but not like risley i can just recollect being danced in his hands but i can't remember much about it only he used to throw me a somersault with his hand the first time i ever come out by myself was in a piece called snowball when i was introduced in a snowball and i had to do the splits and strides when father first trained me it hurt my back awfully he used to take my legs and stretch them and work them round in their sockets and put them up straight by my side that is what they call being cricked and it's in general done before you eat anything in the morning oh yes i can remember being cricked and it hurt me terrible he put my breast to his breast and then pulled my legs up to my head and knocked him against my head and cheeks about a dozen times it seems like as if your body was broken in two and all your muscles being pulled out like india rubber i worked for my father till i was twelve years of age then i was sold for two years to a man of the name of tag another showman who took me to france he had to pay father five pounds a year and keep me respectable i used to do the same business with him as with father splits and such like and we acted in a piece that was wrote for us in paris called les deux clowns anglais which was produced at the porte saint antoine that must have been about the year eighteen thirty six we were dressed up like two english clowns with our faces painted and all and we were very successful and had plenty of flowers thrown to us there was one barnet burns who was showing in the boulevard and called the new zealand chief who was tattooed all over his body he was very kind to me and made me a good many presents and some of the ladies were kind to me i knew this barnet burns pretty well because my master was drunk all day pretty well and he was the only englishman i had to speak to for i didn't know french i ran away from tag in paris and i went with the frères de boucher rope dancers two brothers who were so called and i had to clown to the rope i stopped with them three years and we went through belgium and holland and done very well with them they was my masters and had a large booth of their own and would engage paraders to stand outside the show to draw the people but they did all the performances themselves and it was mostly at the fairs from them i came to england and began pitching in the street i didn't much like it after being a regular performer i looked upon it as a drop i travelled right down by myself to glasgow fair i kept company with one Wells show only working for myself you see they used to stop in the towns and draw plenty of people and then i'd begin pitching to the crowd i wasn't lonely because i knew plenty of the wild beast chaps and besides i'd done pretty well taking two or three shillings a day and on a saturday and monday generally five or six i had a suit of tights and a pair of twacks with a few spangles on and as soon as the people came round me i began to work 
At Glasgow I got a pound a day, for I went with Mr. Mumford, who had some dancing dolls showing at the bottom of the stone buildings. The fair is a week, and after that one of our chaps wrote to me that there was a job for me if I liked to go over to Ireland and join Mr. Batty, who had a circus there. They used to build wooden circuses in them days, and hadn't tents as now. I stopped a twelve-month with him, and we only went to four towns, and the troop did wonders. Mr. Hughes was the manager for Mr. Batty. There was Herr Hengler, the great rope dancer among the troop, and his brother Alfred, the great rider, as is dead now, for a horse kicked him at Bristol and broke his arm, and he wouldn't have it cut off, and it mortified, and he died. When I left Ireland, I went back to Glasgow, and Mr. David Miller gave the school I had joined an engagement for three months. We had six pounds a week between four of us, besides a benefit, which brought us two pounds each more. Miller had a large penny booth, and had taken about twelve pounds or fourteen pounds a night. There was acting and our performances. Alexander, the lessee of the Theatre Royal, prevented him for having acted as he also did Anderson the Wizard of the North, who had the circus and acted as well, and Mumford, but they won the day. I left Glasgow with another chap, and we went first to Edinburgh, and then to Hamburgh, and then we played at the Tivoli Gardens. I stopped abroad for fourteen years, performing at different places through France and Switzerland, either along with regular companies, or else by ourselves, for there was four on us in schools. After Hamburg, we went to Copenhagen, and then we joined the Brother Prices, or, as they call them there, priests. We only did tumbling and jumping up on each other's shoulders, and dancing the pole on our feet, what is called in French, tronche. From there we joined the Brothers Layman, both Russians they was, who was very clever and used to do the Pierrot, the French clown, dressed all in white for their clown is not like our clown. And they danced the rope and all. The troupe was called the Russian Pantomimists. Then we met her Hengler again, as well as Doulon, the dancer, who was dancing at the Eagle and at the theatres as Harlequin, and Anderson, who was one of the first clowns of the day, and a good comic singer, and an excellent companion, for he could make puns and make poems on everybody in the room. He did, you may recollect, some years ago, throw himself out of winder and killed himself. I read it in the newspapers, and a mate of mine afterwards told me he was crazy and thought he was performing, and said, Hello, old feller, I'm coming, and threw himself out, the same as if he'd been on the stage. In Paris and all over Switzerland, we performed at the fairs when we had no engagements at the regular theatres, or we'd pitch in the streets, just according. In Paris, we was regular stars. There was only me and R blank, and we was engaged for three months with Monsieur Le Comte at his theatre in the Passage Soiseau. It's all children that acts there, and he trains young actors. He's called the physician to the king. Indeed, he is the king's conjurer. I'm very fond of France. Indeed, I first went to school there when I was along with Tag. You see, I never had no schooling in London, for I was so busy that I had no time for learning. I also married in France. My wife was a great bender, used to throw herself backwards on her hands and make the body in a harch. I think she killed herself at it. Indeed, as the doctors tell me, it was nothing else but that. She would keep on doing it when she was in the family way. I've many a time ordered her to give over, but she wouldn't. She was so fond of it for she took a deal of money. She died in childbed at Saint-Malo, poor thing. In France we take a deal more money than in England. You see, they all give. Even a child will give its might. And another thing, anybody on a Sunday may take as much money as will keep him all the week, if they like to work. The most money I ever took in all my life was at Cali, the first Sunday cavalcade after Lent, that is, the Sunday after Mardi Gras. They go out in a cavalcade, dressed up in carnival costume, and beg for the poor. There was me, Dick S. Blank, and Jim C. Blank, and his wife, as danced the Highland Fling, and a chap they calls Polka, who did it when it first came up. 
We pitched about the streets, and we took seven hundred francs, all in halfpence, that is, twenty-eight pounds, on one Sunday. And you mustn't work till after twelve o'clock, that is, grand mass. There were liars and centime and half sous and all kinds of copper money, but very little silver, for the Frenchman can't afford it. But all copper money change into five francs pieces, and it's the same to me. The other chaps didn't like the liars, so I bought them all up. They're like buttonheads and such like, and they said they wouldn't have that bad money, so I got more than my share. For after we had shared, I bought the heap of liars and gave ten francs for the heap, and I think it brought me in sixty francs. But then I had to run about to all the little shops to get five francs pieces. You see, I was the only chap that spoke French, so you see, I'm worth a double share. I always tell the chaps when they come to me that I don't want nothing but my share. But then I says, you're single men, and I'm married, and I must support my children. And so I gets a little out of the hotel expenses, for I charges them a shilling threepence a day, and at the second-rate hotels I can keep them for a shilling. There's three or four schools now want me to take them over to France. They calls me Frenchy because I can talk French and German fluently. That's the name I goes by. I used to go to all the fêtes in Paris along with my troop. We have been four and we have been five in one troop, but our general number is four, for we don't want any more than four, for we can do the three high and the spread, and that's the principal thing. Our music is generally the drum and pipes. We don't take them over with us, but gets Italians to do it. Sometimes we gets a German band of five to come for a share, for you see they can't take money as we can, for our performance will cause children to give, and with them they don't think about it, not being so partial to music. Posturing to this day is called in France le dislocation anglais, and indeed the English fellows is the best in the world at posturing. We can lick them all. I think they eat too much bread, for though meat's so cheap in the south of France, tuppence a pound, yet they don't eat it. They don't eat much potatoes either, and in the south they gives them to the pigs, which used to make me grumble, I'm so fond of them. Chickens too is sevenpence the pair, and you may drink wine at a penny the horn. At saint Cloud fête, we were called les quatre frères anglais, and we used to pitch near the cascade, which was a good place for us. We have shared our thirty shillings each a day, then easy, and a great deal of English money we got then, for the English is more generous out of England. There was the Fête Saint-Germain, and Saint-Denis, and at Versailles too, and we've done pretty well at each, as well as at the Champs-Élysées on the 1st of May, as used to be the Fête Louis-Philippe. On that Fête we were paid by the King, and we had fifty francs a man and plenty to eat and drink on that day, and every poor man in Paris has two pound of sausages and two pounds of bread and two bottles of wine. But we were different from that, you know. We had a déjeuner with fish, flesh and fowl, and a dinner fit for a king, both brought to us in the Champs-Élysées, and as much as ever we liked to drink all day long, the best of wine. We had to perform every alternate half-hour, I was in Paris when Mr. Macready come to Paris. I was engaged with my troop at the Porte Saint-Martin, where we was called the Bedouin Arabs, and had to brown our faces. I went to see him, for I knew one of his actors. He was very good, and a beautiful house there was, splendid. All my other partners they paid. The price was half a guinea to the lowest place. The French people said he was very good, but he was mostly supported by the English that was there. An engagement at the Porte Saint-Martin was a thousand francs a week for five of us, but of course we had to leave the streets alone during the four weeks we was at the theatre. I was in Paris too at the Revolution in 1848, when Louis-Philippe had to run off. I was in bed about two o'clock in the morning when those that began the Revolution was coming round, men armed, and they come into everybody's bedroom and said, You must get up, you're wanted. I told them I was English, and they said, It don't matter, you get your living here, and you must fight the same as we fight for our liberty. They took us, four English, as was in the same gang as I was with, to the Barrière du Tron, and made us pick up paving stones. I had to carry them. 
and we formed four barricades right up to the Faubourg Saint Antoine, close to the Bastille. We had sometimes a bit of bread and a glass of wine or brandy, and we was four nights and three days working. There was a great deal of chaff going on, and they called me le petit supplié, posture, you know, but they was of all countries. We was put in the background and didn't fire much, for we was ordered not to fire unless attacked, and we had only to keep our ground, and, if anything come, to give warning. But we had to supply them with the powder and ammunition of one sort and another. There was one woman, a very clever woman, from Normandy, who used to bring us brandy round. She died on the barricade, and there's a song about her now. I was present when part of the throne was burned. After that, I went for a tour in Lorraine, and then I was confined in Tours for 34 days, for the Republicans passed a bill that all foreigners were to be sent home to their own countries, and indeed several manufactories where English worked had to stop, for the workman was sent home. I came back to England in 1852, and I've been pitching in the streets ever since. I've changed gangs two or three times since then, but there's five in our gang now. There's three high for pyramids, and the Arabs hang down, that is, one atop of his shoulders and one hanging down from his neck, and the spread, that's one on the shoulders and one hanging from each hand, and the Hercules, that is, one on the ground supporting himself on his hands and feet, whilst one stands on his knees, another on his shoulders, and the other one atop of them too, on their shoulders. There's loads of tricks like them that we do, that would almost fill up your paper to put down. There's one of our gang dances, an Englishman, whilst the fifth plays the drum and pipes. The dances are mostly comic dances, or, as we call them, comic hops. He throws his legs about and makes faces, and he dresses as a clown. When it's not too windy, we do the perch. We carry a long fur pole about with us, 24 feet long, and Jim the strong man, as they calls me, that is, I, holds the pole up at the bottom. The one that runs up is called the sprite. It's the bottom man that holds the pole that has the dangerous work in La Perche. He's got all to look to. Anybody who has got any courage can run up the pole, but I have to guide and balance it, and the pole weighs some 20 pounds, and the man about 8 stone. When it's windy, it's very awkward, and I have to walk about to keep him steady and balance him. But I'm never frightened, I know it so well. The man who runs up it does such feats as these. For instance, the bottle position, that is, only holding by his feet, with his two arms extended. And then, the hanging down by one toe, with only one foot on the top of the pole, and hanging down with his arms out, swimming on the top of his belly and the horizontal, as it is called, or supporting the body out sideways by the strength of the arms, and such like, winding up with coming down head first. The pole is fixed very tightly in a socket in my waistband, and it takes two men to pull it out, for it gets jammed in, with his force on atop of it. The danger is more with the bottom one than the one atop, though few people would think so. You see, if he falls off... He is sure to light on his feet like a cat, for we are taught to this trick, and a man can jump off a place thirty feet high without hurting himself easy. Now, if the people was to go frontwards, it would be all up with me, because with the leverage and its being fixed so tight to my stomach, there's no help for it, for it would be sure to rip me up and tear out my entrails. I have to keep my eyes about me, for if it goes too far, I could never regain the balance again, but it's easy enough when you're accustomed to it. The one that goes up the pole can always see into the drawing rooms, and he'll tell us where it's good to go and get any money, for he can see the people peeping behind the curtains, and they generally give when they find they are discovered. It's part of his work to glance his eyes about him, and then he calls out whilst he is up, to the right, or the left, as it may be. And although the crowd don't understand him, we do. Our gang generally prefer performing in the West End, because there's more calls there. Gentlemen looking out of windows see us, and call to us to stop and perform. 
but we don't trust to them even, but make a collection when the performance is half over. And if it's good, we continue and make two or three collections during the exhibition. What we consider a good collection is seven shillings or eight shillings. And for that, we do the whole performance. And besides, we get what we call ringings afterwards. That's halfpence that are thrown into the ring. Sometimes we get ten shillings altogether, and sometimes more, and sometimes less. Though it's a very poor pitch if it's not up to five shillings. I'm talking of a big pitch when we go through all our slang, as we say. But then we have our little pitches, which don't last more than a quarter of an hour. Our flying pitches, as we call them. And for them, five shillings is an out-and-outer. And we are well contented if we get half a crown. We usually reckon about twenty pitches a day. That's eight before dinner and twelve after. It depends greatly upon the holidays as to what we makes in the days. If there's any fairs or feasts going on, we do better. There's two days in the week we reckon nothing. That's Friday and Saturday. Friday's little good all day long. And Saturday's only good after six o'clock, when wages have been paid. My share may, on the average, come to this. Monday, about seven shillings or eight shillings. And the same for Tuesday. Then Wednesday and Thursday, it falls off again, perhaps three shillings or four shillings. And Friday ain't worth much. No more is Saturday. We used to go to Sydenham on Saturdays, and we would find the gents there. But now it's getting too late, and the price to the palace is only two shillings sixpence, when it used to be five shillings, and that makes a wonderful difference to us. And yet we like the poor people better than the rich, for it's the halfpence that tells up best. Perhaps we might take a half sovereign, but it's very rare, and since 1853 I don't remember taking more than twenty of them. There was a princess, I'm sure I've forgotten her name, but she was German, and she used to live in Grosvenor Square. She used to give us half a sovereign every Monday during three months she was in London. The servants was ordered to tell us to come every Monday at three o'clock, and we always did. And even though there was nobody looking, we used to play all the same. And as soon as the drum ceased playing, there was the money brought out to us. We continued playing to her till we was told she had gone away. We have also had sovereign calls. When my gang was in the Isle of Wight, Lord Y blank, has often given us a sovereign, and plenty to eat and drink as well. I can't say but what it's as good as a hundred a year to me, but I can't say it's the same with all postures, for you see, I can talk French, and if there's any foreigners in the crowd, I can talk to them, and they are sure to give me something. But most postures make a good living and if they look out for it, there are few but make thirty shillings a week. Posturing, as it is called, some people call it contortionists, that's a new name, a Chinese nondescript, that's the first name it came out as, although what we calls posturing is a man as can sit upon nothing, as, for instance, when he's on the back of two chairs and does a split with his legs stretched out and sitting on nothing like, Posturing is reckoned the healthiest life there is, because we never get the rheumatics. And another thing, we always eat hearty. We often put on wet dresses, such as at a fair, when they've been washed out clean, and we put them on before they're dry, and that's what gives the rheumatism. But we are always in such a perspiration that it never affects us. It's very violent exercise, and at night we feels it in our thighs more than anywhere, so that if it's damp or cold weather, it hurts us to sit down. If it's wet weather or showery, we usually get up stiff in the morning, and then we have to crick each other before we go out, and practice in our bedrooms. On the Sunday, we also go out and practice either in a field or at the Tan in Bermondsey. We used to go to the hops in Maiden Lane, but that's done away with now. When we go out performing, we always take our dresses out with us, and we have our regular houses appointed according to what part of the town we play in, if in London. And we have one pint of beer a man, and put on our costume and leave our clothes behind us. Every morning we put on a clean dress, so we are obliged to have two of them, and whilst we are wearing one, the other is being washed. 
some of our men is married and their wives wash for them but them as isn't give the dress to anybody who wants a job accidents are very rare with posturers we often put our hip bone out but that's soon put right again and we are at work in a week all our bones are loose like and we can pull one another in without having no pulleys one of my gang broke his leg at chatham racecourse through the grass being slippery and he was pitched down from three high but we paid him his share just the same as if he was out with us it wouldn't do if we didn't as a person wouldn't mount in bad weather that man is getting on nicely he walks with a crutch though but he'll be right in another month and then he'll only be put to light work till he's strong he ought not to be walking out yet but he's so daring there's no restraining him i too once broke my arm i am a hand jumper that is i almost always light on my hands when i jump i was on a chair on the top of a table and i had to get into the chair and do what we call the frog and jump off it coming down on my hands everything depends upon how you hold your arms and i was careless and didn't pay attention and my arm snapped just below the elbow i couldn't work for three months i was at beauvais in france at the time but the circus i was with supported me my father's very near seventy-six and he has been a tumbler for fifty years my children are staying with him and he's angry that i won't bring them up to it but i want them to be some trade or another because i don't like the life for them there's so much suffering before they begin tumbling and then there's great temptation to drink and such like i'd sooner send them to school than let them get their living out of the streets i've one boy and two girls they're always at it at home indeed father and my sister-in-law say they can't keep them from it the boy's very nimble in the winter time we generally goes to the theatres we are almost always engaged for the pantomimes to do the sprites we always reckon it a good thirteen weeks job but in the country it's only a month if we don't apply for the job they come after us the sprites in a pantomime is quite a new style and we are the only chaps that can do it the posturers and tumblers in some theatres they find the dresses last winter i was at liverpool and wore a green dress spangled all over which belonged to mr copeland the manager we never speak in the play but just merely rush on and throw somersaults and frogs and such like and then rush off again little wheeler the greatest tumbler of the day was a posturer in the streets and now he's in france doing his ten pounds a week engaged for three years end of section eighteen section nineteen of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part eleven the street risley there is but one person in london who goes about the street doing what is termed the risley performance and even he is rarely to be met with of all the street professionals whom i have seen this man certainly bears off the palm for respectability of attire he wore when he came to me a brown chesterfield coat and black continuations and but for the length of his hair the immense size of his limbs and the peculiar neatness of his movements it would have been impossible to have recognised in him any of those characteristics which usually distinguish the street performer he had a chest which when he chose he could force out almost like a pouter pigeon the upper part of his body was broad and weighty looking he asked me to feel the muscle of his arm and doubling it up a huge lump rose almost as if he had a coconut under his sleeve in fact it seemed as fully developed as the gilt arms placed in signs over the gold-beaters shops like most of the street professionals he volunteered to exhibit before me some of his feats of strength and agility he threw his head back his long hair tossing about like an indian fly-whisk until his head touched his heels and there he stood bent backward and nearly double like a strip of whalebone 
then he promenaded round the room walking on his hands his coat-tails falling about his shoulders and making a rare jingle of halfpence the while and his legs dangling in front of him as limp as the lash of a cart-whip i refused to allow him to experiment upon me and politely declined his obliging offer to raise me from the ground and hold me at arm's length like a babby when he spoke of his parents and the brothers who performed with him he did so in most affectionate terms and his descriptions of the struggles he had gone through in his fixed determination to be a tumbler and how he had worked to gain his parents consent had a peculiarly sorrowful touch about them as if he still blamed himself for the pain he had caused them farther whenever he mentioned his little brothers he always stopped for two or three minutes to explain to me that they were the cleverest lads in london and as true and kind-hearted as they were talented he was more minute in his account of himself than my space will permit him to be for as he said he had a wonderful rememoriation and could recollect anything with the omission of a few interesting details the following is the account of the poor fellow's life my professional name is signor nelsonio but my real one is nelson and my companions know me as lou which is short for lewis i can do plenty of things beside the risley business for it forms only one part of my entertainment i am a strong man and a fire king and a stone-breaker by the fist as well as being sprite and posturer and doing la perche last christmas note eighteen fifty five end note i was along with my two brothers engaged at the theatre royal cheltenham to do the sprites in the pantomime i have brought the bill of the performances with me to show it you here you see the pantomime is called the imp of the north or the golden basin and harlequin and the miller's daughter in the pantomimical transformations it says sprites by the nelson family that's me and my two brothers the reason why i took to the risley business was this when i was a boy of seven i went to school and my father and mother would make me go but unfortunately i was stubborn and would not i said i wanted to do some work well said they you shan't do any work not yet till you're thirteen years old and you shall go to school says i i will do work well i wouldn't so i plays the truant then i goes to amuse myself and i goes to haggerston fields in the hackney road and then i see some boys learning to tumble on some dung there so i began to do it too and i very soon picked up two or three tricks there was a man who was in the profession as tumbler and acrobat who came there to practise his feats and he see me tumbling and says he my lad will you come along with me and do the risley business and i'll buy you your clothes and give you a shilling a week besides i told him that perhaps mother and father wouldn't let me go but says he oh yes they will so he comes to our house and says mother what do you want along with my boy and he says i want to make a tumbler of him but she wouldn't my father is a tailor but my uncle and all the family was good singers my uncle was leader of the drury lane band and miss nelson who came out there is my cousin they are out in australia now doing very well giving concerts day and night and clearing by both performances one hundred and fifty pounds day and night and sooner more than less as advertised in the paper which they sent to us one day instead of going to school i went along with this man into the streets and then he did the risley business throwing me about on his hands and feet i was about thirteen years old then mother asked me at night where i had been and when i said i had been at school she went and asked the master and found me out then i brought home some dresses once and she tore them up so i was forced to drop going out in the streets i made some more dresses and she tore those up 
then i got chucking about ala risley my little brother who's about seven years old and says mother let that boy alone you'll break his neck no i shan't say i and i kept on doing till i had learnt him the tricks one saturday night father and mother and my eldest brother went to a concert room i had no money so i couldn't go i asked my little brother to go along with me round some tap rooms exhibiting with me so i smuggled him out telling him i'd give him lots of cakes and away we went and we got about seven shillings and sixpence i got home before father and mother come home when they returned father says where have you been then i showed the money we had got he was regular astonished and says he how is this you can do nothing you ain't clever i says oh ain't i and it's all my own learning so then he told me that since he couldn't do nothing else with me i should take to it as my profession and stick to it soon after i met my old friend the swallower again in ratcliffe highway i was along with my little brother and both dressed up in tights and spangled trunks says he oh you will take to tumbling will you well then come along with me and we'll go in the country then he took us down to norwich note to yarmouth end note then he beat me and would give me no clothes or money for he spent it to go and get drunk we not sending any money home mother began to wonder what had become of me so one night when this man was out with a lot of girls getting drunk i slipped away and walked thirty miles that night and then i began performing at different public houses and so worked my way till i got back to london again my little brother was along with me but i carried him on my shoulders one day it came on to rain awful and we had run away in our dresses and then we was dripping i was frightened to see little johnny so wet and thought he'd be ill there was no shed or barn or nothing and only the country road so i tore on till we came to a roadside inn and then i wrung his clothes out and i only had fourpence in my pocket and i ordered some rum and water hot and made him drink drink it it'll keep the cold out of you when we got out he was quite giddy and kept saying oh i'm so wet with all these misfortunes i walked carrying the little chap across my shoulders one day i only had a halfpenny and johnny was crying for hunger so i goes to a fellow in an orchard and say i can you make me a halfpenny of apples he would take the money but he gave a capful of fallings i've walked thirty-eight miles in one day carrying him and i was awfully tired on that same day when we got to colchester we put up at the blue anchor and i put johnny into bed and i went out myself and went the round of the public houses my feet was blistered but i had my light tumbling slippers on and i went to work and got sixteen pence halfpenny this got us bread and cheese for supper and breakfast and paid threepence each for the bed and the next day we went and performed in a village and got three shillings then at chelmsford we got eight shillings i bought johnny some clothes for he had only his tights and little trunks and though it was summer he was cold especially after rain the nearer we got to london the better we got off for they give us then plenty to eat and drink and we did pretty well for money after i passed chelmsford i never was hungry again when we got to romford i waited two days till it was market day when we performed before the country people and got plenty of money and beer but i never cared for the beer we took four shillings and sixpence i wouldn't let johnny take any beer for i'm fond of him and he's eleven now and the cleverest little fellow in england and i learnt him everything he knows out of my own head for he never had no master we took the train to london from romford one shilling and sixpence each and then we went home when we got back mother and father said they knew how it would be and laughed at us they wanted to keep us at home but i wouldn't and they was forced to give way in london i stopped still for a long time 
at last got an engagement at two shillings a night at a penny gaff in Shoreditch. It was Sambo, a black man, what went about the streets along with the demon brothers, acrobats, that got me the engagement. One night, father and mother came to see me, and they was frightened to see me chucking my brother about, and she calls out, Oh, don't do that! You'll break his back! The people kept hollering out, Turn that woman out! But she answers, They are my sons! Stop em! When I bent myself backwards, she calls out, Lord, mind your bones! After this, I noticed that my other brother, Sam, was a capital hand at jumping over the chairs and tables. He was as active as a monkey. Indeed, he plays monkeys now at the different ballets that comes out at the chief theatres. It struck me he would make a good tumbler, and sure enough, he is a good one. I asked him, and he said he should, and then he see me perform, and he declared he would be one. He was at my uncle's then as a carver and gilder. When I told father, says he, let em do as they like, they'll get on. I said to him one day, Sam, let's see what you're like. So I stuck him up in his chair and stuck his legs behind his head, and kept him like that for five minutes. His limbs bent beautiful, and he didn't want no crooking. I should tell you that before that, he done this here. You've heard of Baker, the red man, as was performing at the City of London Theatre. Well, Sam see the cut of him sitting in a chair, with his legs folded, just like you fold your arms. So Sam pulls down one of the bills with the drawing on it, and he says, I can do that. And he goes home and practices from the engraving till he was perfect. Then he showed me, and says I, That's the style. It's beautiful. You'll do. Then we had two days' practice together, and we worked the double tricks together. Then I learned him style and grace, what I knowed myself such as coming before an audience and making the obedience. And by and by, says I to him, we'll come out at a theatre and make a good bit of money. Well, we went to another exhibition, and we came out all three together, and our salary was twenty-five shillings a week, and we was very successful. Then we got outside Peter's Theatre at Stepney Fair, the last as ever was, for it's done away with now. We did very well then. They gave us twelve shillings a day between us for three days. We did the acrobatting and drizzly business outside the parade and inside as well. Sam got on wonderful, for his mind was up to it, and he liked the work. I and my brothers can do as well as anyone in this business. I don't care who comes before us. I can do upwards of one hundred and twenty-one different tricks in tumbling when I'm along with those little fellows. We can do the hoops and glasses, putting a glass of beer on my forehead and going through hoops double and lying down and getting up again without spilling it. Then there's the bottle sprite and the short stilts and globe running and globe dancing and chair tricks, perform with the chairs and the pole trick, the perche. With two boys, not one, mind you. We've been continuing ever since at this Risley business. I lay down on a carpet and throw then somersets from feet to feet. I tell you what the music plays to it. It's the railway overtime, and it begins now and then quicker and quicker, till I throw them fast as lightning. Sam does about fifty-four or fifty-five of these somersets, one after another and Johnny does about twenty-five, because he's littler. Then there's standing upright, and stand em one in one hand and one on the other. Then I throws them up in somersets and catch em on my palm, and then I chuck em on the ground. The art with me lying on the ground is that it takes the strength, and the sight, to see that I catch em properly, for if I missed, they might break their necks. The audience fancies that it's most with them tumbling, but everything depends upon me catching them properly. Every time they jump, I have to give them a jerk and turn them properly. It's almost as much work as if I was doing it myself. 
When they learn at first, they do it on a soft ground, so as not to hurt themselves. It don't make the blood come to the head, lying down so long on my back, only at first. I've done the Risley business first at penny exhibitions, and after that I went to fairs. Then I went round the country with a booth, a man named Manley it was, but we dropped that, cause my little brother was knocked up, for it was too hard work for the little fellow, building up and taking down the booth, sometimes twice in a day, and then going off twenty miles further on to another fair, and building up again the next day. Then we went pitching about in the main streets of the towns in the country. Then I always had a drum and pipes. As soon as a crowd collected, I'd say, Gentlemen, I'm from the principal theatres in London, and before I begin, I must have five shillings in the ring. Then we'd do some, and after that, when half was over, I'd say, Now, gentlemen, the better part is to come, and if you make it worth my while, I go on with this here entertainment. Then perhaps they'd give me two shillings more. I've done bad and done good in the country. In one day I've taken two pounds five shillings, and many days we've not taken eight shillings. And there was four of us, me and my two brothers and the drummer, who had two and sixpence a day, and a pot of beer besides. Take one week with another, we took regular two pounds five shillings, and out of that I'd send from twenty to thirty shillings a week home to my parents. Oh, I've been very good to my parents, and I've never missed it. I've been a wild boy too, and yet I've always taken care of mother and father. They've had twelve in family, and never a stain on their character, nor never a key turned on them, but are upright and honourable people. At a place called Brentford in Norfolk, where there's such a lot of wild rabbits, we done so well that we took a room and had bills printed and put out. We charged threepence each, and the room was crowded, for we shared twenty-five shillings between us. When the people seed me and my brothers come on, dressed all in red, and tumble about, they actually swore we were devils, and rushed out of the place, so that, though there was a room full, there was only two stopped to see the performances. One old man called out, Oh, wenches! They call their wives wenches. Come out, they be devils! We came out with red faces and horns and red dresses, and away they went screaming. There was one woman trampled on, and a child knocked out of her arms. In some of these country towns they're shocking strict, and never having seen anything of the kind, they're scared directly. About six months ago, I went to Woolwich with the boys, and there was a chap that wanted to fight me, because I wouldn't go along with him. So I says, we won't have no fighting. So I went along with him to Gravesend, and then we asked permission of the mayor, because in country towns we often have to ask the mayor to let us go performing in the streets. There we done very well, taking twenty-five shillings in the day. Then we worked up by Chatham, and down to Herne Bay and Ramsgate, and at Ramsgate we stopped a week, doing uncommon well on the sands, for the people on the chairs would give sixpence and a shilling, and say it was very clever, and too clever to be in the streets. We did Margate next, and then Deal, and on to Dover by the boat. At Dover the mayor wouldn't let us perform, and said if he catched us in the streets he'd have us took up. We were very hard up. So I said to Sam, you must go out one way and I and Johnny the other and busk in the public house. Sam got eight shillings and sixpence and I four shillings. But I had a row with a sailor and I was bruised and had to lay up. When I was better, we moved to Folkestone. There was the German soldiers there and we did very well. I went out one day with our carpet to a village close by, and some German officers made us perform and gave us five shillings, and then we went the round of the beer shops, and altogether we cleared five pounds before we finished that day. We also went up to the camp where the tents was, and I asked the colonel to let me perform before the men, and he said, well, it ain't usual, 
but you may if you like. The officers we found was so pleased, they kept on giving us two shilling pieces, and besides we had a lot of foreign coin, which we sold to a jeweller for ten shillings. I worked my way on to Canterbury and Winchester, and then by a deal of persuasion I got permission to perform in the back streets, and we done very well. Then we went on to Southampton. There was a cattle fair on. Celsi Fair is, I think, the name of it. And then I joined another troop of tumblers, and we worked the fair, and after that went on to Southampton. And when we began working on the Monday, there was another troop working as well. After we had pitched once or twice, this other troop came and pitched opposition against us. I couldn't believe it at first, but then I see which was their lay. Then says I, now I'll settle this. We was here as it was, and they came right on to us, there as it may be. So it was our dinner time, and we broke up and went off. After dinner we came out again, and pitched the carpet in a square, and they came close to us again, and as soon as they struck up, the people ran away to see the new ones. So I said, I don't want to injure them, but they shan't injure us. So I walked right into the middle of their ring, and threw down the carpet, and says I, Now, ladies and gentlemen, the best performance is the one that deserves best support, and I'll show you what I can do. I went to work with the boys, and was two hours doing all my tumbling tricks. They was regularly stunned. The silver and the halfpence covered the carpet right over, as much as it would hold. I think there was three pounds. Then I says, now you've seen the tumbling, now see the perch. They had a perch too, it was taller than mine, but, as I told them, it was because I couldn't get no higher a one. So I went to work again, and cries I, now, both boys up, though I had only stood one on up to that time, and had never tried two of them. Up they goes, and the first time they come over, but never hurt themselves. It was new to me, you see. Up again, lads, says I, and up they goes, and did it beautiful. The people regular applauded, like at a theatre. Down came the money in a shower, and one gentleman took his hat round and went collecting for us. Says I to this other school, You tried to injure us, and what have you got by it? I beat you in tumbling, and if you can match the perch, do it. Then they says, We didn't try to injure you. Come and drink a gallon of beer. So off we went, and the police told him to choose their side of the town, and we would take ours. That settled the opposition, and we both done well. I've done the Risley in the streets of London, more so than at theatres and concerts. The stone paving don't hurt so much as you would think to lie down. We don't do it when it's muddy. The boys find no difference whatsoever in springing off the stones. It pays very well at times, you know. But we don't like to do it often because afterwards they don't like to appreciate you in concerts and theatres and likewise penny exhibitions. My brother Sam can jump like a frog on his hands, through his legs, out of a one-pair window, and little Johnny throws out of a one-pair of stairs window a back somerset. It's astonishing how free the bones get by practice. My brother Sam can dislocate his limbs and replace them again, and when sleeping in bed I very often find him lying with his legs behind his neck. It's quite accidental and done without knowing and comes natural to him from being always tumbling. Myself, I often in my dreams, often frighten my wife by starting up and half throwing a somersault, fancying I'm at the theatre, and likewise I often lie with my heels against my head. We are the only family, or persons, going about the streets doing the Risley. I've travelled all through England, Scotland and Wales, and I don't know anybody but ourselves. When we perform in the London theatres, which we do when we can get an engagement, we get six or seven pounds a week between us. We've appeared at the Pavilion two seasons running, likewise at the City of London and the Standard, 
and also all the cheap concerts in london then we are called the sprites by the nelson family will appear or the sprites of jupiter or sons of syria or air climbers of arabia taking all the year round i dare say my income comes to about thirty-five shillings or two pounds and out of that i have to find dresses End of section 19. Section 20 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 12. The Strong Man. I have been in the profession for about thirteen years, and I am thirty-two next birthday. Excepting four years that I was at sea, I have been solely by the profession. I am what is termed a strong man, and perform feats of strength and posturing. What is meant by posturing is the distortion of the limbs, such as doing the splits and putting your leg over your head and pulling it down your back a skipping over your leg and such like business tumbling is different from posturing and means throwing somersets and walking on your hands and acrobating means the two together with mounting three stories high and balancing each other these are the definitions i make i was nineteen before i did anything of any note at all and got what i call a living salary long before that i had been trying the business going in and out of these free concerts and trying my hand at it fancying i was very clever but disgusting the audience for they are mostly duffers at these free concerts, which is clearly the case, for they only do it for a pint every now and then, and depend upon passing the hat round after their performance. I never got much at collections, so I must have been a duffer. My father is an architect and builder, and his income now is never less than a thousand a year like a fool i wouldn't go into his office i wish i had i preferred going to sea i was always hankering after first one vessel and then another i used to be fond of going down to the docks and such like and looking at the vessels i'd talk with the sailors about foreign countries and such like and my ambition was to be a sailor i was the scabby sheep of the family and i've been punished for it i never went into the governor's office but when i was about fourteen i was put to a stonemason for i thought i should like to be a carver or something of that sort i was two years there and i should have done very well if i had stayed for i earned a guinea a week when i left before i went to the stonemason i was at the victoria taking checks when there was any i had an uncle there who kept the saloon there i was always very partial to going to the theatre for all our people are chapel people and that i never liked my father's parlour is always smothered with ministers and mine with tumblers and that's the difference i used to go and see my uncle at the vic so as to get to the theatre for nothing i wasn't paid for taking the cheques but i knew the cheque taker and he'd ask me to help him and i was too glad to get inside a theatre to refuse the job they were doing dreadful business it was under levi and before glossop's time it was before the glass curtain come out the glass curtain was a splendid thing it went straight up never wound you can even now see where the roof was hired to receive it levi has got the garrick now they say he's not doing much the first thing i did was at a little beer shop 
corner of Southwark Bridge Road and Union Street. I had seen Herbert do the Grecian statues at the Vic in Hercules' King of Clubs, and it struck me I could do em. So I knew this beer shop, and I bought half a crown's worth of tickets to be allowed to do these statues. It was on a boxing night, I remember. I did them, but they were dreadful bad. The people did certainly applaud, but what for I don't know, for I kept shaking and wobbling so that my marble statue was rather rickety, and there was a strong man in the room who had been performing them, and he came up to me and said that I was a complete duffer, and that I knew nothing about it at all. So I replied that he knew nothing about his feats of strength, and that I'd go and beat him. So I set to work at it, for I was determined to lick him. I got five quarter of hundred weights, and used to practice throwing them at a friend's backyard in the Waterloo Road. I used to make myself all over mud at it, besides having a knock of the head sometimes. At last I got perfect, chucking the quarter hundred, and then I tried a fourteen pound weight onto them, and at last I got up half hundreds. I learnt to hold up one of them at arm's length, and even then I was obliged to push it up with the other hand. I also threw them over my head, as well as catching them by the ring. I went to this beer shop as soon as I could do, and came out. I wasn't so good as he was at lifting, but that was all he could do, and I did posturing with the weights as well, and that licked him. He was awfully jealous, and I had been revenged. I had learnt to do a split holding a half hundred in my teeth, and rising with it without touching the ground with my hands. Now I can lift five, for I've had more practice. I had tremendous success at this beer shop. It hurt me awfully when I learnt to do the split with the weight on my teeth. It strained me all to pieces. I couldn't put my heels to the ground, not nicely, for it physicked my thighs dreadful. When I was hot, I didn't feel it. But as I cooled, I was cramped all to bits. It took me nine months before I could do it without feeling any pain. Another thing I learnt to do at this beer shop was to break the stone on my chest. This man used to do it as well, only in a very slight way, with thin bits and a cobbler's hammer. Now mine is regular flagstones. I've seen as many as twenty women faint seeing me do it. At this beer shop, when I first did it, the stone weighed about three quarters of a hundred and was an inch thick. I laid down on the ground and the stone was put on my chest, and a man with a sledgehammer, twenty-eight pounds weight, struck it and smashed it. The way it is done is this. You rest on your heels and hands and throw your chest up. There you are, like a stool, with the weight on you. When you see the blow coming, you have to give, or it would knock you all to bits. When I was learning to do this, I practised for nine months. I got a friend of mine to hit the stone. One day, I cut my chest open doing it. I wasn't paying attention to the stone, and never noticed that it was hollow, so that when the blow came down, the sharp edges of the stone, from my having nothing but a fleshing suit on, cut right into the flesh and made two deep incisions. I had to leave it off for about a month. Strange to say, this stone breaking never hurt my chest or my breathing. I rather think it has done me good, for I am strong and hearty and never have illness of any sort. The first time I did it, I was dreadful frightened. I knew if I didn't stop still, I should have my brains knocked out pretty well. When I saw the blow coming, I trembled a good bit, but I kept still as I was able. It was a hard blow, for it broke the bit of Yorkshire paving about an inch thick, 
into about sixty pieces. I got very hard up whilst I was performing at this beer shop. I had run away from home, and the performances were only two nights a week, and brought me in about six shillings. I wasn't engaged anywhere else. One night, a Mr. Emmanuel, who had a benefit at the Salmon Saloon, Union Street, asked me to appear at his benefit. He had never seen me, but only heard of my performances. I agreed to go, and he got out the bills, and christened me Signor C. Blank, and he had drawings made of the most extravagant kind, with me holding my arms out with about ten fifty-six pound weights hanging to them by the rings. He had the weights, hammers, and a tremendous big stone chained outside the door, and there used to be mobs of people there all day long looking at it. This was the first success I made. Mr. Emmanuel gave five shillings for the stone, and had it brought up to the saloon by two horses in a cart to make a sensation. It weighed from four to five hundredweight. I think I had such a thing as five men to lift it up for me. I had forgotten all about this engagement, and I was at the coffee-house where I lodged. The fact was, I was in rags, and so shabby I didn't like to go. And if he hadn't come to fetch me, I should not have gone. He drove up in his chaise on the night in question to this coffee-shop, and he says, Signor C. Blank, make haste, go and change your clothes, and come along. I didn't know at first he was speaking to me, for it was the first time I had been Signor C. Blank. Then I told him I had got my best suit on, though it was very ragged, and no mistake about it, for I remember there was a good hole at each elbow. He seemed astonished, and at last proposed that I should wear his greatcoat, but I wouldn't, because, as I told him, his coat would be as well known at the saloon as he himself was, and that it didn't suit me to be seen in another's clothes. So he took me just as I was. When we got there, the landlady was regularly flabbergasted to see a ragged fellow like me come to be star of the night. She'd hardly speak to me. There was a tremendous house, and they had turned above a hundred away. When I got into the saloon, Emmanuel says, What'll you have to drink? I said, Some brandy. But my landlord of the coffee house, who had come unbeknown to me, he grumbles out, Ask him what he'll have to eat, for he's had nothing since the slice of bread and butter for breakfast. I trod on his toe and says, Keep quiet, you fool. Emmanuel behaved like a regular brick, and no mistake. He paid for the supper and everything. I was regularly ashamed when the landlord let it out, though. That supper put life into me, for it almost had the same effect upon me as drink. It soon got whispered about in the saloon that I was the strong man, and everybody got handing me their glasses, so I was regularly tipsy when it was time to go on, and they had put me off to the last on purpose to draw the people and keep them there drinking. I had a regular success. When the women saw the five men put the stone on my chest, they all of them called out, Taunt! Taunt! It was a block, like a curb, about a foot thick, and about four feet six inches long. I went with Emmanuel to buy it. I had never tried such a big one before. It didn't feel so heavy on the chest, for, you see, you've got such out-and-out -out good support on your hands and heels. I've actually seen one man raise a stone and another a wagon. It's the purchase done it. I've lifted up a cart horse right off his legs. The stone broke after six blows with a twenty-eight pound sledgehammer. Then you should have heard the applause. I thought it would never give over. It smashed all to atoms, just like glass. 
and there was the people taking away the bits to keep us a remembrance. As I went out, the landlady asked me to have a bottle of soda water. The landlady was frightened, and told me she had felt sure I should be killed. I was the second that ever done stone-breaking in England or abroad, and I'm the first that ever did such a big one. The landlady was so alarmed that she wouldn't engage me, for she said I must be killed one of the nights. Her behaviour was rather different as I went out to when I came in. I of course didn't go on in my rags. I had a first-rate stage dress. After this grand appearance, I got engaged at Gravesend Fair by Middleton, and there I had eight shillings a day, and I stopped with him three weeks over the fair. I used to do my performances outside on the parade, never inside. I had to do the stone-breaking about nine or ten times a day. They were middling stones, some larger and some smaller, and the smaller ones about half a hundred weight, I suppose. Any man might bring his stone and hammer and break it himself. The one who struck was generally chosen from the crowd, the biggest chap they could find. I've heard him say to me, Now, old chap, I'll smash you all to bits, so look out. The fact is, the harder they strike, the better for me, for it smashes it at once, and don't keep the people in suspense. It was at Gravesend that I met with my second and last accident. With the cutting off the chest, it is the only one I ever had. The fellow who came up to break the stone was half tipsy and missed his aim, and obliged me by hitting my finger instead of the stone. I said to him, Mind what you are doing, but I popped my hand behind me, and when I got up, I couldn't make out what the people was crying out about till I looked round at my back, and then I was smothered in blood. Middleton said, Good God, what's the matter? And I told him I was hit on the finger. When the cry was given off, All in to begin! I went into a booth close by and had some brandy and got a doctor to strap up the finger, and then I went on with the parade business just the same. It didn't pain me nothing like what I should have thought. It was too hard a knock to pain me much. The only time I felt it was when the doctor dressed it, for it gave me pepper taking the plaster off. I was at Gravesend some time, and I went to work again stonemasoning, and I had a guinea a week and in the evening I used to perform at the Rose Inn. I did just as I liked there. I never charged them anything. I lived in the house, and they never charged me anything. It was a first-rate house. If I wanted five shillings, I'd get it from the landlord. I was there about eleven months, and all that time I lived there and paid nothing. I had a benefit there, and they wouldn't even charge me for printing the bills or cards or anything. It was quite a clear benefit, and every penny taken at the doors was given to me. I charged a shilling admittance, and the room was crowded, and they was even on the stairs standing tiptoe to look at me. I wanted some weights, and asked a butcher to lend them to me, and he says, Lend them to you? Aye, take the machine and all if it'll serve you. I was a great favourite, as you may guess. After Gravesend, I came up to London and went and played the monkey at the Bower Saloon. It was the first time I had done it. There was all the monkey business, jumping over tables and chairs, and all mischievous things, and there was climbing up trees and up two perpendicular ropes. I was dressed in a monkey's dress. It's made of some of their hearth rugs and my face was painted. It's very difficult to paint a monkey's face. I've a great knack that way, and can always manage anything of that sort. From the bower I went on to Portsmouth. I'd got hard up again, for I'd been idle for three months, for I couldn't get any money, and I never appear under price. I walked all the way to Portsmouth, carrying a half hundredweight, 
besides my dress, all the way. I played at the tap rooms on the road. I did pretty middling, earned my living on the road about two shillings a day. When I got to Portsmouth, I did get a job, and a good job it was, only one shilling and sixpence a night, but I thought it better to do that than nothing. I only did comic singing, and I only knew two songs, but I set to and learnt a lot. I am very courageous, and if I can't get my money one way, I will another. With us, if you've got a shilling, you're a fool if you spend that before you have another. I stopped at this public house for two months, and then a man who came from Port Sea, a town close by, came one night, and he asked me what I was doing. He had heard of what I could do, and he offered me two pounds a week to go with him and do the strong business. He kept the Star Inn at Port Sea. I stopped there such a thing as two years, and I did well. I had great success, for the place was crammed every night. For my benefit, Major Wyatt and Captain Holloway gave me their bespeak and permission for the men to come. The admission was sixpence. Half the regiment marched down, and there was no room for the public. I was on the stage for two hours doing my performances. I was tired and fainted away as dead as a hammer after the curtain fell. Among other things, I announced that I should, whilst suspended from the ceiling, lift a horse. I had this horse paraded about the town for a week before my night. There was such a house that numbers of people was turned away, and a comic singer who was performing at a house opposite, he put out an announcement that he too would lift a horse, and when the time came, he brought on a clothes horse. The way I did the horse was this. I was hanging by my ankles, and the horse was on a kind of platform under me. I had two sheets rolled up and tied round the horse like belly bands, and then I passed my arms through them and strained him up. I didn't keep him long in the air, only just lifted him off his legs. In the midst of it, the bandage got off his eyes, and then, what with the music and the applauding, the poor brute got frightened and began plunging. I couldn't manage him at all whilst he was kicking. He got his two hind legs over the orchestra and knocked all the float lights out. They kept roaring, Bring him out! Bring him out! As if they thought I was going to put him under my arm, a thundering big brute. I was afraid he'd crack his knees and I should have to pay for him. The fiddler was rather uneasy, I can tell you, and the people began shifting about. I was frightened, and so I managed to pop part of the sheet over his head, and then I gave a tremendous strain and brought him back again. How the idea of lifting a horse ever came into my head, I don't know. It came in a minute. I had never tried it before. I knew I should have a tremendous purchase. The fact is, I had intended to do a swindle by having lines passed down my dress and for somebody behind to pull the ropes and help me. The town was in an uproar when I announced I should do it. It was at my benefit that I first broke stones with my fist. I don't know whose original notion it was. I was not the first. There's a trick in it. It's done this way. Anybody can do it. You take a cobbler's lapstone, and it's put on a half hundredweight. You must hold it half an inch above. And then the concussion of the fist coming down smashes it all to bits. Anyone can do it. I cleared about eight pounds by my benefit. I was a regular swell in those days. The white coats had just come up, and I had one made with two shilling pieces for buttons, and with polished leather wellingtons I'd walk about the town, the king of the place. I've been down to Manchester performing. I've been, too, to the Standard Theatre, as well as the Victoria and the Marylebone. People won't believe I really do break the stone on my chest. Some ask what I wear under my dress. 
though the fact is that if I had anything hard there, it would just about kill me, for it's by yielding to the blow that I save myself. I actually gammoned one chap that the stones were made of small pieces stuck together with paste, and he offered to give me any sum to tell him what the paste was made of. When I'm engaged for a full performance, I do this. All the weights and the stone and the hammer are ranged in front of the stage. Then I come on dressed in silk tights with a spangled trunk. Then I enter at the back of the stage and first do several feats of posturing, such as skipping through my leg or passing it down my back or splits. Then I take a ladder and mount to the top and stand up on it and hold one leg in my hand, shouldering it, and then I give a spring with the other leg and shoot off to the other side of the stage and squash down with both legs open doing a split. It's a very good trick and always gets around. Then I do a trick with a chair standing on the seat and I take one foot in my hand and make a hoop of the leg, and then hop with one leg through the hoop of the other, and spring over the back and come down in a split on the other side. I never miss this trick, though if the chair happens to be rickety, I may catch the toe, but it doesn't matter much. Then I begin my weight business. I take one half hundred weight and hold it up at arm's length and I also hold it out perpendicularly and bring it up again and swing it two or three times round the head and then throw it up in the air and catch it four or five times running. Not by the ring, as others do, but in the open hand. The next trick is doing the same thing with both hands instead of one, that is, with two weights at the same time. And then after that, I take up a half hundred by the teeth and shouldering the leg at the same, and in that style, I fall down into the splits. Then I raise myself up gradually till I'm upright again. After I'm upright, I place the weight on my forehead and lay down flat on my back with it, never touching with the hands. I take it off when I'm down and place it in my mouth and walk round the stage like a Greenwich pensioner with my feet tucked up like crossing the arms and only using my knees. Then I tie three together and hold them in my mouth and I put one in each hand. Then I stand up with them and support them. It's an awful weight and you can't do much exhibiting with them. When I was at Vauxhall, Yarmouth last year, I hurt my neck very badly in lifting those weights in the mouth. It pulled out the back of my neck, and I was obliged to give over work for months. It forced my head over one shoulder, and then it sunk, as if I'd got a stiff neck. I did nothing to it, and only went to a doctor chap, who made me bathe the neck in hot water, that's all. One of my most curious tricks is what I call the braces trick. It's a thing just like a pair of braces, only instead of a button, there's a half hundred weight at each end, so that there are two behind and two in front. Then I mount on two swinging ropes with a noose at the end, and I stretch out my legs into a split and put a half hundred on each thigh and take up another in my mouth. You may imagine how heavy the weight is when I tell you that I pulled the roof of a place in once at Chelsea. It was an exhibition then. The tiles and all come down and near smothered me. You must understand that in these tricks I have to put the weights on myself and raise them from the ground, and that makes it so difficult. The next and the best and most difficult trick of all is I have a noose close to the ceiling in which I place one of my ankles and I've another loose noose with a hook at the end and I place that on the other ankle. 
two half hundreds are placed on this hook and one in each hand the moment these weights are put on this ankle it pulls my legs right apart so that they form a straight line from the ceiling like a plumb line and my body sticks out at the side horizontally like a t-square sideways i strike an attitude when i have the other weights in my hand and then another half hundred is put in my mouth and i am swung backwards and forwards for about eight or twelve times it don't hurt the ankle because the sling is padded at first it pulls you about and gives you a tremendous ricking after this rope performance i take a half hundred and swing it round about fifty times it goes as rapidly as a wheel and if i was to miss my aim i should knock my brains out i have done it seventy times but that was to take the shine out of an opposition fellow i always wind up with breaking the stone and i don't mind how thick it is so long as it isn't heavy enough to crush me a common curbstone or a yorkshire flag is nothing to me and i've got so accustomed to this trick that once it took thirty blows with a twenty-eight pound sledgehammer to break the stone and i asked for a cigar and smoked it all the while i'll tell you another trick i've done and that's walking on the ceiling of course i daren't do it in the professor sands's style for mine was a dodge professor sands used an air exhausting boot on the model of a fly's foot and it was a legitimate performance indeed he and another man to whom he gave the secret of his boots are the only two who ever did it the chap that came over here wasn't the real sands the fact is well known to the profession that sands killed himself on his benefit night in america after walking on the marble slab in the circus somebody bet him he couldn't do it on any ceiling and he for a wager went to a town hall and done it and the ceiling gave way and he fell and broke his neck the chap that came over here was sand's attendant and he took the name and the boots and came over as professor sands the first who ever walked on the ceiling by a dodge was a man of the name of herman a wizard who wound up his entertainment at the city of london by walking on some planks suspended in the air i was there and at once saw his trick i knew it was a sleight of hand thing i paid great attention and found him out i then went to work in this way i bought two planks about thirteen foot long and an inch thick in these planks i had small traps about two inches long by one inch wide let into the wood and very nicely fitted so that the cracks could not be seen the better to hide the cracks i had the wood painted marble and the blue veins arranged on the cracks these traps were bound on the upper side with iron hooping to strengthen them then i made my boots they were something like chinese boots with a very thick sole made on the principle of the bellows of an accordion these bellows were round about the size of a cheese plate and six inches deep to the sole of the boot i had an iron plate and a square tenter hook riveted in then came the performance there was no net under me and the planks was suspended about twenty feet from the stage i went up the ladder and inserted the hook on one boot into the first trap the sucker to the boot hid the hook and made it appear as if i held by suction the traps were about six inches apart and that gave me a very small step the hooks being square ones tenter hooks i could slip them out easily it had just the same appearance as sands and nobody ever taught me how to do it i did this feat at the albion concert rooms just opposite the effingham saloon i had eighteen shillings a week there for doing it I never did it anywhere else, for it was a bother to carry the planks about with me. 
I did it for a month, every night, three times. One night I fell down. You see, you can never make sure, for if you swung a little, it worked the hook off. I always had a chap walking along under me to catch me, and he broke my fall, so that I didn't hurt myself. I ran up again and did it a second time without an accident. There was a tremendous applause. I think I should have fallen on my hands if the chap hadn't been there. If the Secretary of State hadn't put down the balloon business, I should have made a deal of money. There is danger, of course, but so there is if you're twenty or thirty feet. They do it now fifty feet high, and that's as bad as if you were two hundred or a mile in the air. The only danger is getting giddy from the height, but those who go up are accustomed to it. I sold the ceiling walking trick to another fellow for two pounds after I had done with it, but he couldn't manage it. He thought he was going to do wonders. He took a half hundred weight along with him, but he swung like a pendulum, and down he come. Why, this walking on the ceiling of mine was very near the same as what Harvey Leach did at the Surrey as the gnome fly. He was a tremendous clever fellow. His upper part of the body was very perfectly made, but his legs was so short they weren't more than eighteen inches long. That's why he walked as much on his hands as his legs. That, what is it, at the Egyptian hall, killed him. They'd have made a heap of money at it if it hadn't been discovered. He was in a cage and wonderfully got up. He looked awful. A friend of his comes in and goes up to the cage and says, How are you, old fellow? The thing was blown up in a minute. The place was in an uproar. It killed Harvey Leach, for he took it to heart and died. I reckon Astley's is the worst money for any man. If a fellow wants to be finished up, let him go there. It doesn't pay so well as the cheap concerts, unless a man is a very great star, and they must give him his money. There are six men, including myself, who do the strong business. That's all I'm beware of in London or England. Sometimes they change their names, and comes out as hers or seniors or messieurs, but they are generally the same fellows. Most of our foreigners in England come out of Tower Street. There was a house of call there for professionals of all nations, but that public is done up now, and they mostly go to the Cooper's Arms now. If a strong man properly understands his business and pays attention to his engagements, his average earnings will be about two pounds ten shillings a week. As it is, they now make less than thirty shillings, but they spend it so readily that it doesn't go so far as a working man's pound. There's plenty of people to ask you, what'll you have? But if you're anything of a man, you're obliged to return the compliment at some time. The swells get hold of you. Perhaps a bottle of wine is called for, and then another. Well, then a fellow must be no good if he doesn't pay for the third when it comes. And the day's money don't run to it, and you're in a hole. End of section 20section twenty one of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part thirteen the street juggler the juggler from whom i received the following account was spoken of by his companions and friends as one of the cleverest that ever came out he was at this time performing in the evening at one of the chief saloons on the other side of the water. He certainly appears to have been successful enough when he first appeared in the streets, and the way in which he squandered the amount of money he then made is a constant source of misery to him, 
for he kept exclaiming, in the midst of his narrative, "'Ah, I might have been a gentleman now, if I hadn't been the fool I was then.' As a proof of his talents and success, he assured me that, when Ramo Sami first came out, he not only learned how to do all the Indians' tricks, but also did them so dexterously that when travelling, Sammy has often paid him ten shillings not to perform in the same town with him. He was a short man with iron-grey hair, which had been shaved high upon the temples to allow him to assume the Indian costume. The skin of the face was curiously loose and formed deep lines about the chin, whilst in the cheeks there were dimples, or rather hollows, almost as deep as those on a sofa cushion. He had a singular look, from his eyebrows and eyes being so black. His hands were small and delicate, and when he took up anything, he did it as if he were lifting the cup with the ball under it. "'I am a juggler,' he said, "'but I don't know if that's the right term, for some people call conjurers jugglers, but it's wrong. When I was in Ireland, they called me a manualist." and it was a gentleman wrote the bill out for me. The difference I makes between conjuring and juggling is one's deceiving to the eye, and the other's pleasing to the eye. Yes, that's it. It's dexterity. I dare say I've been at juggling forty years, for I was between fourteen and fifteen when I begun, and I'm fifty-six now. I remember Ramo Sami and all the first process of the art, he was the first as ever I knew, and very good indeed. There was no other to oppose him, and he must have been good then. I suppose I'm the oldest juggler alive. My father was a whitesmith and kept a shop in the Waterloo Road, and I ran away from him. There was a man of the name of Humphreys kept a riding school in the Waterloo Road. There was very few houses there then, only brick fields. Aye, what is the Victoria Theatre now? was then a pin factory and a hatter's. It wasn't open for performance then. And I used to go to this riding school and practice tumbling when the horse dung was thrown out, for I was very ambitious to be a tumbler. When I used to go on this here dung heap, sometimes father would want me to blow the fire or strike for him, and he'd come after me and catch me tumbling and take off his apron and wallop me with it all the way home and the leather strings used to hurt, I can tell you. I first went to work at the pin factory, where the Coburg's built now, and dropped tumbling then. Then I went to a hatter's in Oakley Street, and there I took to tumbling again, and used to get practising on the wool packs. They made the hats then out of wool stuff and hair skins and such like, and you couldn't get a hat then under twenty-five shillings. I couldn't get my heart away from tumbling all the time I was there, for it was set on it. I'd even begin tumbling when I went out on errands, doing handspring and starts up, that's laying on your back and throwing yourself up, and round alls, that's throwing yourself backwards onto your hands and back again to your feet, and walking on my hands. I never let any of the men see me practice. I had to sweep the warehouse up, and all the wool was there, and I used to have a go to myself in the morning, before they was up. The way I got into my professional career was this. I used to have to go and get the men's beer, for I was kept for that. You see, I had to go to the men's homes to fetch their breakfasts, and the dinners, and teas. I wish I had such a place now. The men gave me a shilling a week, and there was twelve of them when in full work, and the master gave me four shilling sixpence. Besides that, they never worked on a Monday, but I was told to fetch their food just the same, so that their wives mightn't know. And I had all their twelve dinners, breakfasts, and so on. I kept about six of the boys there, and anybody might have the victuals that liked, for I've sometimes put them on a post for somebody to find. I was one day going to fetch the men's beer when I meets another boy, and he says, You can't walk on your hands. "'Can't I?' says I, and I puts down the cans, and off I started, and walked on my hands from one end of the street to the other, pretty nigh. Mr. Sanders, the rider, one of the oldest riders that was, before Ducrow's time, for Ducrow was apprentice of his, 
and he allowed Sanders thirty shillings a week for all his lifetime, was passing by, and he see me walking on my hands, and he come up to me and says, My boy, where do you belong to? And I answers, My father. And then he says, Do you think he'd let you come along with me? I told him I'd go and ask, and I ran off, but never went to father, you'll understand. And then, in a minute or two, I came back and said, Father says yes, I may go when I think's proper. And then Mr. Sanders took me to Locke's Fields, and there was a gig, and he drove me down to Ware, in Hertfordshire. You may as well say this here. The circuses at that time wasn't as they are now. They used to call it in the profession moulding, and the public termed it mountebanking. Moulding was making a ring in a field, for there was no booths then, and it comes from digging up the mould to make it soft for the horse's feet. There was no charge for seeing the exhibition, for it was in a field open to the public, but it was worked in this way. There was prizes given away, and the tickets to the lottery were one shilling each, and most of the people bought them, though they weren't obligated to do so. Sometimes the prizes would be a five-pound note, or a silver watch, maybe, or a sack of flour, or a pig. They used to take the tickets round in a hat, and everybody saw what they drawed. They was all prizes, perhaps a penny ring, but there was no blanks. It was the last night that paid best. The first and second nights, Sanders would give them a first-rate prize, but when the last night came, then a half-crown article was the highest he'd give away, and that helped to draw up. I've knowed him give four pounds or five pounds away, when he'd not taken two pounds. Mr. Sanders put me to tumbling in the ring. I could tumble well before I went with him, for I'd practised on this dung heap and in this hatter's shop. I beat all his apprentices what he had. He didn't give me anything a week, only my keep. But I was glad to run away and be a showman. I was very successful in the ring tumbling, and from that I got to be clever on the stilts and on the slack rope or, as they call it in the profession, the walting rope. When I was ragged, I used to run home again and get some clothes. I've many a time seen him burst out into tears to see me come home so ragged. Ah, he'd say, where have you been now? Tumbling, I suppose. I'd answer, yes, father. And then he'd say, ah, your tumbling will bring you to the gallows. I'd stop with him till he gave me some fresh clothes, and then I'd bolt again. You see, I liked it. I'd go and do it for nothing. Now I dread it, but it's too late, unfortunately. I ran away from Sanders at last and went back to father. One night I went to the theatre, and there I see Ramo Sami doing his juggling, and in a minute I forgot all about the tumbling and only wanted to do as he did. Directly I got home, I got two of the plates and went into a back room and began practising, making it turn round on top of a stick. I broke nearly all the plates in the house doing this. That is, what I didn't break, I cracked. I broke the entire set of a dozen plates, and yet couldn't do it. When mother found all her plates cracked, she said, It's that boy! And I had a good hiding. Then I put on my Sunday suit and bolted away again. I always bolted in my best clothes. I then went about tumbling in the public houses till I had got money enough to have a tin plate made with a deep rim. And with this tin plate I learnt it so that I could afterwards do it with a crockery one. I kept on my tumbling till I got a set of wooden balls turned and I struck brass coffin nails all over them so that they looked like metal when they was up, and I began teaching myself to chuck them. It took a long time learning it, but I was fond of it and determined to do it. I was doing pretty well with my tumbling, making perhaps my three shillings or four shillings a night, so I was pretty well off. Then I got some tin knives made and learnt to throw them, and I bought some iron rings and bound them with red and blue tape to make them look handsome and I learnt to toss them the same as the balls. I practised balancing pipes too. Every time I went into a public house, I'd take a pipe away, 
so it didn't cost me anything. I dare say I was a twelve month before I could juggle well. When I could throw the three balls middling tidy, I used to do them on the stilts, and that was more than ever a man attempted in them days. And yet I was only sixteen or seventeen years of age. I must have been summit then, for I went to Oxford Fair, and there I was on my stilts, chucking my balls in the public streets, and a gentleman came up to me and asked me if I'd take an engagement, and I said, yes, if it was a good un, for I was taking money like smoke, and he agreed to give me a pound a day during the fair. It was a week fair. I had so much money I didn't know what to do with it. I actually went and bought a silk neckerchief for every day in the week, and flash boots and caps, and everything I could see, for I never had so much money as in them days. The master, too, made his share out of me, for he took money like dirt. From Oxford I worked my way over to Ireland. I had got my hand into juggling now, but I kept on with my old apparatus, though I bought a new set in Dublin. I used to have a bag and a bit of carpet, and perform in streets. I had an Indian's dress made, with a long horsehair tail down my back, and white bag trousers trimmed with red like a Turk's, tied right round at the ankles, and a flesh-coloured skull-cap. My coat was what is called a Turkish fly, in red velvet, cut off like a waistcoat, with a peak before and behind. I was a regular swell, and called myself the Indian juggler. I used to perform in the barracks twice a day, morning and evening. I used to make a heap of money. I have taken in one pitch more than a pound. I dare say I've taken three pounds a day, and sometimes more indeed. I've saved a wagon and a booth there, a very nice one. And the wagon cost me fourteen pounds second hand. One of Vickery's it was, a wild beast wagon. I dare say I was six months in Dublin doing first rate. My performances was just the same then as they is now, only I walked on stilts, and they was new then, and did the business. I was the first man ever seed in Ireland, either juggling or on the stilts. I had a drum and pipes, and I used to play them myself. I played any tune, anything, just what I could think of, to draw the crowd together. Then I'd mount the stilts and do what I called a drunken frolic, with a bottle in my hand, tumbling about and pretending to be drunk. Then I'd chuck the balls about, and the knives, and the rings, and twirl the plate. I wound up with the ball, throwing it in the air and catching it in a cup. I didn't do any balancing pipes on my nose, not whilst on the stilts. I used to go out one day on the stilts and one on the ground, to do the balancing. I'd balance pipes, straws, peacock's feathers, and the twirling plate. It took me a long time learning to catch the ball in the cup. I practised in the fields or streets, anywhere. I began by just throwing the ball a yard or two in the air, and then went on gradually. The first I see do the ball was a man of the name of Dusan, who came over with Ramosami. It's a very dangerous feat and even now I'm never safe of it, for the least wind will blow it to the outside and spoil the aim. I broke my nose at derby races. A boy ran across the ring, and the ball, which weighs a quarter of a pound, was coming right on him, and would have fallen on his head and perhaps killed him, and I ran forward to save him, and couldn't take my aim proper, and it fell on my nose and broke it. It bled awfully, and it kept on for near a month, there happened to be a doctor looking on, and he came and plastered it up, and then I chucked the ball up again, for I didn't care what I did in them days, and the strain of its coming down made it burst out again. They actually give me money not to throw the ball up any more. I got near a sovereign in silver, gave me from the grand stand for that accident. At Newcastle I met with another accident with throwing the ball. It came down on my head, and it regularly stunned me so that I fell down. It swelled up, and every minute got bigger, till I almost thought I had a double head, for it felt so heavy I could scarce hold it up. I was obliged to knock off work for a fortnight. In Ireland I used to make the people laugh, to throw up raw potatoes, 
and let them come down on my naked forehead and smash. People give more money when they laugh. No, it never hurt my forehead. It's got hardened, for I never suffered from headaches when I was practising. As you catch the ball in the cup, you are obliged to give, you know, and bend to it, or it would knock the brains out of you pretty well. I never heard of a man killing himself with the ball, and I've only had two accidents. I got married in Ireland, and then I started off with the booth and wagon, and she used to dance, and I'd juggle and balance. We went to the fairs, but it didn't answer, and we lost all, for my wife turned out a very bad sort of woman. She's dead now through drink. I went to the Isle of Man from Ireland. I had practised my wife in the stilts and learnt her how to use them, and we did well there. They never see such a thing in their lives, and we took money like dirt. They christened us the Manx Giants. If my wife had been like my present one, I should be a made gentleman by this time. But she drank away my booth and wagon and horse and all. I saved up about twenty pounds in the Isle of Man, and from there we went to Scotland, and there my wife died through drink. That took away all the money I had saved. We didn't do much in Scotland, only in one particular town, that's Edinburgh, on New Year's Day. We took a good deal of money, two pounds, I think, and we carried coppers about in a stocking with me. I travelled about in England and Wales when I married my second wife. She's a strong woman and lifts seven hundred pounds by the hair of her head. When I got back to London, I hadn't a shilling in my pocket, though my wife was very careful of me. But times got bad and what not. We got a situation at twelve shillings a day and all collections at Stepney Fair, which would sometimes come to a pound and at others thirty shillings, for collections is better than salary any days. That set us up in a little house, which we've got now. I'm too old now to go out regularly in the streets. It tires me too much if I have to appear at a penny theatre in the evening. When I do go out in the streets, I carry a mahogany box with me to put my things out in. I've got three sets of things now, knives, balls and cups. In fact, I never was so well off in apparatus as now, and many of them have been given to me as presents by friends as have gain over performing. Knives and balls and all are very handsome. The balls, some a pound and some two pounds weight, and the knives about a pound and a half. When I'm out performing, I get into all the open places as I can. I goes up the commercial road and pitches at the Mile End Gate, or about Tower Hill, or such like. I'm well known in London, and the police knows me so well they very seldom interfere with me. Sometimes they say, that's not allowed, you know, old man. And I say, I shan't be above two or three minutes. And they say, make haste then, and then I go on with the performance. I think I'm the cleverest juggler out. I can do the pagoda, or the canopy as some calls it. That is a thing like a parasol, balanced by the handle, on my nose, and the sides held up by other sticks, and then with a pea-shooter I blow away the supports. I also do what is called the birds and bush, which is something of the same, only you knock off the birds with a pea-shooter. The birds is only made of cork, but it's very difficult, because you have to take your balance against every bird as falls. Besides, you must be careful the birds don't fall in your eyes, or it would take away your sight and spoil the balance. The birds at back are hardest to knock off, because you have to bend back, and at the same time mind you don't topple the tree off. These are the only feats we perform in balancing, and the juggling is the same now as ever it was, for there ain't been no improvements on the old style as I ever heard on, and I suppose balls and knives and rings will last for a hundred years to come yet. I and my wife are now engaged at the Temple of Mystery in Old Street Road, and it says on the bills that they are at present exhibiting the following new and interesting talent, and then he calls me the renowned Indian juggler, performing his extraordinary feats with cups, balls, daggers, plates, knives, rings, balancing, and so on, and so on. 
After the juggling, I generally has to do conjuring. I does what they call the pile of mags. That is, putting four halfpence on a boy's cap and making them disappear when I say, Presto, fly! Then there's the empty cups and making taters come under em. Or there's bringing a cabbage into an empty hat. There's also making a shilling pass from a gentleman's hand into a nest of boxes, and such like tricks. But it ain't half so hard as juggling, nor anything like the work. I and my missus have five shillings sixpence a night between us, besides a collection among the company, which I reckon, on the average, to be as good as another pound a week, for we made that the last week we performed. I should say there ain't above twenty jugglers in all England. Indeed, I'm sure there ain't, such as goes about pitching in the streets and towns. I know there's only four others besides myself in London, unless some new one has sprung up very lately. You may safely reckon their earnings for the year round at a pound a week, that is, if they stick to juggling. But most of us join some other calling along with juggling, such as the wizard's business and that helps out the gains. Before this year, I used to go down to the seaside in the summer and perform at the watering places. A chap by the name of Gordon is at Ramsgate now. It pays well on the sands, for in two or three hours, according to the tides, we picks up enough for the day. The Street Conjurer I call myself a wizard as well, but that's only the polite term for conjurer. In fact, I should think that wizard meant an astrologer, and more of a fortune teller. I was fifteen years of age when I first began my professional life. Indeed, I opened with Gentleman Cook at the Rotunda in Blackfriars Road, and there I did Jeremiah Stitchum to his Billy Button. My father held a very excellent situation in the customs, and lived at his ease in very affluent circumstances. His library alone was worth two hundred pounds. I was only ten years of age when my father died. He was a very gay man and spent his income to the last penny. He was a very gay man, very gay. After my mother was left a widow, the library was swept off for a year's rent. I was too young to understand its value, and my mother was in too much grief to pay attention to her affairs. Another six months' rent sold up the furniture. We took a small apartment close in the neighbourhood. My mother had no means, and we were left to shift for ourselves. I was a good boy, and determined to get something to do. The first day I went out, I got a situation at four shillings a week to mind the boots outside a bootmaker's shop in Newington Causeway. The very first week I was there, I was discharged, for I fell asleep on my stool at the door, and a boy stole a pair of boots. From there I went to a baker's and had to carry out the bread, and for four years I got different employments, as errand boy or anything. For many years the mall opposite Bedlam was filled with nothing else but shows and show people. All the caravans and swing boats and what not used to assemble there till the next fair was on. They didn't perform there, it was only their resting place. My mother was living close by, and every opportunity I had, I used to associate with the boys belonging to the shows, and then I'd see them practising their tumbling and tricks. I was so fond of this that I got practising with these boys. I'd go and paint my face as clown, and although dressed in my ordinary clothes, I'd go and tumble with the rest of the lads until I could do it as well as they could. I did it for devilment, that's what I call it, and that it was which first made me think of being a professional. From there I heard of a situation to sell oranges, biscuits and ginger beer at the Surrey Theatre. It was under Elson's management. I sold the porter up in the gallery, and I had three halfpence out of every shilling, and I could make one shilling and sixpence a night. But the way I used to do it at the time was this. I went to fetch the beer and then I'd get half a gallon of table beer, and mix it with the porter. And I tell you, I've made such a thing as fifteen shillings of a boxing night. I alone could sell five gallons of a night, but then their pints at that time was tin measures, and little more than half a pint. 
Besides, I'd froth it up. It was threepence a pint, and a wonderful profit it must have been. From there I got behind the scenes as supernumerary, at the time Nelson Lee was manager of the supers. At this time the rotunda in the Blackfriars Road was an hotel kept by a Mr. Ford. Mr. Cook rented certain portions of the building and went to a wonderful expense building a circus there. The history of the rotunda is that at one time it was a museum, and the lecture hall is there to the present day. It's a beautiful building and the pillars are said to be very valuable and made of rice. It's all let to one party, a Frenchman, but he keeps the lecture hall closed. When Cook took the rotunda, I asked him for an engagement, and he complied. I was mad for acting. I met with great success as Jeremiah Stitcham, and the first week he gave me one pound. Cook didn't make a good thing of it. Nobody could get their money, and the circus was closed. Then a Mr. Edwards took it. He was an optician and opened it as a penny exhibition with a magic lantern and a conjurer. Now comes how I became a conjurer. I couldn't tear myself away from the rotunda. I went there and hovered about the door day and night. I wanted to get a situation there. He knew me when I was in the circus and he asked me what I was a-doing of. I said, nothing, sir. Then he offered to give me one of the doorkeeper's places, from ten in the morning till eleven at night, for three shillings a day, and I took it. One day the conjurer that was there didn't come, but they opened the doors just the same, and there was an immense quantity of people waiting there. They couldn't do nothing without the conjurer. He always left his apparatus there of a night in a bag. Well, this Edwards, knowing that I could do a few tricks... He came up to me and asks whether I knew where the wizard lived. I didn't, and Edward says, What am I to do? I shall have to return this money. I shall go mad. I said, I could do a few tricks, and he says, Well, go and do it. The people was making a row, stamping and calling out, Now then, is this here wizard coming? When I went in, I give great satisfaction. I went and did all the tricks, just as the other had done it. At that time it was the custom to say after each performance, Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to inform you that I get no salary here and only have to rely upon your generosity for a collection. When the plate went round, I got one shilling and sixpence. Hello, I said to myself, is this the situation? Then I sold some penny books, explaining how the tricks was done, and I got sixpence more. That was two shillings. I had four shillings a day besides, and they would have sometimes twenty houses of a day, and I have seen thirty. The houses was not always very good. Sometimes we'd perform to seven or to twenty. It all told up. It was at night we did the principal work, crowded upwards of two hundred there. We weren't in the circus, but in the rotunda. I'd make fifteen shillings a night then. I got a permanent engagement then. I made too much money. I went and bought a pack of cards and card boxes and a pea caddy for passing peas from a handkerchief to a vase and linking rings and some tape. That, with tying knots in a silk handkerchief, concluded the whole of my performances. In fact, it was all I knew. My talking helped me immensely, for I could patter well to them, and the other wizard couldn't. I left the rotunda in consequence of the party having other novelties. He had Ambrosini, who done the sticks and string balls, but I was there three or four years, and that's a long time to be at one place. Then I joined a street performer. He used to do the fireproof business, such as eating the link and the burning toe, and so on. Then I manufactured a portable table. It folded up, and I could carry it under my arm. It was as large as an ordinary dressing table. We went in equal shares. I was dressed with ballet shirt and braces, with spangled tights and fleshings. We pulled our coats off when we begun to perform. All the tricks we carried in a bag. The first pitch we made was near Bond Street. He began with his part of the performance whilst I was dressing up the table. It was covered with black velvet with fringe 
and the apparatus ranged on it. After him, I began my performance, and he went round for the knobbings. I did card tricks, such as the sauté le coup with the little finger. It's dividing the pack in half, and then bringing the bottom half to the top, and then, if there's a doubt, you can convey the top card to the bottom again. Or if there's any doubt, you can bring the pack to its original position. It was Lord de Roux's trick. He won heaps of money at it. He had pricked cards. You see, if you prick a card at the corner, card players skin their finger at the end so as to make it sensitive, and they can tell a pricked card in a moment. Besides sauter le coup, I used to do innumerable others, such as telling a named card by throwing a pack in the air and catching the card on a sword point. Then there was telling people's thoughts by the cards. All card tricks are feats of great dexterity and quickness of hand. I never used a false pack of cards. There are some made for amateurs, but professionals never use trick cards. The greatest art is what is termed forcing, that is, making a party take the card you wish him to, and let him try ever so well he will have it, though he's not conscious of it. Another feat of dexterity is slipping the card, that is, slipping it from top, bottom or centre, or placing one or two cards from the top. If you're playing a game at all fours, and you know the ace of clubs is at the bottom, you can slip it one from the top, so that you know your partner opposite has it. These are the only two principal things in card tricks, and if you can do them dexteriously, you can do a great part of a wizard's art. Sauter le coup is the principal thing, and it's done by placing the middle finger in the centre of the pack, and then with the right hand working the change. I can do it with one hand. We did well with pitching in the streets. We take ten shillings of a morning, and then go out in the afternoon again, and take perhaps fifteen shillings of nobbings. The footmen were our best customers in the morning, for they had leisure then. We usually went to the squares and such parts at the West End. This was twenty years ago, and it isn't anything like so good now, in consequence of my partner dying of consumption, brought on, I think, by fire-eating, for he was a very steady young fellow, and not at all given to drink. I was for two years in the streets with the fire-eating, and we made, I should say, such a thing as fifty shillings a week each. Then, you must remember, we could have made more, if we had liked. For some mornings, if we had had a good day before, we wouldn't go out if it was raining, or we had been up late. I next got a situation and went to a waxworks to do conjuring. It was a penny exhibition in the new cut, Lambeth. I had four shillings a day and nobbings, a collection, and what with selling my books, it came to ten shillings a day, for we had never less than ten, and often twenty, performances a day. They had the first dissecting figure there, a Samson, and they took off the cranium and showed the brains, and also the stomach, and showed the intestines. It was the first ever shown in this country, and the maker of it had, so they say, a pension in one hundred pounds a year for having composed it. He was an Italian. We were burnt down at Birmingham, and I lost all my rattle traps. However, the inhabitants made up a subscription which amply repaid me for my loss, and I then came to London, hearing that the Epsom races was on at the time, which I wouldn't have missed Epsom races, not at that time, not for any amount of money, for it was always good to one as three pounds, and I have had as much as seven pounds from one carriage alone. It was Lord Chesterfield's, and each gentleman in it gave us a sov. I went down with three acrobats to Epsom, but they were dealing unfair with me, and there was something that I didn't like going on. I quarrelled with them and joined with another conjurer, and it was on this very occasion we got the seven pounds from one carriage. We both varied in our entertainments, because when I had done my performance, he made a collection, and when he had done, I got the nobbings. We went to Lord Chesterfield's carriage on the hill, and there I did the sovereign trick. My lord, will you oblige me with the temporary loan of a sovereign? Yes, old fellow, what are you going to do with it? I then did passing the sovereign, 
he having marked it first, and then, though he held it tightly, I changed it for a farthing. I did this for Lord Waterford and Lord Waldegrave, and the whole of them in the carriage. I always said, Now, my lord, are you sure you hold it? Yes, old fellow. Now, my lord, if I was to take the sovereign away from you, without you knowing it, wouldn't you say I was perfectly welcome to it? He'd say, Yes, old fellow, go on. Then, when he opened the handkerchief, he had a farthing, and all of them made me a present of the sovereign I had performed with. Then we went to the grand stand, and then, after our performance, they'd throw us halfpence from above. We had our table nicely fitted up. We wouldn't take halfpence. We would collect up the coppers, perhaps, five or six shillings worth, and then we'd throw the great handful among the boys. A bit of silver, your honours, if you please. Then sixpence would come, and then a shilling, and in ten minutes we would have a sovereign. We must have earned our six pounds each that Epsom day, but then our expenses were heavy, for we paid three shillings a night for our lodging alone. It was about this time that I took to busking. I never went into tap rooms, only into parlours, because one parlour would be as good as a dozen tap rooms, and two good parlours a night I was quite satisfied with. My general method was this. If I saw a good company in the parlour, I could tell in a moment whether they were likely to suit me. If they were conversing on politics, it was no good. You might as well attempt to fly. I have many a time gone into a parlour and called for my half quartern of gin and little drop of cold water, and then, when I began my performances, it has been, no, no, we don't want anything of that kind, and there has been my half hour thrown away. The company I like best are jolly-looking men who are sitting silently smoking or reading the paper. I always got the privilege of performing by behaving with civility to my patrons. Some conjurers, when the company ain't agreeable, will say, but I will perform. And then comes a quarrel, and the room is in future forbid to that man. But I, if they objected, always said, very well, gentlemen, I'm much obliged to you all the same. Perhaps another time. Bad tonight, better next night. Then when I came again, some would say, I didn't give you anything the other night, did I? Well, here's a fortney bit, and so on. When I went into a parlour, I usually performed with a big dice, three inches square. I used to go and call for a small drop of gin and water, and put this dice on the seat beside me, as a bit of a draw. Directly I put it down, everybody was looking at it. Then I'd get into conversation with the party next to me, and he'd be sure to say, What the deuce is that? I'd tell him it was a musical box, and he'd be safe to say, Well, I should like to hear it very much. Then I'd offer to perform, if agreeable, to the company. Often the party would offer to name it to the company, and he'd call to the other side of the room, for they all know each other in these parlours. I say, Mr. So-and-so, have you any objection to this gentleman showing us a little amusement? And they are all of them safe to say, not in the least. I'm perfectly agreeable if others are so. And then I'd begin. I'd pull out my cards and card boxes and the bonus genius or the wooden doll and then I'd spread a nice clean cloth, which I always carried with me, on the table and then I'd go to work. I worked the dice by placing it on the top of a hat and with a penknife pretending to make an incision in the crown to let the solid block pass through. It is done by having a tin covering to the solid dice, and the art consists in getting the solid block into the hat without being seen. That's the whole of the trick. I begin by striking the block to show it is solid. Then I place two hats, one on the other, brim to brim. Then I slip the solid dice into the under hat and place the tin covering on the crown of the upper one. Then I ask for a knife and pretend to cut the hat crown the size of the tin can on the top, making a noise by dragging my nail along the hat, which closely resembles cutting with a knife. I've often heard people say, None of that! 
thinking I was cutting their hat. Then I say, Now, gentlemen, if I can pass this dice through the crown into the hat beneath, you'll say it's a very clever deception, because all conjurers acknowledge that they deceive. Indeed, I always say when I perform in parlours, If you can detect me in my deceptions, I shall be very much obliged to you by naming it, for it will make me more careful. But if you can't, the more credit to me. Then I place another tin box over the imitation dice. It fits closely. I say, presto, quick, be gone, and clap my hands three times, and then lift up the tin cases, which are both coloured black inside, and tumble the wooden dice out of the under hat. You see, the whole art consists in passing the solid block unseen into the hat. The old method of giving the order for the things to pass was this. Albri kira muma tosha kokus ko shiver de freak from the margin under the crippling hook. And that's a language. End of section 21. Section 22 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 14. Statement of Another Street Conjurer. In London I had a great quantity of parlours where I was known and allowed to perform. One night I'd take the West End, and another the east end. Sometimes I have done four or five houses of an evening, and I have had to walk miles for that, to Woolwich and back, for instance, or to Edmonton and back, and occasionally I'd only come home with one shilling sixpence. I've also had eight shillings from one parlour only, and then I'd consider that a night's performance, and come home again. I remember one very peculiar circumstance which happened to me whilst I was out busking. There is a house at the bottom of York Street, Westminster, where they wouldn't allow any other conjurer but me. I was very friendly with the landlord, and I went there regularly every week, and I'd invariably take such a thing as two shillings or three shillings out of the room. If I found only a small muster in the parlour, I'd say, I'll come another evening and go off to another parlour in Pimlico. One night the company in the parlour said, after I had been performing, What a pity it is that one of your talent doesn't take a large room somewhere, and we'd patronise you. Why, says the landlord, he can have my large room upstairs if he likes. I agreed to it, and says, Well, gentlemen, we'll have it next Wednesday evening, if you think proper. The landlord didn't tell his wife that there was a performance to take place on the Wednesday evening. When I went to this house to the appointment, there were about thirty assembled. The landlord was out. When we asked the landlady for the room, she wouldn't, and we had all the difficulty in the world before we got the apartment. I wanted a large tablecloth to dress up my stand, for I have, in order to perform some of my tricks, to make a bag with the end of the tablecloth to drop things into. We sent the waiter to ask for this cloth, and says she, I ain't going to lend no conjurer's tablecloths. Then a gentleman says, Oh, nonsense, I'll soon get you a tablecloth. She'll lend me one in a minute. He goes to the bar, but the reply she made was, I am surprised at Mr. W having such a performance up there, and no tablecloth shall you have from me. He came upstairs and said he had been grossly insulted at the bar, and then another gentleman said, Well, this young man shan't be disappointed, and we'll see if we can't find another house down the street, and move it to there, and we'll all go. One went out and came back and said he not only got a very large room and everything required, but the landlord had four friends in the bar who'd join our company. I made altogether about a pound that night, for I made no charge, and it was altogether contribution. None of that company ever returned to that house again, so he lost the whole of his parlour customers. I could never go into that house again, and I really was sorry for the landlord, for it wasn't his fault. 
This is a very good proof that it is to the advantage of landlords to allow respectable performers to visit their parlours. At other times, I have sometimes gone into a parlour and found the customers talking politics. If it was a very good company, and I saw good business, I'd try to break the thread of the discussion by saying when there was a pause in the debate, Gentlemen, would you like to see some of my performances, such as walking round the ceiling with my head down? Then they'd say, Well, that's very curious. Let's see you. Of course, I couldn't do this, and I only said it to attract notice. Then I'd do my card tricks and make a collection, and after that, remark that as the ceiling walking performance was a dangerous one, I must have a sovereign. Of course, they wouldn't give this, and I'd take my leave. One night, in Oxford Street, I met a singer, and he says, Where are you going? I told him I was hunting for a good parlour, and he told me he had just left a good company at such and such a house. I thanked him, and I went there. It was up a long passage, and I entered the room without asking the landlord's permission, and I called for a glass of porter. As soon as I saw the waiter out of the room, I made my appeal to the company. They were all of them agreeable and most happy to see my performances. After I'd done my performance, I went to make a collection, and they said, Oh, certainly not. We thought you'd done it for your own amusement. We never give anything to anybody. I lost one hour of the best time of the night. I said, Very good, gentlemen. I'm satisfied if you are. It was an agreed plan with the landlord, for he came into the room and he says, What, another one? And he seized me by the neck and pushed me out. As soon as I got outside, I met another conjurer, and he asked where I'd been. I thought I'd let him be served the same as I was, so I showed him the house and told him he could make a second, nobbings as we term it. I stopped outside peeping over the glass and presently I see him being pushed out by the landlord as I had been. We had a hearty laugh, and then we started off to Regent Street, to one of our principal houses. But there wasn't a soul in the room. It was a house in a back street, where none but grooms and footmen resort to. But we was determined to have some money that night, as both our families wanted it, both him and me did. Passing a tobacconist's shop in Regent Street, we saw three gents conversing with the lady behind the counter. I told him I'll go in, get a pickwick here, and see if I can't have a performance in the front of this counter. These things only wants an introduction. So I looked at my pickwick and says I, This a pickwick? Why, I swallowed such as these, and I apparently swallowed it. One of them says, You don't mean to say you swallowed it? Certainly I did, sir. I replied, and then he makes me do it again. Then I told them I'd show them something more wonderful still. So I said, have you gentlemen such a thing as a couple of half crowns about you? They gave me the money, and I did the trick of passing the money from hand to hand. I said to them, can you tell me which hand the money's in? Says he, why, anybody can see it's in that one. No, sir, says I. I think not. If it ain't, says he, you may keep em. Then I opened both hands, and they were in neither. And he asked where they was then. So I told him I'd given him them back again, which of course he denied, and appeared much surprised. Then I took em out of his cravat. It's a very clever trick, and appears most surprising, though it's as simple as possible and all done by the way in which you take them out of the cravat, for you keep them panned and have to work them up into the folds. Of course I returned the half-crowns to him, but when I heard him say you may keep them, I did feel comfortable, for that was something to the good. My friend outside was looking through the window, and I could see him rubbing his hands with glee. I got another half-crown out of them, gentlemen, before I'd done with them, for I showed him a trick with some walking sticks which were lying on the counter, and also cut the tape in two, and made it whole again, and such like performances.
when a fellow is on his beam ends as i was then he must keep his eyes about him and have impudence enough for anything or else he may stop and starve the great art is to be able to do tricks with anything that you can easily get hold of if you take up a bit of string from a counter or borrow a couple of shillings off a gentleman your tricks with them startles him much more than if you had taken them out of your own pocket for he sees there's been no preparation i got ten shillings out of these two gents i spoke of and then i and my mate went and busked in a parlour and got five pence more so that we shared five and tuppence halfpenny each i have often made a good deal of money in parlours by showing how i did my little tricks such as cutting the tape and passing the half crowns another thing that people always want to know is the thimble rig trick of course it doesn't matter so much showing how these tricks are done because they depend upon the quickness and dexterity of handling you may know how an artist paints a picture but you mayn't be able to paint one yourself i never practised thimble rigging myself for i never approved of it as a practice i've known lots of fellows who lived by it bless you they did well never sharing less than their four pounds or five pounds every day they worked this is the way it's done they have three thimbles and they put a pea under two of them so that there's only one without the pea the man then begins moving them about and saying out of this one into that one and so on and winds up by offering to lay anything from a shilling to a pound that nobody can tell which thimble the pea is under then he turns round to the crowd and pretends to be pushing them back and whilst he's saying come gentlemen stand more backwarder one of the confederates who is called a button lifts up one of the thimbles with a pea under it and laughs to those around as much as to say we've found it out he shows the pea two or three times and the last time he does so he removes it either by taking it up under his forefinger nail or between his thumb and finger it wants a great deal of practice to do this nicely so as not to be found out when the man turns to the table again the button says i'll bet you a couple of sovereigns i know where the pea is will any gentleman go me halves then if there's any hesitation the man at the table will pretend to be nervous and offer to move the thimbles again but the button will seize him by the arm and shout as if he was in a passion no no none of that it was a fair bet and you shan't touch em he'll then again ask if anybody will go him halves and there's usually somebody flat enough to join him then the stranger is asked to lift up the thimble so that he shouldn't suspect anything and of course there's no pea there he is naturally staggered a bit and another confederate standing by will say calmly i knew you was wrong here's the pea and he lifts up the thimble with the second pea under it if nobody will go shares in the button's bet then he lifts up the thimble and replaces the pea as he does so and of course wins the stake and he takes good care to say as he pockets the sovereign i knew it was there what a fool you was not to stand in the second time they repeat the trick there's sure to be somebody lose his money there used to be a regular pitch for thimble riggers opposite bedlam when the shows used to put up there i saw a brewer's collector lose seven pounds there in less than half an hour he had a bag full of gold and they let him win the three first bets as a draw most of these confederates are fighting men and if a row ensues they're sure to get the best of it a very good place where i used to go busking was at mother emerson's in german street there used to be all sorts of characters there jugglers and singers and all sorts it was a favourite house of the marquis of waterford and he used to use it nearly every night i've seen him buy a pipe of port and draw tumblers off it for anybody that came in for his great delight was to make people drunk he says to mrs emerson how much do you want for that port mother and then he wrote a check for the amount and had it tapped he was a good-hearted fellow was my lord 
If he played any tricks upon you, he'd always square it up. Many a time he's given me half a pint of brandy, saying, That's all you'll get from me. Sometimes I'd say to him, Can I show you a few tricks, my lord? And then when I'd finished, I knew he never gave money if you asked him for it. So I'd let him abuse me and order me out of the house as a humbug. And then just as I'd got to the door, he'd call me back and give me half a sovereign. I've seen him do some wonderful things. I've seen him jump into an old woman's crockery ware basket while she was carrying it along and smash everything. Sometimes he'd get seven or eight cabs and put a lot of fiddlers and other musicians on the roofs and fill them with anybody that liked and then go off in procession round the streets, he driving the first cab as fast as he could and the bands playing as loud as possible. It's wonderful the games he'd be up to. But he always paid handsomely for whatever damage he did. If he swept all the glasses off a counter, there was the money to make him good again. Whenever I did any tricks before him, I took good care not to produce any apparatus that I cared for, or he'd be sure to smash it. One night I hadn't a penny in the world, and at home I knew they wanted food. So I went out to Busk, and I got over in the old Kent Road, and went to a house there called the Green Man. I walked into the parlour, and, though I hadn't a penny in my pocket, I called for four pennorth of rum and water. I put my big dice down upon the table by the side of me, and began sipping my rum. And I could see everybody looking at this dice, and at last, just as I expected, somebody asked what it was. So I says, Gentlemen, I get my living this way, and if you like, I shall be happy to show you a few of my deceptions for your entertainment. They said, Certainly, young man, we are perfectly agreeable. Ah, I thought to myself, Thank heaven that's all right, for I owed for the rum and water, you see, and if they'd refused, I don't know what I should have done. I pulled out my nice clean cloth and laid it upon the table and to work I went. I had only done one or two tricks when in comes the waiter, and directly he sees me he cries out, We don't allow no conjurers or anything of that kind here, and I had to pack up again. When he'd gone, the company said, Go on, young man, it's all right now. So I out with my cloth again. Then in came the landlord, and says he, You've already been told we don't allow none of you conjurer fellows here, and I had to put up a second time. When he'd gone, the gents told me to begin again. I had scarcely spread my cloth when in comes the landlord again in a towering rage and shouts out, What? At it again? Now you be off! So I said, I only did it to oblige the company present, who were agreeable and that I hadn't yet finished my rum and water, which wasn't paid for. Not paid for, says he. No, says I, but I'm waiting here for a friend, and he'll pay for it. You may imagine my feelings, without a penny in my pocket. Don't let me catch you at it again, or I'll give you in charge, says he. Scarcely had he left again when the company began talking about it, and saying it was too bad to stop me. So one of them rings the bell, and when the landlord comes in, he says, Mr. Landlord, this young person has been very civil and conducted himself in a highly respectable manner and has certainly afforded us a great deal of amusement. Now, why should you object to his showing us some tricks? Thank heavens, thought I to myself. I'm saved and the rum will be paid for. The landlord's manner altered all of a sudden and says he, Oh, certainly, gentlemen. Certainly, if it's your wish. I don't mind the young man's being here, though I make it a rule to keep my parlour select. Then I set to work and did all my tricks comfortably, and I made a collection of seven shilling sixpence. Then I rang the bell like a lord, and I put down a shilling to pay for the rum and water, and saying, Gentlemen, I am very much obliged to you for your patronage. To which they replied, Not at all, young man. I walked past the bar to leave. Then the landlord comes up to me and says, shaking his fist and blue in the face with rage, 
If ever I catch you here again, you d-blank rogue, I'll give you to a policeman. So without more ado, I walks round to the other door and enters the parlour again, and tells the company, and they had in the landlord and blowed him well up. This will just show you the risks we have to run when out busking for a living, and what courage is wanted to speculate upon chances. There are very few conjurers out busking now. I don't know above four. One of them has had the best chances in the world of getting on, but he's a very uneducated man, and that has stood in his way, though he's very clever, and perhaps the best hand at the cups and balls of any man in England. For instance, once he was at a nobleman's party giving his entertainment, and he says such a thing as this. You see, my lords and ladies, I have a tater in this hand, and a tater in that. Now I shall pass them into this handkerchief. Of course, the nobleman said to himself, Tater? Handkerchief? Why, who's this feller? You may depend upon it, he was never asked there any more. For everything in a wizard's business depends upon graceful action, and his style of delivery, so that he may make himself agreeable to the company. When a conjurer's out busking, he may reckon upon making his twenty shillings a week, taking the year round. Perhaps some weeks he won't take more than twelve shillings or fifteen shillings, but then at other times he may get six shillings or eight shillings in one parlour alone. And I have taken as much as one pound by teaching gentlemen how to do the tricks I had been performing. I have sometimes walked my twenty miles a day and busked at every parlour I came to, for I never enter tap rooms, and come home with only one shilling sixpence in my pocket. I have been to Edmonton and back, and only earned one shilling, and then perhaps at eleven the same night, when I was nearly done up and quite dispirited with my luck, I have turned into one of the parlours in town, and earned my six shillings in less than an hour, where I had been twelve, only earning one. The Street Fire King, or Salamander This person came to me recommended by one of my street acquaintances as the pluckiest fire-eater going, and that, as he was a little down at heel, he should be happy for a consideration to give me any information I might require in the Salamander line. He was a tall, gaunt man with an absent-looking face, and so pale that his dark eyes looked positively wild. I could not help thinking, as I looked at his bony form, that fire was not the most nutritious food in the world, until the poor fellow explained to me that he had not broken his fast for two days. He gave the following account of himself. My father was a barber, a three-halfpenny one, and doing a good business in Southwark. I used to assist him, lathering up the chins and shaving him, torturing, I called it, I was a very good light hand. You see, you tell a good shaver by the way he holds the razor and the play from the wrist. All our customers were tradesmen and workmen, but father would never shave either coal heavers or fishermen because they always threw down a penny and said there was plenty of penny barbers and they wouldn't give no more. The old man always stuck up for his price to the day of his death. There was a person set up close to him for a penny, and that injured us awful. I was educated at St. George's National and Parochial School, and I was a national lad and wore my own clothes. But the parochials wore the uniform of blue bobtailed coats and a badge on the left side. When they wanted to make an appearance in the gallery of the church on charity sermon days, they used to make all the nationals dress like the parochials, so as to swell the numbers up. I was too fond of entertainments to stick to learning, and I used to step it. Kennington Common was my principal place. I used, too, to go to the outside of the Queen's bench and pick up the racket balls as they was chucked over, and then sell them for three halfpence each. I got promoted from the outside to the inside, for from being always about, 
they took me at threepence a day and gave me a bag of whitening to whiten the racket balls when i used to hop the wag from school i went there which was three times a week which was the regular racket days i used to spend my threepence in damaged fruit have a penn'orth of damaged grapes or plums or have a haperth of wafers from the confectioners ah i've eat thousands and thousands of haperths it's a kind of a paste but they stick like wafers my father's stuck a letter many a time with em they goes at the bottom of the russet fees cake ah rata fees is the word i got so unruly and didn't attend to school so i was turned out and then i went to help father and assist upon the customers i was confined so in the shop that i only stopped there three months and then i run away then i had no home to go to but i found an empty cart situated in red cross street near the borough market and there i slept for five nights then greenwich fair came on i went round the fair and got assisting an artist as was a likeness cutter and had a booth making black profiles i assisted this man in building his booth and he took a great fancy to me and kept me as one of his own he was a shoemaker as well and did that when fair was over i used to fetch his bristles and leather and nuss the child he lived near the kent road and one day as i was going out for the leather i fell upon mother and she solaced me and took me home and then she rigged me out and kept me till i run away again and that was when greenwich fair came on again for i wanted to go back then at the fair i got to be doorsman and grease-pot boy inside a exhibition to let the people out and keep the lamps i got a shilling a day for my attendance during fair time and i travelled with them parties for five months that was peterson's the travelling comedian or what we call a mumming concern when we got to bexley i thought i should like to see a piece called tricks and trials then being performed at the surrey theatre so i cut away and come up to london again there i got employment at a japanner boiling up the stuff i made a little bit of an appearance and then i went home i had learnt three or four comic songs and i used to go singing at concert rooms i was a regular professional i went a-busking at the free concert rooms and then go round with the cap i principally sing the four and nine or the dark arches or the ship's carpenter and the goose club it was at one of these free concert rooms that i first saw a chap fire-eating you see at a free concert room the professionals ain't paid no more do the audience to come in but the performers are allowed to go round with a cap for their remuneration they are the same as the cock and hen clubs this fire-eater was of the name of west and i knowed him afore and he used to ask me to prepare the things for him his performance was he had a link o light in his hand and he used to take pieces off with a fork and eat it then he would get a plate with some sulphur light it place it under his nose and inhale the fumes that rose from it and then he used to eat it with a fork whilst a light after that he'd get a small portion of gunpowder put it in the palm of his hand and get a fusee to answer for a quick match to explode the powder and that concluded the performance only three tricks i was stunned the first time i see him do it but when i come to prepare the things for him i got enlightened into the business when his back was turned i used to sniff at the sulphur on the sly i found it rather hard for the fumes used to get up your head and regular confuse you and lose your memory i kept on the singing at concerts but i practised the fire-eating at home i tried it for the matter of two months before i found the art of it it used to make me very thick in my voice and if i began it before breakfast it used to make you feel ill but i generally began it after meals i tried the link and sulphur till i got perfect in these two it blistered my mouth swallowing the fire but i never burnt myself seriously at it 
After I learnt those, I got travelling again with a man that swallowed a poker, of the name of Yates. One of his tricks was with toe. He'd get some, and then get a frying pan, and he'd put the toe in the fire pan, and he'd get some ground rosin and brimstone together, and put them on top of the toe in the pan. Then, when he'd set light to it, he used to bring it on the outside of the show, and eat it with a knife and fork while I held the pan. I learnt how to do the trick. This was when he had done with it, and I'd take it away. Then I used to eat the portion that was left in the pan, till I became the master of that feat. When I left Yates, I practised again at home, until I was perfect, and then I went about doing the performance myself. The first place that I attempted was at the Fox and Cock, Gray's Inn Lane, and I was engaged there at three shillings a night, and with collections of what people used to throw to me, I'd come away with about seven shillings and sixpence. I was very successful indeed, and I stopped there for about seven months doing the fire business, and I got another job at the same place, for one of the potmen turned dishonest, and the master gave me eight shillings a week to do his work as well. I have continued ever since going to different concert rooms and giving my performances. My general demand for a night's engagement is four shillings and six pennorth of refreshment. When I perform, I usually have a decanter of ale and two glasses upon the table, and after every trick I sit down whilst an overture is being done and wash my mouth out, for it gets very hot. You're obliged to pause a little, for, after tasting one thing, if the palate doesn't recover, you can't tell when the smoke is coming. I wore a regular dress, a kind of scale armour costume, with a red lion on the breast. I do up my moustache with cork and rouge a bit. My tights is brown, with black enamel jackboots. On my head I wears a king's coronet and a ringlet wig bracelets on my wrists, and a red twill petticoat under the armour dress, where it opens on the limps. For my performances, I begin with eating the lighted link, an ordinary one as purchased at oil shops. There's no trick in it, only confidence. It won't burn you in the inside, but if the pitch falls on the outside, of course it will hurt you. If you hold your breath, the moment the lighted piece is put in your mouth, the flame goes out on the instant. Then we squench the flame with spittle. As we takes a bit of link in the mouth, we tucks it on one side of the cheek, as a monkey do with nuts in his pouch. After I have eaten sufficient fire, I take hold of the link and extinguish the lot by putting the burning end in my mouth. Sometimes when I makes a slip and don't put it in careful, it makes your moustache fizz up. I must also mind how I opens my mouth, cause the tar sticks to the lip wherever it touches and pains sadly. This sore on my hand is caused by the melted pitch dropping on my fingers, and the sores is liable to be bad for a week or eight days. I don't spit out my bits of link, I always swallow them. I never did spit them out, for they are very wholesome and keeps you from having any sickness. Whilst I'm getting the next trick ready, I choose them up and eat them. It tastes rather roughish, but not nasty when you're accustomed to it. It's only like having a mouthful of dust, and very wholesome. My next trick is with a piece of toe, with a piece of tape rolled up in the interior. I begin to eat a portion of this toe, plain, not a light till I find a fitting opportunity to place the tape in the mouth. Then I pause for a time, and in the meantime I'm doing a little pantomime business, just like love business, serious, till I get the end of this tape between my teeth, and then I draws it out, supposed to be manufactured in the pit of the stomach. After that, which always goes immensely, I eat some more toe, and inside this toe there is what I call the fireball, that is, a lighted fusee, bound round with tow and placed in the centre of the tow I'm eating, which I introduce at a fitting opportunity. Then I blows out with my breath, 
and that sends out smoke and fire. That there is a very hard trick, for it's according how this here fireball busts. Sometimes it busts on the side, and then it burns all the inside of the mouth, and the next morning you can take out pretty well the inside of your mouth with your finger. But if it busts near the teeth, then it's all right, for there's vent for it. I also makes the smoke and flame, that is, sparks, come down my nose, the same as coming out of a blacksmith's chimney. It makes the eyes water, and there's a tingling, but it don't burn or make you giddy. My next trick is with the brimstone. I have a plate of lighted sulphur, and first inhale the fumes, and then devour it with a fork, and swallow it. As a costermonger said when he saw me do it, I say, old boy, your game ain't all brandy. There's a kind of acid, nasty, sour taste in this feat, and at first it used to make me feel sick, but now I'm used to it, and it don't. When I puts it in my mouth, it clings just like sealing wax, and forms a kind of a dead ash. Of a morning, if I haven't got my breakfast by a certain time, there's a kind of a retching in my stomach, and that's the only inconvenience I feel from swallowing the sulphur for that there feet. The next is, with two sticks of sealing wax and the same plate. They are lit by the gas and dropped on one another till they are bodily alight. Then I borrow either a ring of the company, or a pencil case, or a seal. I set the sealing wax alight with a fork, and I press the impression of whatever article I can get with the tongue, and the seal is passed round to the company. Then I finish eating the burning wax. I always spits that out after when no one's looking. The sealing wax is all right if you get it into the interior of the mouth, but if it is stringy and it falls, you can't get it off without it takes away skin and all. It has a very pleasant taste, and I always prefer the red, as its flavour is the best. Hold your breath and it goes out, but still the heat remains, and you can't get along with that so fast as the sulphur. I often burn myself, especially when I'm bothered in my entertainment, such as any person talking about me close by. Then I listen to him, perhaps, and I'm liable to burn myself. I haven't been able to perform for three weeks after some of my burnings, I never let any of the audience know anything of it, but smother up the pain and go on with my other tricks. The other trick is a feat which I make known to the public as one of Ramo Sammy's, which he used to perform in public houses and tap rooms, and made a deal of money out of. With the same plate and a piece of dry toe placed on it, I have a pepper box with ground rosin and sulphur together. I light the toe, and with a knife and fork, I sit down to it and eat it, and exclaim, This is my light supper. There isn't no holding the breath so much in this trick as in the others. But you must get it into the mouth anyhow. It's like eating a hot beefsteak when you are ravenous. The rosin is apt to drop on the flesh and cause a long blister. You see, we have to eat it with the head up, full-faced and really, without it seen, nobody would believe what I do. There's another feat of exploding the gunpowder. There's two ways of exploding it. This is my way of doing it, though I only does it for my own benefits, and on grand occasions, for it's very dangerous indeed to the frame, for it's sure to destroy the hair of the head, or if anything smothers it, it's liable to shatter a thumb or a limb. I have a man to wait on me for this trick, and he unloops my dress and takes it off, leaving the bare back and arms. Then I get a quarter of a pound of powder, and I has an ounce put on the back part of the neck, in the hollow, and I holds out each arm with an orange in the palm of each hand, with a train along the arms leading up to the neck. Then I turns my back to the audience, and my man fires the gunpowder, and it blew up in a minute, and ran down the train, and blew up that in my hands. I've been pretty lucky with this trick, for it's only been when the powder's got under my bracelets, 
and then it hurts me. I'm obliged to hold the hand up, for if it hangs down, it hurts awful. It looks like a scurvy, and as the new skin forms, the old one falls off. That's the whole of my general performance for concert business, when I go busking at free concerts or outside of shows. I generally get a crown a day at fairs. I never do the gunpowder, but only the toe and the link. I have been engaged at the Flora Gardens and at St. Helena Gardens, Rotherhithe, and then I was Signor Salamander, the great fire king from the East End theatres. At the Eel Pie House, Peckham, I did the terrific flight through the air, coming down a wire surrounded by fireworks. I was called Herr Alma, the flying fiend. There was four scaffold poles placed at the top of the house to form a tower, just large enough for me to lie down on my belly, for the swivels on the rope to be screwed into the cradle round my body. A wire is the best, but they had a rope. On this cradle were places for the fireworks to be put in. I had a helmet of fire on my head, and the three spark cases, they are made with steel filings and throw out sparks, made of Prince of Wales feathers. I had a sceptre in my hand of two serpents, and in their open mouths they put fireballs, and they looked as if they was spitting fiery venom. I had wings too, formed from the ankle to the waist. They was netting and spangled, and well-sized to throw off the fire. I only did this two nights, and I had ten shillings each performance. It's a momentary feeling coming down, a kind of suffocation like, so that you must hold your breath. I had two men to cast me off. There was a gong, first of all, knocked to attract the attention, and then I made my appearance. First, a painted pigeon made of lead is sent down the wire as a pilot. It has movable wings. Then all the fireworks are lighted up, and I come down right through the thickest of them. There's a trap door set in the scene at the end, and two men is there to look after it. As soon as I have passed it, the men shut it, and I dart up against a feather bed. The speed I come down at regularly jams me up against it. But you see, I throw away this sceptre and save myself with my hands a little. I feel fagged for want of breath. It seems like a sudden fright, you know. I sit down for a few minutes and then I'm all right. I'm never afraid of fire. There was a Turner's place that took fire and I saved that house from being burned. He was a friend of mine, the Turner was, and when I was there, the wife thought she heard the children crying and asked me to go up and see what it was. As I went up, I could smell fire worse and worse. And when I got in the room, it was full of smoke, and all the carpet and bed hangings and curtains smouldering. I opened the window, and the fire burst out, so I ups with the carpet and throwed it out of the window, together with the blazing chairs, and I rolled the linen and drapery up and throwed them out. I was as near suffocated as possible. I went and felt the bed, and there was two children near dead from the smoke. I brought them down, and a medical man was called, and he brought them round. I don't reckon no more than two other fire kings in London beside myself. I only know of two, and I should be sure to hear of them if there are more. But they can only do three of the tricks and I have got novelties enough to act for a fortnight, with fresh performances every evening. There's a party in Drury Lane is willing to back me for five, fifteen or twenty pounds against anybody that will come and answer to it, to perform with any other man for cleanness and cleverness, and to show more variety of performance. I'm always at fire-eating, that's how I entirely get my living and I perform five nights out of the six. Thursday night is the only night, as I may say, I am idle. Thursday night, everybody's fagged, that's the saying, got no money. Friday, there's many large firms pays their men on, especially in Bermondsey. I'm out of an engagement now, 
and I don't make more than eleven shillings a week because I'm busking. But when I'm in an engagement, my money stands me about thirty-five shillings a week, putting down the value of the drink as well, that is, what's allowed for refreshment. Summer is the worst time for me, cause people goes to the gardens. In the winter season, I'm always engaged three months out of the six. You might say, if you count the overplus at one time, and minus at other time, that I makes a pound a week. I know what it is to go to the treasury on a Saturday and get my thirty shillings, and I know what it is to have the landlord come with his Hello, hello, here's three weeks due and another week running on. I was very hard up at one time, when I was living in Friar Street, and I used to frequent a house kept by a betting man near the St. George's Surrey Riding School. A man I knew used to supply this betting man with rats. I was at this public house one night when this rat man comes up to me and says he, Hello, my pippin, here, I want you. I want to make a match. Will you kill thirty rats against my dog? So I said, Let me see the dog first. And I looked at his mouth, and he was an old dog. So I says, No, I won't go in for thirty but I don't mind trying at twenty. He wanted to make it twenty-four, but I wouldn't. They put the twenty in the rat pit, and the dog went in first and killed his, and he took a quarter of an hour and two minutes. Then a fresh lot were put in the pit, and I began. My hands were tied behind me. They always make an allowance for a man, so the pit was made closer, for you see a man can't turn round like a dog. I had half the space of the dog. The rats lay in a cluster, and then I picked them off where I wanted them, and bit them between the shoulders. It was when they came to one or two that I had the work, for they cut about. The last one made me remember him, for he gave me a bite, of which I've got the scar now. It festered, and I was obliged to have it cut out. I took Dutch drops for it, and poulticed it by day and I was bad for three weeks. They made a subscription in the room of fifteen shillings for killing these rats. I won the match, and beat the dog by four minutes. The wager was five shillings, which I had. I was at the time so hard up I'd do anything for some money, though as far as that's concerned, I'd go into a pit now if anybody would make it worth my while. End of section 22section 23 of london labour and the london poor volume 3 by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part 15 the snake sword and knife swallower he was quite a young man and judging from his countenance there was nothing that could account for his having taken up so strange a method of gaining his livelihood as that of swallowing snakes. He was very simple in his talk and manner. He readily confessed that the idea did not originate with him, and prided himself only on being the second to take it up. There is no doubt that it was from his being startled by the strangeness and daringness of the act that he was induced to make the essay. He said he saw nothing disgusting in it, that people liked it, that it served him well in his professional engagements, and spoke of the snake in general as a reptile capable of affection, not unpleasant to the eye, and very cleanly in its habits. I swallow snakes, swords and knives. But of course, when I'm engaged at a penny theatre, I'm expected to do more than this, for it would only take a quarter of an hour, and that isn't long enough for them. They call me in the profession a salimentro, and that is what I term myself, though perhaps it's easier to say I'm a swallower. It was a mate of mine that I was with that first put me up to sword and snake swallowing. I copied off him and it took me about three months to learn it. 
I began with a sword first. Of course, not a sharp sword, but one blunt-pointed. And I didn't exactly know how to do it, for there's a trick in it. I see him, and I said, Oh, I shall set up master for myself, and practice until I can do it. At first it turned me, putting it down my throat past my swallow, right down, about eighteen inches. It made my swallow sore, very sore, and I used lemon and sugar to cure it. It was tight at first, and I kept pushing it down further and further. There's one thing, you mustn't cough, and until you're used to it, you want to very bad, and then you must pull it up again. My sword was about three quarters of an inch wide. At first I didn't know the trick of doing it, but I found it out this way. You see, the trick is, you must oil the sword. The best sweet oil, worth fourteen pence a pint. And you put it on with a sponge. Then you understand, if the sword scratches the swallow, it don't make it sore, cause the oil heals it up again. When first I put the sword down, before I oiled it, it used to come up quite slimy. But after the oil, it slips down quite easy, is as clean when it comes up as before it went down. As I told you, we are called at concert rooms where I perform the Salimentro. I think it's French, but I don't know what it is exactly, but that's what I'm called amongst us. The knives are easier to do than the sword, because they are shorter. We put them right down till the handle rests on the mouth. The sword is about 18 inches long, and the knives about 8 inches in the blade. People run away with the idea that you slip the blades down your breast, but I always hold mine right up with the neck bare, and they see it go into the mouth between the teeth. They also fancy it hurts you, but it don't, or what a fool I should be to do it. I don't mean to say it don't hurt you at first, cause it do, for my swallow was very bad, and I couldn't eat anything but liquids for two months whilst I was learning. I cured my swallow whilst I was stretching it with lemon and sugar. I was the second one that ever swallowed a snake. I was about 17 or 18 years old when I learnt it. The first was Clark, as did it. He done very well with it, but he wasn't out no more than two years before me, so he wasn't known much. In the country there is some places where, when you do it, they swear you are the devil and won't have it know how. The snakes I use are about 18 inches long, and you must first cut the stingers out, cause it might hurt you. I always keep two or three by me for my performances. I keep them warm, but the winter kills them. I give them nothing to eat but worms or gentles. I generally keep them in flannel or hay in a box. I've three at home now. When first I began swallowing snakes, they tasted queer, like. They drawed the roof of the mouth a bit. It's a roughish taste. The scales rough you a bit when you draw them up. You see, a snake will go into ever such a little hole, and they are smooth one way. The head of the snake goes about an inch and a half down the throat, and the rest of it continues in the mouth, curled round like. I hold him by the tail, and when I pinch it, he goes right in. You must cut the stinger out or he'll injure you. The tail is slippery, but you nip it with the nails like pinchers. If you was to let him go, he'd go right down. But most snakes will stop at two inches down the swallow and then they bind like a ball in the mouth. I in generally get my snakes by giving little boys hapens to go and catch them in the woods. I get them when I'm pitching in the country. I'll get as many as I can get and bring them up to London for my engagements. When first caught, the snake is slimy, and I have to clean him by scraping him off with the fingernail as clean as I can, and then wiping him with a cloth, and then with another, until he's nice and clean. I have put him down slimy on purpose to taste what it was like. It had a nasty taste with it, very nasty. I give a man a shilling always to cut the stinger out, one that knows all about it, for the stinger is under the tongue. 
It was this Clark I first see swallow a snake. He swallowed it as it was when he caught it, slimy. He said it was nasty. Then he scraped it with his nail and let it crawl between his hands, cleaning itself. When once they are cleaned of the slime, they have no taste. Upon my word, they are clean things, almost like metal. They only lives on worms, and that ain't so nasty. Besides, they never makes no mess in the box, only frothing in the mouth at morning and evening. But I don't know what comes from him, for I ain't a doctor. When I exhibit, I first holds the snake up in the air and pinches the tail to make it curl about and twist round my arm to show that he is alive. Then I holds it above my mouth, and as soon as he sees the hole, in he goes. He goes wavy-like as a ship goes. That's the comparison. You see, a snake will go in at any hole. I always hold my breath whilst his head is in my swallow. When he moves in the swallow, it tickles a little, but it don't make you want to retch. In my opinion, he is more glad to come up than to go down, for it seems to be too hot for him. I keep him down about two minutes. If I breathe or cough, he draws out and curls back again. I think there's artfulness in some of them big snakes, for they seem to know which is the master. I was at Womwell's menagerie of wild beasts for three months, and I had the care of a big snake as thick round as my arm. I wouldn't attempt to put that one down my throat, I can tell you, for I think I might easier have gone down hisn. I had to show it to the people in front of the carriages to draw him in at fair time. I used to hold it up in both hands with my arms in the air. Many a time it curled itself three or four times round my neck and about my body, and it never even so much as squeezed me the least bit. I had the feeding on it, and I used to give it the largest worms I could find. Mr. Womwell has often said to me, it's a dangerous game you're after, and if you don't give the snake plenty of worms and make it like you, it'll nip you some of these times. I'm sure the snake knowed me. I was very partial to it too. It was a fern snake, over spots, called a boa constructor. It never injured me, though I'm told it is uncommon powerful, and can squeege a man up like a sheet of paper, and crack his bones as easy as a lark's. I'm tremendous courageous, nothing frightens me. Indeed, I don't know what it is to be afraid. The one I was speaking of, I have often held up in the air in both hands, and it was more than four yards long, and let it curl round my neck in five or six twirls. It was a boa constructor, and I believe it knowed me, and that's why it didn't hurt me, for I feed him. He had nothing but long great worms, and he grew to know me. My performance with the snake is always very successful. The women is frightened at first, but they always stop to see, and only hide their eyes. There's no danger as long as you keep hold. I generally perform at concert rooms and penny theatres and cheap circuses, and all round the country, such as in the street or at farmhouses or in tap rooms. I have done it in the streets of London too, and then I'm dressed up in fleshing tights, skin dress, and trunks. I carry the snake in a box. When I swallow it, some hollow out, Oh my God, don't do that! But when I'm finished, they say, It's hardly wonderful to be believed, and give money. I generally mix up the sword and snake performances with my other ones, and it's the same in the streets. Sometimes I go out to tap rooms in my everyday dress with the snake in my pocket and a sword. Then I go and offer to show my performance. First, I'll do some tumbling and throw a somerset over a table. Then I takes out the snake and say, Gentlemen, I shall now swallow a live snake. Anybody is at liberty to feel it. I have, according to the company, you know, made such a thing as five shillings or one shilling and sixpence, or whatever it may be, by snake swallowing alone. I'm the only one in London who can swallow a snake. There's nobody else besides me. It requires great courage. I've great courage. 
One night I was sleeping in a barn at a public house called The Globe at Lewis, seven miles from Brighton. A woman who had cut her throat used to haunt the place. Well, I saw her walking about in a long white shroud, the doors opening and shutting before her. A man who was in the room with us jumped up in his bed and cried, Tumblers! I must tell you one thing before you finish, just to prove what tremendous courage I've got. I was out showing the sword and snake swallowing in the country, and I travelled down to near Lewis, which is seven miles from Brighton, and there I put up at a house called the Falcon. We slept in a barn, and at night, when all was asleep except myself, I see a figure all in white come into the room with her throat cut, and her face as white as chalk. I knowed she was an apparition, cause I'd been told the house was haunted by such. Well, in she come, and she stopped and looked at me, seeing that I was awake. The perspiration poured out of me like a shower, but I weren't afeard. I've that courage. I says, God help me, for I knew I'd done no harm as I could call to mind. So I hadn't no fear of ghosts and such like spirits. No, I'm certain it weren't no fancy of mine, cause others see it as well as me. There was a mate in the same room, and he woke up and sees the ghosts, and up he jumps in bed and cries out, Tumblers! Tumblers! Here's a woman haunting us! I told him to lie down and go to sleep, and hold his noise. Then I got out of bed, and it vanished past me, close as could be, as near as I am to this table. The door opened itself to let her out, and then closed again. I didn't feel the air cold like, nor nothing, nor was there any smell or anything. I'm sure I wasn't dreaming, cause I knows pretty well when I'm awake. Besides, the doors kept bouncing open, and then slamming to again, for more than an hour, and woke everybody in the room. This kept on till one o'clock. Yet, you see, though the sweat run down me to that degree I was wetted through, yet I had that courage I could get out of bed to see what the spirit was like. I said, God help me, for I've done no harm as I knows of, and that give me courage. Whilst the Salamentro told me this ghost story, he spoke in a half voice, like that of a nervous believer in such things. When he had finished, he seemed to have something on his mind, for after a moment's silence, he said in a confidential tone, Between ourselves, sir, I'm a Jew. I then asked him if he thought the ghost was aware of it and had visited him on that account, and the following was his reply. Well, it ain't unlikely, for you see, some of our scholars know what to say to the poor things, and they know what to do to rest em. Now perhaps she thought I knew these secrets, but I'm no scholard, for you see, we Jews always carry prayers about with us to keep off evil spirits. That's one reason why I was so bold as to go up to her. Street Clown He was a melancholy-looking man with the sunken eyes and other characteristics of semi-starvation whilst his face was scored with lines and wrinkles, telling of paint and premature age. I saw him performing in the streets with a school of acrobats soon after I had been questioning him, and the readiness and business-like way with which he resumed his professional buffoonery was not a little remarkable. His story was more pathetic than comic, and proved that the life of a street clown is perhaps the most wretched of all existence. Just as he may in the street, his life is literally no joke at home. I have been a clown for sixteen years, he said, having lived totally by it for that time. I was left motherless at two years of age, and my father died when I was nine. He was a carman, and his master took me as a stable boy and I stayed with him until he failed in business. I was then left destitute again, and got employed as a supernumerary at Astley's, at one shilling a night. I was a super some time, and got an insight into theatrical life. I got acquainted too with singing people, and could sing a good song, 
and came out at last on my own account in the streets, in the Jim Crow line. My necessities forced me into a public line, which I am far from liking. I'd pull trucks at one shilling a day, rather than get twelve shillings a week at my business. I've tried to get out of the line. I've got a friend to advertise for me for any situation as groom. I've tried to get into the police, and I've tried other things. But somehow there seems an impossibility to get quit of the street business. Many times I have to play the clown and indulge in all kinds of buffoonery, with a terrible heavy heart. I have travelled very much too, but I never did over well in the profession. At races I may have made ten shillings for two or three days, but that was only occasional. And what is ten shillings to keep a wife and family on, for a month maybe? I have three children, one now only eight weeks old. You can't imagine, sir, what a curse the street business often becomes with its insults and starvations. The day before my wife was confined, I jumped and laboured doing Jim Crow for twelve hours, in the wet too, and earned one shilling and threepence. With this I returned to a home without a bit of coal and with only half a quartern loaf in it. I know it was one shilling and threepence, for I keep a sort of log of my earnings and my expenses. You'll see on it what I've earned as clown, or the funny man, with a party of acrobats since the beginning of this year. He showed me this log, as he called it, which was kept in small figures, on paper folded up as economically as possible. His latest weekly earnings were 12 shillings and sixpence, 1 shilling and tenpence, 7 shillings and sevenpence, 2 shillings and fivepence, 3 shillings and eleven pence halfpenny, 7 shillings and sevenpence halfpenny, 7 shillings and ninepence farthing, 6 shillings and fourpence halfpenny, 10 shillings and tenpence halfpenny, 9 shillings and sevenpence, 6 shillings and a penny halfpenny, 15 shillings and sixpence farthing, 6 shillings and fivepence, 4 shillings and tuppence, 12 shillings and tenpence farthing, 15 shillings and fivepence halfpenny, 14 shillings and fourpence. Against this was set off what the poor man had to expend for his dinner and so on, when out playing the clown, as he was away from home and could not dine with his family. The ciphers intimate the weeks when there was no such expense, or in other words, those which had been passed without dinner. Zero, 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 zero. Two shillings and tuppence halfpenny, three shillings and ninepence farthing, four shillings and tuppence, four shillings and fivepence, five shillings and eightpence farthing, five shillings and elevenpence farthing, four shillings and tenpence halfpenny, two shillings and eightpence three farthings, three shillings and sevenpence three farthings, three shillings and fourpence farthing, six shillings and fivepence farthing, four shillings and sixpence three farthings, four shillings and threepence. This account shows an average of eight shillings and sixpence halfpenny a week as the gross gain, whilst if the expenses be deducted, not quite six shillings remain as the average weekly sum to be taken home to wife and family. I dare say, continued the man, that no persons think more of their dignity than such as are in my way of life. I would rather starve than ask for parochial relief. Many a time I have gone to my labour without breaking my fast and played clown until I could raise dinner. I have to make jokes as clown and could fill a volume with all I knows. He told me several of his jests. They were all of the most venerable kind. As for instance, a horse has ten legs. He has two forelegs and two hind ones. Two fours are eight, and two others are ten. The other jokes were equally puerile, as, Why is the city of Rome, note, he would have it Rome, end note, like a candle wick, because it's in the midst of Greece. Old and young are both of one age, 
your son at twenty is young, and your horse at twenty is old, and so old and young are the same. The dress, he continued, that I wear in the streets, consists of red striped cotton stockings with full trunks dotted red and black. The body, which is dotted like the trunks, fits tight like a woman's gown, and has full sleeves and frills. The wig, or scalp, is made of horse hair, which is sewn onto a white cap, and is in the shape of a cock's comb. My face is painted with dry white lead. I grease my skin first, and then dab the white paint on. Flake white is too dear for us street clowns. After that, I colour my cheeks and mouth with vermilion. I never dress at home. We all dress at public houses. In the street where I lodge, only a very few know what I do for a living. I and my wife both strive to keep the business a secret from our neighbours. My wife does a little washing when able, and often works eight hours for sixpence. I go out at eight in the morning and return at dark. My children hardly know what I do. They see my dresses lying about, but that is all. My eldest is a girl of thirteen. She has seen me dressed at Stepney Fair, where she brought me my tea. I live near there. She laughs when she sees me in my clown's dress, and wants to stay with me. But I would rather see her lay dead before me. And I had two dead in my place at one time, last Whitson Monday was a twelve-month than she should ever belong to my profession. I could see the tears start from the man's eyes as he said this. Frequently, when I am playing the fool in the streets, I feel very sad at heart. I can't help thinking of the bare cupboards at home. But what's that to the world? I've often and often been at home all day when it has been wet, with no food at all, either to give my children or take myself, and have gone out at night to the public houses to sing a comic song or play the funny man for a meal. You may imagine with what feelings for the part. And when I've come home, I've called my children up from their beds to share the loaf I had brought back with me. I know three or more clowns as miserable and bad off as myself. The way in which our profession is ruined is by the stragglers or outsiders, who are often men who are good tradesmen. They take to the clown's business only at holiday or fair time, when there is a little money to be picked up at it, and after that they go back to their own trades. So that, you see, we, who are obliged to continue at it the year through, are deprived of even the little bit of luck we should otherwise have. I know only of another regular street clown in London besides myself. Some schools of acrobats, to be sure, will have a comic character of some kind or other to keep the pitch up, that is, to amuse the people while the money is being collected. But these, in general, are not regular clowns. They are mostly dressed and got up for the occasion. They certainly don't do anything else but the street comic business, but they are not pantomimists by profession. The street clowns generally go out with dancers and tumblers. There are some street clowns to be seen with the jacks and the greens, but they are mostly sweeps who have hired their dress for the two or three days, as the case may be. I think there are three regular clowns in the metropolis, and one of these is not a professional. He never smelt the sawdust, I know, sir. The most that I have known have been shoemakers before taking to the business. When I go out as a street clown, the first thing I do is a comic medley dance, and then after that I crack a few jokes, and that is the whole of my entertainment. The first part of the medley dance is called the Good St. Anthony. I was the first that ever danced the polka in the streets. Then I do a waltz and wind up with a hornpipe. After that, I go through a little burlesque business. I fan myself, and one of the school asks me whether I am out of breath. I answer, no, the breath is out of me. The leading questions for the jokes are all regularly prepared beforehand. The old jokes always go best with our audiences. The older they are, the better for the streets. I know indeed of nothing new in the joking way. 
but even if there was, and it was in any way deep, it would not do for the public thoroughfares. I have read a great deal of punch, but the jokes are nearly all too high there. Indeed, I can't say I think very much of them myself. The principal way in which I've got up my jokes is through associating with other clowns. We don't make our jokes ourselves. In fact, I never knew one clown who did. I must own that the street clowns like a little drop of spirits and occasionally a good deal. They are in a measure obligated to it. I can't fancy a clown being funny on small beer, and I never in all my life knew one who was a teetotaler. I think such a person would be a curious character indeed. Most of the street clowns die in the workhouses. In their old age they are generally very wretched and poverty-stricken. I can't say what I think will be the end of me. I don't think of it, sir. A few minutes afterwards, I saw this man dressed as Jim Crow, with his face blackened, dancing and singing in the streets, as if he was the lightest-hearted fellow in all London. End of section 23《Section 24 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 16. The Penny Gaff Clown. The professional, from whom I elicited my knowledge of Penny Gaff clowning, is known among his companions as Funny Billy. He appeared not a little anxious to uphold the dignity of the Penny Theatre, frequently assuring me that they brought things out there in a style that would astonish some of the big houses. His whole being seemed wrapped up in these cheap dramatic saloons, and he told me wonderful stories of first-class actors at the Effingham or of astonishing performers at the Bower or Rotunda. He was surprised, too, that the names of several of the artistes there were not familiar to me, and frequently pressed me to go and see so-and-so's beadle, or hear so-and-so sing his, Oh, don't I like my father! Besides being a clown, my informant was also an author, and several of the most successful ballets, pantomimes and dramas that of late years have been brought out at the city gaffs have, I was assured, proceeded from his pen. In build, even in his everyday clothes, he greatly resembles a clown, perhaps from the broadness of his chest and high-buttoned waistcoat, or from the shortness and crookedness of his legs. But he was the first I had seen whose form gave any indication of his calling. Since the beginning of this year, 1856, he has given up clowning, and taken to pantalooning instead, for, on last Boxing Day, he informed me, he met with an accident which dislocated his jaw and caused a swelling in his cheek, as if he had an apple inside his mouth. This, he said, he could conceal in his make-up as a pantaloon, but it had ruined him for a clown. His statement was as follows. I'm a clown at Penny Gaff's and the cheap theatres for some of the gaffs are tuppence and thruppence. That's as high as they run. The rotunda in the Blackfriars Road is the largest in London, and that will hold one thousand comfortably seated, and they give two in one evening at one penny, tuppence and thruppence, and a first-class entertainment it is, consisting of a variety of singing and dancing and ballets, from one hour and a half to two hours. There are no penny theatres where speaking is legally allowed, though they do do it to a great extent, and at all of them, at Christmas, a pantomime is played, at which clown and pantaloon speaks. The difference between a penny gaff clown and a fair, or, as we call it, a canvas clown, is this. At the fairs, the principal business is outside on the parade, and there's very little done, seldom more than two scenes, inside. Now, at the penny gaffs, they go through a regular pantomime, consisting of from six to eight scenes, 
with jumps and all complete, as at a regular theatre, so that, to do clown to one of them, you must be equal to those that come out at the regular theatres. And what's more, you must strain every nerve, and what's more still, you may often please at a regular theatre, where you won't go down at all at a penny gaff. The circus clown is as different from a penny gaff clown as a coster is from a tradesman. What made me turn clown was this. I was singing comic songs at the Albion Saloon, Whitechapel, and playing in ballets, and doing the scene painting. Business was none of the best. Mr. Paul Herring, the celebrated clown, was introduced into the company as a draw to play ballets. The ballet which he selected was The Barber and Beadle, and me being the only one who played the old men on the establishment, he selected me to play the beadle to his barber. He complimented me for what I had done when the performance was over, for I had done my uttermost to gain his applause, knowing him to be such a star. And what he said was, I think, deserved. We played together ballets for upwards of nine months, as well as pantomimes, in which I'd done the pantaloon. And we had two clear benefits between us, in which we realised three pounds each on both occasions. Then Mr. Paul Herring was engaged by Mr. Jem Douglas of the Standard to perform with the great clown Mr. Tom Matthews, for it was intended to have two clowns in the piece. He, having to go to the Standard for the Christmas, left about September, and we was without a clown, and it was proposed that I should play the clown. I accepted the offer at a salary of 35 shillings a week under Hector Simpson, the great pantomimist, who was proprietor. This gentleman was well known as the great dog and bear man of Covent Garden, and various other theatres where he played Valentine and Orson with a living bear. He showed me various things that I were deficient in, and with what I knew myself, we went on admiringly well, and I continued at it as clown for upwards of a year, and became a great favourite. I remember clowning last Christmas, note 1856, end note, particularly, for it was a sad year for me, and one of the busiest times I have ever known, I met with my accident then. I was worked to death. First of all, I had to do my rehearsals. Then I had the scene painting to go on with, which occupied me night and day. And what it brought me in was three shillings a day and three shillings a night. The last scene, equal to a pair of flats, was only given to me to do on Christmas Eve to accomplish by the Boxing Day. I got them done by five o'clock on Christmas morning, and then I had to go home and complete my dress. Likewise, my little boys, who was engaged to sing and play in ballets at two shillings a night. And he was only five years old, but very clever at singing, combating, and ballet performing, as also the illustrations of the Grecian statues, which he first done when he was two and a half years old. The pantomime was the original Statue Blanche, as performed by Joe Grimaldi, as Mr Hector Simpson had produced it, for it was under his superintendence at Covent Garden Theatre. Its title was The Statue Blanche, or Harlequin and the Magic Cross. I was very successful on the boxing night, but on the second occasion of my acting in it, I received an accident which laid me up for three months and I was not off my bed for ten weeks. I had previous to this played clown very often, especially on the Saturday evenings, for the Jews, for I was a great favourite with them, so far that I knew they would go far and near to serve me. I had performed in Harlequin Bluebeard and Harlequin Merry Milliners, or the two pair of lovers, and several others, from eight to ten of them, but that was during the summer season but I had never had a chance of coming out at Christmas before, and to me it was quite an event, for there's no doubt I should have prospered in it only for my accident. This accident was occasioned by this. During the comic scene, the scene of the stripping of the child, they allowed an inexperienced person to play the part of the beadle, 
and the doll for the child was stuffed with oak sawdust and weighed twenty-six pounds he took it up by the leg and struck me a blow in the face which dislocated the jawbone and splintered it all to pieces i went through the pantomime with the remnants of the broken jaw still in my face having then four hours to perform for we played sixteen houses that boxing day to upwards of from three to four thousand people and we began at half past eleven in the day and terminated at twelve at night i had met with great approbation the whole of the time and it was a sad event for me it was quite accidental was my accident and of course i bore the man no malice for one but more blamed the manager for letting him come on when i had done that night after my blow i felt very fatigued and my face was very sore i was completely jaw-locked and i imagined i had caught a cold it hurt me awfully every time i closed my teeth but i drowned my feelings in a little brandy and so forth and the next night i resumed my clowning after i had done that evening i found i was so very bad i could hardly move and going home with my wife and children i was obliged to sit down every other yard i took which occupied me very near two hours to do the mile and a quarter i went to bed and never got up again for ten weeks for it brought on fever again ah what i have suffered god and god only knows when the doctor came he said i were under a very severe fever and he thought i had caught a cold and that i had the erysipelas my face being so swollen that it hung on my shoulders as they propped me up with pillows he knew nothing about it he made him bathe my face with poppy heads and wash my mouth out with honey which drove me out of my mind for i was a fortnight deranged my wife told me that whilst i was mad i had behaved very ill to her poor thing for i wouldn't let anybody come near me but her and when she'd come i'd seize her by the hair and fancy she was the man who had broke my jaw and once i near strangled her i was mad you know ah what i suffered then nobody knows through that accident my wife and children has had many a time to go without victuals everything was sold then to keep me from the workhouse even my poor little children's frocks my poor wife saved my life if anybody did for three doctors gave me up i don't believe they knew what i had the teeth was loose but the mouth was closed and i couldn't open it they thought i had an abscess there and they cut me three or four times in the neck to open the gathering at last they found out the jawbone was smashed when i got better the doctor told me he could do nothing for me but give me a letter to dr ferguson at the king's college hospital i went to him and he examined and probed the jaw through the incision under the gland of the neck and then he said he must take the jaw out i said i would consult my friends and hear what they said first and with the idea of such an operation and being so weak i actually fainted down in the passage as i was leaving ah fancy my distress to make such a hit and everybody to compliment me as they did and to see a prospect of almost coining money and then suddenly to be thrown over and be told it was either life or death for me i wouldn't undergo the operation so i went home and here comes fortitude i pulled out the teeth with a pair of cobbler's pincers and cut open my face with a penknife to take out the bits of bone if i hadn't been a prudent sober man i should have died through it there was a friend of mine who was like a brother to me and he stuck to me every inch there was lots of professionals i had supported in their illness and they never come near me only my dear friend and but for him i should have died for he saved up his money to get me port wine and such things many a time i've gone out when i was better to sing comic songs at concerts when i could feel the bits of bone jangling in my mouth but sir i had a wife and family and they wanted food as it was my poor wife had to go to the workhouse to be confined at one time i started off to do away with myself 
I parted with my wife and children and went to say good-bye to my good friend, and it was he who saved my life. If it hadn't been for him, it would have been a gooser with me, for I was prepared to finish all. He walked about with me and reasoned me out of it, and says he, What on earth will become of the wife and the children? I am sufficiently well now to enable me to resume my old occupation, not as clown, but as pantaloon. Altogether, taking it all in all, I was three years as clown, and very successful, and a great favourite with the Jews. My standing salary for comic singing and clown was eighteen shillings a week, but then at Christmas it was always rose to thirty shillings or thirty-five shillings. Then I did the writing and painting, such as the placards for the outside, such as, this saloon is open this evening, and such like, and that, on the average, would bring me in eight shillings a week. There were seven men and three females in my company when we played Harlequin Bluebeard, for that's the one I shall describe to you, and that we played for a considerable time. I was manager at the time, and I always was liked by the company, for I never find them or anything like that, for, you see, I knew that to take sixpence from a poor man was to take a loaf of bread from the children. This pantomime was of my own writing, and I managed the chorus and the dances and all. I painted the scenery, too, and moulded the masks, about six altogether, and then afterwards played clown. All this was included in my salary of eighteen shillings a week, and that was the top price of the company. The first scene was with a cottage on the left hand and with the surrounding country in the back, three rows of water with the distant view of Bluebeard's castle. Enters the lover, he's the harlequin, in a disguise dressed as a Turk. He explains in the pantomime that he should like to make the lady in the cottage his bride, which is Fatima and afterwards Columbine. He goes to the cottage and knocks three times when she appears at the window. She comes out and dances with him. At the end of the dance, the old man comes in to the tune of Roast Beef of Old England. He wears a big mask and is the father to Fatima and afterwards Pantaloon. He drives Lover off stage and is about to take Fatima back to cottage when Castle Gates at back opens and discovers Bluebeard in gondola which crosses the stage in the waters. Bluebeard wears a mask and a tremendous long sword, which takes two men to pull out. He's afterwards clown, and I played the part. Several other gondolas cross stage, and when the last goes off, the chorus begins in the distance and increases as it approaches, and is thus. In fire or in water, in earth or in air, Wake up, old Bluebeard, these good things to share. Wake up, wake up, wake up, old Bluebeard, these good things to share. Then comes Bluebeard's march and enter troops, followed by Shakabak in a hurry. He's Bluebeard's servant. He bears on his shoulder an immense key, which he places in the middle of the stage. He then comes to the front with a scroll which he exhibits, on which is written... Bluebeard comes this very day, a debt of gratitude to pay. Ah, ye needn't trouble, it is all right. He intends to wed Fatima this very night. At which they all become alarmed, and in an immense hurry of music, enters Bluebeard majestically. He sings to the tune of the low back car. When first I saw that lady, as you may plainly see, I thought she was the handsomest girl as ever there could be. Such a cheerful, chubby girl was she, with such a pair of eyes, with such a mouth and such a nose, that she did me so surprise, which made me cry out, Ha! Ha! The lover from the side says, You're no credit to your dada. Then Bluebeard looks round fiercely, and his mask is made with eyes to work with strings. But I shall him surprise when I opens my eyes and he opens a tremendous pair of saucer eyes that talks of my dear dada. 
Then the music goes, ha ha. As he draws his sword into the army of four men, Shakabak gets it on the nose. Then Bluebeard goes direct to the old man and embraces him and shows him a big purse of money. He then goes to the young lady, but she refuses him and says she would sooner wed the young trooper. The old man gets in a rage when enters Demon, unseen by all. He waves over their heads. They then catch hold of hands and dance round the key again to the tune of the roast beef of old England. Then begins a chorus which is thus to the tune of Stony Batter. Round this magic key, gaily let us trudge it, hoping something new will be brought to our Christmas budget. But a song about a key is but a doleful matter, so we'll sing one of our own, and we'll call it Stony Batter. Ritu loo Fairies from the side. Ritu loo Others. Ritu loo loo after dancing round Key, Bluebeard orders two of the troops to seize the girl and carry her to the castle. They then catch hands and begin singing to the tune of Fine Young Bachelors. Here's a jolly lot of us, fine Turkish gentlemen, with plenty of money in our purse, fine Turkish gentlemen, and so on and so on. And the scene closes on this. Then the lover just crosses so as to give time to arrange the back scene. He vows vengeance on Bluebeard. Then, scene opens and discovers a chamber with Fatima on couch, and Demon behind with a large heart, on the scene over which is in illuminated letters, Whosoever this dagger takes, the magic spell of Bluebeard breaks. The large key is placed at the foot of the couch on which she is laying. We don't introduce the haunted chamber scenes, as it would have been too lengthened but it was supposed that she had been there and examined it, and terror had overcome her and she had swooned. That's when the audience sees her. We couldn't do all the story at a penny gaff, it was too long. To return to the plot, enter Fairy, who dances round the stage and sees the heart. She goes and snatches the dagger, then a loud crash, and the key falls to pieces on the stage. I had five shillings given me as a present for that scene, for I had painted the scene all arches, and round every pillar was a serpent with fire coming from the mouth. I produced that pantomime, so that altogether it did not cost thirty shillings, because each man found his own dress, don't you see? After the crash enters Bluebeard. He says the lady has broken the key, and he is about to kill her when enter lover and he has a terrific combat in which they never hit a blow, like a phantom fight, but the lover is about to be struck to the ground when enters Fairy, who speaks these words. Hold, turn and turn is the Yorkshire way. You think ours, now your dog shall have its day. Behold. Then the scene falls and discovers a fairy palace at back with fairies who sing... Come listen, gentle lover, come listen unto me. Be guided by our fairy queen, who gained your liberty. They all look dismayed at one another, and go to the sides, ready for changing their dresses for the comic work. The fairy queen then says, You, the true lover, I think knows no sin, therefore grace our pantomime as harlequin. And turning to the lady, she adds, Nay, young lady, do not pine, but attend him as his faithful Columbine. Turning to Bluebeard, you, Bluebeard, a man of great renown, shall grace our pantomime as Christmas Clown. Then Clown comes forward and cries, Halla! Ha ha ha! Here we are! Shobas is out! That's the Jewish Sunday. And, oh dear, how they used to laugh at that. Then she turns to the old man. You, old man, have been a silly loon. Attend him as slippery, fidgety pantaloon. Then, as she's going off, she says, Ah, I'd almost forgotten. Never mind, it is all right. Demon of the magic key, 
attend a sprite. Then the fairies sing, We fairies dance, we fairies sing, whilst the silver moon is beaming. We fairies dance, we fairies sing, to please our fairy queen. Then there is blue fire, and the scene closes, and the comic business begins. Clown dances first with Harlequin, and at the end of trip hollers out, Ha! Oh, here we are! Then he sings out, each time Harlequin beats him, A! E! I! Pantaloon drops in and gets a blow, Oh! And Clown says, Tuppence! All right, you owe me nothing! I shan't give you no change! Then there's a photography scene. And Clown comes on and says, Here, I say, what shall we do for a living? Then Pantaloon says, We'll become dancing masters. The Clown says, They'll take likenesses. Ah, here's somebody coming. Enter a swell with white ducks. And a blacking boy follows, says, Clean your boots, sir. Clown asks him to clean his. As the boy is beginning, Harlequin bangs him, and he knocks the boy over. Next bang he gets, he hits Pantaloon, and says he did it. Pantaloon says, I never touched you. And Clown replies, Then don't do it again. Then I'd give him a rub up on the smoking mania. I'd say to boy, Here, boy, take this farden to get yourself a pipe of tobacco. Little boys is fond of smoking. And Pantaloon would add, Yes, men's left off. Boy goes off to buy the tobacco and leaves his blacking box, which Clown promises to take care of and clean the boots. He hollows out, Clean your boots! And Pantaloon puts his foot down and gets his toes wrapped. Enter a lady who asks where she can have her portrait taken. Yes, ma'am, over there. Clown steals parcel. When lady is gone, Clown discovers parcel to contain blank cards. This is what he takes the portraits on, and it was at a time when they was all the rage at a shilling. Clown then says he's taking portraits, and makes a camera out of the blacking box. He cuts a hole in the box and sticks the blacking bottle for a lens. Then he places the box on Pantaloon's back for a stand. Then, of course, Clown knocks him over, and he asks what that's for. Why, if you're a stand, what do you fall for? I never see such a stand. Then ladies and gentlemen come in to have their portraits taken, and Clown smears the cards with blacking and gives it and asks a shilling. When they grumble and won't pay, he rubs the blacking in their faces. General row, and the scene changes to a street scene. There's another trip by Harlequin and Columbine, and enters Clown in a hurry with six fish, and he meets Pantaloon. Looky here what I've found. Oh, fair halves. All right, sit down, and you shall have them. Pantaloon declines, and Clown knocks him down, and they begin sharing fish. There's one for you, and one for me. Another one for you, and another for me. Another for you, and another for me. How many have you got? asks Clown. And Pantaloon says, one, two, three. Clown says, no, you've got more than three. Then, taking one up, he asks, How many is that? One. Taking another up, How many's that? Pantaloon exclaims, Two. Clown says, Then two and one is three. And takes up another and asks, How many that is? Pantaloon exclaims, Three. Clown says, Then three and three make six. Clown then counts his own and says, I've only got three. You must give me these three to make me six. That's fair halves. Ain't you satisfied? No! Then take that. And he knocks him over with a fish. The next scene is a public house. The Freemason's Arms, a select club held here. After a trip by Harlequin and Columbine, enters Clown and Pantaloon. Looky here, it's a public house. Let's have half a pint of half and half. Clown hollows, now ramrod, meaning landlord, and he comes on. Why don't you attend to gentlemen? What's your pleasure, sir? Half a pint of half and half for me and my friend. He brings a tumbler, which Harlequin breaks, and it comes in half. 
Hello, cries Clown. This is rum half and half. Here's half for you and half for me. Then they say, I say here's somebody coming. Enter two Freemasons, who give each other the sign by shaking both hands, bumping up against each other, whispering in each other's ear, and going into the public house. Clown then calls the landlord and says he belongs to the club. Landlord asks him for the sign. Clown says he's got it over the door. He then takes Pantaloon and shakes his hands and bumps him and asks if that is the sign. The landlord says, no. Is that it? No, this is. And he gives Clown a spank and he passes it to Pantaloon and knocks him down. That's the sign. Now we've got it between us. Yes, and I've got the best half. Clown says, never mind, we will get in. And he goes to the door and knocks when the club descends and strikes them on the head. Clown then tells Pantaloon to go and knock and he'll watch and see where it comes from. The club comes down again and knocks Pantaloon on the head. But Clown sees from whence it comes and pulls a man in fleshings out of the window. Clown and Pantaloon pursues him round stage and he knocks them both over and jumps through a trap in the window with a bottle on it marked Old Tom and a scroll falls down written Gone to Blazes. Pantaloon follows and flap falls on which is written To be left till called for. Clown is about to follow when gun fires and scroll falls with Dead Letter on it. Pantaloon is bundled out by landlord and others, general row, policemen springing rattles, fireworks and so on. There are from four to five comic scenes like this, but it would take too long to describe them. Besides, we don't do the same scenes every evening, but vary them each night. Then comes the catch, or the dark scene, in which Clown, Pantaloon, Harlequin and Columbine are in the dark and sees one another. Hold, you've done your best with all your might, and we'll give our friends a charge another night. You see, the poetry is always beautifully adapted to ourselves. They're very clever fairies. We in generally finale with that there. We fairies dance, we fairies sing, whilst the silver moon is beaming. We fairies dance, we fairies sing, and we have pleased our fairy queen. Then the bell rings, and the man who keeps order cries out, Pass out! Pass out! The performance generally takes from one hour and a half to an hour and three quarters, and we do three of them a night. It makes the perspiration run off you, and every house I have a wet shirt. The only rest I have is with my boy singing Hot Codlins. When they call for the song, I say, Yes, yes, all right, you shall have them. Only there's a chip of mine will sing it for me. And I introduce my little boy, of four then, to sing. The general pay for clowns at penny exhibitions is averaging from 20 to 25 shillings a week. You can say without exaggeration that there are 20 of these penny exhibitions in London. They always produce a new pantomime at Christmas and all the year round, in summer as well as winter, they bring them out when business is shy for a draw, which they always find them answer. A clown that can please at a penny gaff is capable of giving satisfaction at any theatre, for the audience is a very difficult one to entertain. They have no delicacy in them and will hiss in a moment if anything displeases them. A pantomime at a penny exhibition will run at Christmas three weeks or a month, if very successful, and during that time it's played to upwards of 1,200 persons a night, according to the size of the house, for few penny ones hold more than 400, and that's three times a night. The Rotunda in the Blackfriars Road and the Olympic Circus in the Lower Marsh, Lambeth, do an immense business, for they hold near a 1,000 each, and that's 3,000 spectators the night. When the pantomime is on, we only do a little comic singing before it begins playing. End of section 24。section 25 of London Labour and the London Poor, volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 17. The Canvas Clown. A tall, fine-looking young fellow, with a quantity of dark hair which he wore tucked behind his ears, obliged me with his experience as a clown at the fairs. He came to me dressed in a fashionable palto of a gingerbread colour, which, without being questioned on the subject, he told me he had bought in Petticoat Lane for three shillings. I have seldom seen a finer built youth than this clown, for he was proportioned like a statue. The peculiarity of his face was that, at the junction of the forehead with the nose, there was a rising instead of a hollow, somewhat like that which is seen in Roman antiquities. His face, whilst talking, was entirely without emotion, and he detailed the business outside the show on the parade in a sing-song voice, like a child saying its lesson, and although he often said, this makes him shout with laughter, his own face remained as solemn as a parish clerk's. He furnished me with the following particulars of his life. On and off I've been clowning these twelve year. Previous to that time I have done busking in public houses and comic singing and ballet performing at penny exhibitions as well as parading outside shows at fairs. I've done clowning at near every place at fairs and in the streets along with a school of acrobats and at circuses and at penny gaffs and at the standard and such like. I first commenced some twelve years ago at Enfield Fair it was a travelling concern I was with, the Thespian Temple, or Johnson's Theatre, where I was engaged to parade on the outside as a walking gentleman. There was no clown for the pantomime, for he had disappointed us, and of course they couldn't get on without one. So, to keep the concern going, old Johnson, who knew I was a good tumbler, came up to me and said he had Nanty Vampo, and your nabs must fake it, which means we have no clown and you must do it. So I done the clowning on the parade, and then when I went inside, I'd put on a pair of Turkish trousers and a long cloak and hat and feathers to play Robert, Duke of Normandy in the first piece. You see, the performances consisted of all gag, I don't suppose anybody knows what the words are in the piece. Everybody at a show theatre is expected to do general business, and when you're short of people, as we was at Johnson's, for we played Robert, Duke of Normandy, with three men and two girls, Clown is expected to come on and slip a cloak over his dress and act tragedy in the first piece. We don't make up so heavy for the clown for fairs, only a little dab of red on the cheeks and powder on the face. So we've only just got to wipe off the slop when it's in the way. He looks rather pale, that's all. The dress is hidden by the one we put over it. The plot of Robert, Duke of Normandy, is this. He and his slave, Piccolo, come in, and after a little business between them, all gagging, he says, Slave! Get back to the castle. He answers, Your orders shall be attended to. Then he says, At the peril of your life, and prevent the fair Angeline to escape. That's the first scene. In the second, two of Robert's slaves attack his rival, and then Robert rushes in and pretends to save him. He cries, Hold! Two to one! The men go off, saying, Well, we part as friends. When next we meet, we meet as foes. As soon as Robert leaves the rival, the lady comes in and tells him she is flying from Robert's castle and that Robert has seduced her and seeks her life. She tells him that the man who has just left him is he. It is false, he says. That is my friend, she cries. Test him. But how, he asks. She replies, Follow me to the statue at the bottom of the grove, and then I will tell you. Then the third comes on. Enter Robert and slave, and the marble statue discovered. 
That is, it is supposed to be, but it is only Angeline dressed up. He gives the slave the instructions to put a ring on the finger of the statue, for he is supposed to have dealings with old Nick, and that every time he put a ring on the statue, he can demand a victim. He tells the slave to place a ring on the finger and pronounce these words. When it may please your most gracious majesty to seek your husband to find a victim, you will find him here. No, no, not here, there, pointing to Robert. The duke half draws his sword and exclaims, Slave, what ho, without touching him. Enters the rival, who demands satisfaction of Robert, who says, What can I do to satisfy you? For he's in a juice of a go now. He then tells him to kneel to the statue and swear he is not Robert, Duke of Normandy. Instead of that, he calls to the servant and tells him to put the ring on. But Robert, the Duke, is in a juice of a way, tearing his hair. The servant does it and exclaims, I have done it. But would you believe it? When I placed it on the finger, the finger became collapsed. Robert cries, Slave, thou art a liar. If I find that it is false, I will cleave thee to the earth. Robert examines the finger and exclaims, Alas, it is too true. And he kneels to the statue and says, I swear that I am, and he's going to say, not Duke of Normandy, but the statue is too quick for him and adds, Robert, Duke of Normandy. And then the comic slave pops his head round and pronounces, Oh, the devil! Then the rival stabs him, and he falls down wounded, and then he's triumphant, and a penearth of blue fire finishes the piece. And then, ding, ding, dong, and down goes the curtain. We always have blue fire, a penearth each house, and that makes it go. Sometimes there are two friends in the piece, but it all depends upon whether the piece is powerfully cast or not. We usually knock the two friends into one, or does away with them altogether. Robert, Duke of Normandy, is a never-failing fair piece, and we always does it every year. That and Bluebeard, or Female Curiosity, and Fair Rosamond, or The Bower of Woodstock, are our stock pieces. After the curtain has been down three minutes, it goes up again, and the heavy goes in and says, Elves of the mountain, dale and dell, this young maid to please within her cell, attend unto us, one and all, listen to your potent master's call. Then all of us at the sides put their fingers in their mouths and howl like Indians. There's generally a cue given of, now demons. After that, the heavy man says, you young man that knows no sin, appear as russet-booted harlequin. We call him russet-booted because he had been playing the lover in the first piece. At Richardson's, they called him spangled harlequin, but old Johnson couldn't do that. He hadn't no wardrobe. Then the heavy man continues, and you young maid no longer pine, attend him as his faithful columbine. Then he goes on, Two more slaves will I rise from out the unfathomable deep, who for a long time have been in perpetual sleep. They too shall share my boon, appear as clown and tottering pantaloon. Now away, begin your magic sport, and bring me back a good report. Then I cried, Hello, here we are, and the sports begin. The first trip, as we calls it, a dance, to use your terms, is Harlequin comes in with Columbine for a hornpipe. If he can't dance, Clown, as soon as he begins, cries, Here we are, and rushes in and drives them off. 
After that, Clown runs on and says, Here we are, and knocks Pantaloon down, who exclaims, Oh, ain't I got the toothache? Clown says, Let me feel your tooth. Oh, it's quite loose. I'll get a bit of string and soon have it out. Clown goes off for string, Pantaloon singing out, Murder! Murder! Clown returns with string and a pistol, and then ties the string and cries, Here goes one, and now it's two, and here goes three, and fires and pulls a wooden tooth as big as your fist with four sharp prongs to it. I've had these teeth often as big as a quartan loaf, but I'm talking of my first appearance. Pantaloon says, Here, that's my tooth. And Clown replies, So it is, and hits him on the head with it. Then he asks Pantaloon if he's better, but he answers, No, I'm worse. Oh, oh I've got a cold in my gum. Then a red-hot poker is introduced, and he burns him with it all round the stage. That concludes the first scene. Then there's another trip, a would-be polka or so, and then comes the bundle scene. Enter a Yorkshireman. It's mostly harlequins do this, because most of the others are outside parading to keep the crowd together. He's got a smock frock on, and russet boots at Johnson's, and he says, I've come up here to London to see my dolly. I feel rather dry, and I'll just get in here to get half a pint of Yale. I'll just leave my bunnel outside and keep a strict eye on it, for they say as how London has plenty of thieves in it. Enter Clown very cautiously. He sees the bundle and calls Pantaloon. He tells Pantaloon, I must have it, because I want it. He goes and picks up the bundle and says to Pantaloon, I shouldn't wonder, but what this bundle belongs to? Me, the Yorkshireman says, and the clown says, Ah, I thought so. And then he takes Pantaloon's hand and says, Come along, little boy, we shall get into trouble, and leads him off. They come on again, and this time Clown tells Pantaloon to get it. So he goes and picks up the bundle, and Yorkshireman knocks him down. Clown runs off, and Pantaloon after. Clown then returns on his belly, drawing himself on with his hands. He gets the bundle in his mouth, and is just going off, when Yorkshireman turns round, and Clown seeing him, gives the bundle to Pantaloon and says, hold this. Yorkshireman seizes Clown and tells him he wants his bundle. Pantaloon having run away with it, Clown says, I haven't got it, search me. That means search me. And there is a regular run over the stage crying, hot beef, hot beef, instead of stop thief. The Yorkshireman collars Pantaloon and says, I'll take you to the station house. And Clown exclaims, Yes, and I'll take this bundle down the lane, meaning Petticoat Lane, because there is a sale for anything there. Then comes the catch scene, as we call it. That is, they all come on in the dark. Clown singing, Puss, Puss, have you seen my pussy? Then in pops the fairy and cries, Hold! Your magic sports is run, and thus I step between. Pantaloon adds, Hi, it's all so gay. And Clown cries, Yes, and all serene. And the fairy says, And with my magic wand, I change the scene. Then everybody sings, Now our pantomime's done. Here's an end to our fun. We shall shortly commence again. Our tricks are o'er, and we're friends once more. We shall shortly commence again. Then the curtain falls, and Clown puts his head out on one side and exclaims, It's all. And Pantaloon pops out at the other side and adds, Over!
the handing man who has done Robert then shouts out from the top, Pass out! in a sepulchral voice, and a door opens in the side of the stage for the people to leave by. That day I was with old Johnson, we used to call him Snuffy Johnson, cause he carried a lot of snuff in his waistcoat pocket. We were very busy, and there was a good many people waiting on the outside to come in, so we only did about two of them regular performances, and then about six o'clock in the evening, the crowd got so great, old Johnson used to hollow through the parade door over people's heads, John Adderley, just as we had commenced playing, and that meant cut it short. We used to finish it up sharp then, and finish all up in six or seven minutes. We used to knock Robert the Devil into a very little space doing the scenes, but cutting them short. And as for the pantomime, we had scarcely commenced with two more slaves will I rise from out the unfathomable deep, than we were singing, our pantomime's done, here's an end to our fun. Sometimes the people would grumble awful, and at others they laughed to see how they was swindled. I got on very fair on my first appearance as clown, considering the circumstances, but I had, you see, four of the best parading comic men opposing me. There was Teddy W. Blank as Silly Billy, and Black Sambo as Black Fop, and Funny Felix as Ring Clown, and Steve Sanderson, another clown, at Frazier's Circus, next door to us, and we didn't stand much chance at clowning alongside of them, as they're the best paraders out. Besides, Frazier's booth took nearly all the ground up, and as we drawed up on the ground, that is, with the parade carriages, late on Sunday evening, we were obliged to have a plot next to the circus, and we had the town pump right in the audience part, close to the first seat in the gallery, and the obelisk, or rather a cross it is, took up one side of the stage, which next day we used as the castle in Bluebeard, when the girl gets up on a ladder to the top of the railings which had a shutter on them, and that was Fatima looking out from the spire of the castle for her Salem. Ah, twas a great hit, for we put an old scene round it, and it had a capital effect. What we do when we go out clowning to a travelling theatre is this. This is what I did at Enfield. We arrived late and drawed up the parade carriages on the ground, which the gov had gone on ahead to secure. Then we went to sleep for a while, pitched on a shutter underneath the parade carriages, for it had been wet weather and we couldn't sleep on the canvas for the booth, for it had been sopped with rain at Edmonton Fair. As soon as it was break of day, we begun getting up the booth, and being short-handed, it took us till three o'clock before we was ready. First we had to measure our distances and fix the parade wagons, then we planted our king pole on the one in the centre, then we put our back pole on the one near the parade, then we put on our ridge at top, and our side rails, and then we put our side ridges and sling our rafters. We then roll the tilt up, which is for the roof, and it gets heavy with dirt, and we haul it up to the top, and unroll it again, and fasten it again. Then we fix the sides up, with shutters about six feet square, which you see on the top of the travelling parade carriages. We fixes up the theatre, and the seats which we take with us, all the scenes roll up and is done up in bundles. The performers drop under the parade wagons and there's a sacking up to divide the men's part from the women. There's a looking glass, sometimes an old bit or a tuppenny one starred or any old thing we can get hold of and the gov gives you out your dress. We always provide our own slips and such like. When we parade outside, it all depends upon what kind of pantaloon you've got with you as to what business you can make. When we first come out on the parade, all the company is together, and we march round, form a half circle, or dress it, as we say, while the band plays Rule Britannia, 
or some other operatic air. Then the manager generally calls out, Now, Mr. Merriman, state the nature of the performances to be given here today. Then I come forward, and this is the dialogue. Well, Mr. Martin, what am I to tell them? The truth, sir, what they'll see here today. Well, if they stop long enough, they'll see a great many people, I shouldn't wonder. No, no, sir, I want you to tell them what they'll see inside our theatre. Well, sir, they'll see a splendid drama by first-rate performers of Robert, Duke of Normandy, with a variety of singing and dancing, with a gorgeous and comic pantomime, with new dresses and scenery, and everything combined to make this such an entertainment as was never before witnessed in this town, and all for the small charge of three shillings. No, no, Mr. Merriman, threepence. What? Threepence? I shan't perform at a threepenny show. And then I pretend to go down the steps as if leaving. He pulls me back and says, Come here, sir, what are you going to do? I shan't spoil my deputation playing for threepence. But you must understand, Merriman, we intend giving them one and all a treat, that the working classes may enjoy themselves as well as noblemen. Then if that's the case, I don't mind, but only for this once. Then I begin spouting again and again, always ending up with, to be witnessed for the low charge of threepence. Then Pantaloon comes up to say what he's going to do, and I give him the nap and knock him on his back. He cries, I'm down, and I turn him over and pick him up and say, and now you're up. Then the company form a half set and do a quadrille. When they have scrambled through that, Clown will do a comic dance and then some burlesque statues. This is the way them statues are done. I go inside and get a birch broom and put a large piece of tilt or old cloth round me and stand just inside the curtains at the entrance from the parade, ready to come out when wanted. Then the male portion of the company get just to the top of the steps and Pantaloon says to one of them, Did you speak? He says, When? And Pantaloon says, Now. And the whole lot make a noise, following out, Oh, 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 as if they was astonished. And it's only to attract attention. Then the gong strikes and the trumpets flourishes. And everybody shouts, Hi, hi, look here! Then naturally all the people turn towards the caravan to see what's up. Then they clear a passageway from the front to the entrance and back, and bring me forth with this bit of cloth before me. The music flourishes again, and they make a tremendous tumult, crying out, Look here, look here! And when all are looking, I drop the cloth, and then I stand in the position of Hercules, king of clubs, with a birch broom across my shoulders, and an old hat on a top of my wig. Then the band strikes up the statue music, and I goes through the statues, such as Ajax defying the lightning, and Cain killing his brother Abel, and it finishes up with the fighting and dying gladiator. As a finale, I do a backfall and pretend to be dead. The company then picks me up and carry me, lying stiff, on their shoulders round the parade. They carry me inside and shout out, All in to begin, now we positively commence. Then they drive everybody in off the parade. When the public have taken their seats, then we come strolling out one at a time till we all get out on the parade again, because the place isn't sufficiently full. It's what we call making a sally. The check takers at the door prevent anybody leaving if they want to come out again. Then I get up to some nonsense again. Perhaps I'll get up a lot of boys out of the fair 
and make him sit on the parade in a row and keep a school, as I call it. I get an old property fiddle, and I tell him, when I play, they must sing. Then I give out a hymn. The bow has a lot of notches in it, and there's a bit of wood sticking up in the fiddle, so that when I plays, it goes rickety-rickety, like. This is the hymn I gives out. When I can shoot my rifle clear at pigeons in the skies, I'll bid farewell to pork and peas and live on pigeon pies. Of course, when they sings, they make a horrible noise, or even if they don't, I begin to wallop them with my bow. I then tell them I must teach them something easier first. Then I give them, Alas, old Grimes is dead and gone. We ne'er shall see him more. He used to wear an old greatcoat, all buttoned down before. Then I finish up by putting on the boys a lot of masks, and some have old soldiers' coats, and I give them implements of war, such as old brooms or sticks, and then I put them through their military exercises. I stand in front with the birch broom as my gun, and I tell them they must do as I do. Then I cry, file arms, and all mark their own muskets. I tell them to lay them all down, and after they have laid down their arms, I tell them to shoulder arms, which makes a shout, because they haven't got no arms. One boy who is put up to it says, I've got no arms. I go up to him and catch hold of his arms and ask him what he calls these here. Then I make him put them on his shoulders and tell him that's shoulder arms. Then I tell them to ground arms, and I do it at the time, stooping down and putting my arms on the ground. I then call them to attention, and up comes the pantaloon on a basket horse, and I tell them they are going to be reviewed by the Duke. I give them all the implements again, and put them to stand attention. Pantaloon gallops round them, reviewing. He wears a large, flat, cocked hat and soldier's old coat. He makes a bit of fun with his horse, making it kick and breaking the ranks of my soldiers. Then I quarrel with him about that, and he says he's a right to do as he likes, because he's my superior horsifer. Then he orders me to the other end of the parade to stand attention with my back towards the boys. Then he tells them to ride about face and charge, and they all run and charge me in behind. They run two or three times round the parade, still charging me, until I run inside to the theatre, and all the company shout out, All in to begin! We are now positively to commence. We then get them in off the parade again, and if the place is full, begin. If not, we gradually crawl out again, one by one, and one of the girls dances a hornpipe or a highland fling. We then make a sally, all in again, and by that time we generally begin. This is the parade business that is most popular at fairs. We do a few other things, but they are all much of a muchness. It's very hard work, and I have worked, since being with Snuffy Johnson, 17 hours of a day, but then we have not had so much to do on the outside. Sometimes I've been so tired at night that I've actually laid down in my dress and never washed but slept like that all night. The general pay for a clown during fair time is five shillings or six shillings a day, but that usually ends in your moving on the first day, then four shillings on the second, and perhaps three shillings on the third. The reason is that the second and third day is never so good as the first. The excuse is that business is not so good and expenses are heavy. 
and if you don't like it, you needn't come again. They don't stand about what you agree for. For instance, if it's a wet day and you don't open, there's no pay. Richardson's used, when the old man was alive, to be more money, but now it's as bad as the rest of them. If you go on shares with a sharing company, it averages about the same. We always share at the drumhead at night, when all's over. It's usually brought out between the stage and the bottom seat of the gallery. The master or missus counts out the money. The money on the drumhead may, if it's a good fare, come to £16 or £18, or, as it most usually is, £9 or £10. I have known us to share one pound a piece afore now, and I've known what it is to take ten pence for a share. We usually take two fares a week, or we may stay a night or two after the fare's over, and have a bespeak night. The wages of a clown comes to, if you average it, one pound a week all the year round, and that's puffing it at a good salary and supposing you to be continually travelling. Very likely, at night we have to pull down the booth after performing all day, and be off that night to another fair, fifteen or sixteen miles off it may be, and have to build up again by the next afternoon. The women always ride on the top of the parade carriages, and the men occasionally riding and shoving up behind the carriages uphill. The only comfort in travelling is a short pipe, and many a time I've drowned my woes and troubles in one. The scene of sharing at the drumhead is usually this. While the last performance is going on, the missus counts up the money, and she is supposed to bring in all the money she has taken. But that we don't know, and we are generally fiddled most tremendous. When the theatre's empty, she, or him, generally says, Now, lads, please, now, ladies, it's getting late. And when they have all mustered, it's generally the cry, We've had a bad fare. The people seldom speak. She then takes the number of the company, we generally averages some 16 performers, and after doing so she commences sharing, taking up two or three shares according to the ground rent, one then to herself for taking money, then for the husband being there, for they don't often perform, then they take shares for the children, for they makes them go on for the fairies and on our parade. Snuffy Johnson used to take two shares for the wardrobes and fittings, and that is the most reasonable of any of them, for they mostly take double that. Indeed, we always took six. Then there are two shares for ground rent, and two for travelling expenses. The latter two shares depend entirely upon the fare, for the expenses are just the same whether we takes money or not, so that if it's a bad fare, more has to be deducted, and that's the worse for us on both sides. That makes twelve or thirteen shares to be deducted before the men touch a penny for themselves. Any strolling professional who reads that will say, well, tis very considerate, for it's under the mark and not over. When we have finished at one fair, if we want to go to another the next day, as soon as the people have gone in for the last performance, we commence taking down the pay box and all the show fittings on the outside and all that isn't wanted for the performance. As soon as the mummers have done their first slang, if they are not wanted in the pantomime, they change themselves and go to work pulling down. When the pantomime's over, everyone helps till all's packed up. Then sharing takes place, 
and we tramp on by night to the next fair. We then camp as well as we can till daylight, if it isn't morning already, and to work we go building for the fair, and in general, by the time we've done building, it's time to open. I've travelled with Stars Theatre Royal and Smith and Webster's, alias Richardson's, and Frederick's Theatre, and Baker's Pavilion, and Douglas's Travelling Shakespearean Saloon. He's got scenes from Shakespeare's plays all round the front, and it's the most splendid concern on the road. And I've done the comic business at all of them. They are all conducted on the same principle and do the same kind of business as that I've described to you. When we are travelling, it depends upon the business as to what we eat. They talk of strolling actors living so jollily and well, but I never knew it fall to my share. What we call a mummer's feed is potatoes and herrings, and they always look out for going into a town where there's plenty of fresh herrings. A fellow we called Nancy Dawson was the best hand at herrings. I've known him go into a tavern and ask for the bill of fare and shout out, Well, landlord, what have you got for dinner? Perhaps he'd say, There's beef and veal, sir, very nice, just ready. And then he'd say, No, I'm sick of meat, just get me a nice bloater. And if it came to much more than a penny, there was a row. If we are doing bad business and we pass a field of sweets, there's a general rush for the pool. The best judges of turnips is strolling professionals. I recollect in Hampshire once getting into a sweet field and they was all blighted. We pulled up a hundred, I should think, but when we cut them open, they was all flaxy inside, and we after all had to eat the rind. We couldn't get a feed. Sausages and faggots, that's made of all the stale sausages and saveloys, and unsightly bits of meat what won't sell, is what we get hold of principally. The women have to make shifts as we do. We always get plenty of beer, even when we can't get money, for we can sing a song or so, and then the yokels stand something. Besides, there's hardly a town we go into without some of the yokels being stage-struck, and they feel quite delighted to be among the professionals, and will give us plenty of beer if we'll talk to them about acting. It's impossible to say how many clowns there are working at canvas theatres. There's so many meddling at it. Not good uns, but trying to be. I can mention fifty, I am sure, by name. I shouldn't think you would exaggerate if you was to say there was from one hundred and fifty to two hundred who call themselves clowns. Many of the first-rate clowns now in London have begun at strolling. There's Herring, and Lewis, and Nelson, and plenty more, doing well now. It's a hard life, and many the time we squeege a laugh out when it's like killing us to do it. I've never known a man break down at a fair, done up. For you see, the beer keeps us up. But I've known one chap, to faint on the parade from exhaustion, and then get up, as queer as could be, and draw tuppence, and go and have a fish and bread. A woman at an oyster stall alongside of the theatre give him a drop of beer. He was hearty and hungry, and had only joined lately, regular hard up. So he went two days without food. When we shared at night, he went and bought a ham bone and actually eat himself asleep, for he dropped off with the bone in his hand. End of section 25